in honour of Professor Alan Kerman. Yesterday we began with Alan's intellectual odyssey and today we sort of survey the land and we have many presentations and discussions by leading researchers. To reflect Alan's style, I hope we can uh, have as much time as possible for discussion so I can politely ask all presenters to be time conscious. Um, for those who weren't here yesterday, we have nine housekeeping rules. So it's kind of a good qu quiz if you're stuck for conversation at the interval to ask people what they were. The pertinent ones are no food and drink in here, which is except for us on the top table, we've got water, which I think is a bit harsh, but there we are. Um, you cannot walk around unescorted outside of the auditorium and go into the bathrooms, which are sort of come out of the doors left and then right. Anything else, please ask Stephanie, who's outside, or myself, uh, or Rayhan, and we can direct you in the, in the right place. So our first session today is a keynote speech by Professor Joe Stiglitz, and we're delighted to have Sir John Kay as discussant. Uh, and I hope we can leave perhaps 10 minutes for a full discussion uh, with the audience, both online uh, and here. John is a fellow of St John's College, Oxford, and well known to most of us after about 20 years, I think, writing in the FT. But he's also written, by my count, uh, 13 books and numerous government reviews. But I think perhaps, the, in my view, the most noteworthy achievement is being one of the founders of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is still going so strong uh, 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 here in the UK. Now, our speaker, it's a bit of a cliche to say that people don't need an introduction. So let me try and not fall into that trap, but say it to point out that uh, Professor Stiglitz won the John Bates Clark Medal in 79, and of course awarded the Nobel Prize in 2001. But I would like to mention one area that perhaps his influence isn't so well known. Um, you'll all remember uh, after the global financial crisis, Jean-Claude Trichet, the president of the ECB, said that economists have been pretty useless, not only in predicting the crisis, but in what to do when it started. Well, I think that might be fair for 90% of the profession, but not everybody. And from the UK's perspective, uh, when we put together a plan for Gordon Brown, which he eventually took to Obama and became part of the G20 um, uh, sort of rescue at the beginning of 2009, there were two books that we relied on. One was Franklin Allen and Doug Gale's, uh, I think it's uh, Clarendon Lectures. And the second was a book uh, that Joe wrote with Bruce Greenwald called Towards a New Paradigm in Monetary Economics. And in that book, chapter 11 is about restructuring banking systems. And I can attest that in 2008, this was extremely helpful. He also pointed out that actually recapitalizing banking systems is very deflationary at the time. And so you had to have supportive monetary policy, but most importantly, fiscal policy. And some of you may remember that actually in the UK plan, there was actually a fiscal stimulus, despite the government taking on so much debt. And if you can imagine how hard that was to argue for in the Treasury, most of it was down to the fact that we could rely on people like Joe's great work. So I think when Keynes said the ideas of economists are more important than is commonly understood, I think this is exactly a case in point. So can I please welcome Joe to make the keynote address? Thank you. Well, th well thank you. Can I sit here or do you want me to? You can sit wherever you like. You're, you're is one. there a clicker? Uh, have you got the clicker? Ah, um, do you have the presentation? You can... We'll just get the presentation one moment up and we'll move the slides on. If you just say next slide, okay. is that okay? Okay, okay. that's okay. So, well, that's uh, beginning, uh, I'll begin with a, uh, a little bit of an anecdote. Uh, you know, you, you always uh, occasionally like this reflect when you first met uh, Alan, and, and I, I, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but what uh, my most, uh, my earliest vivid memory uh, was uh, of a seminar at uh, Nuffield uh, College in the 70s. Uh, I had uh, come to Oxford as a uh, young professor at All Souls and uh, uh, went over to Nuffield and uh, Alan gave uh, a, a really uh, a wonderful seminar that, uh, you know, you, you don't, there aren't that many seminars that you remember 50 years later. And uh, it was interesting both because of the mathematics he used but also memorable because of the uh, bottom line, 
uh, of the seminar. So the mathematics was uh, the kind of thing that he then went on to develop it, where people were interacting. Uh, it was a model of communication, a model of uh, 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 people bumping into each other. And uh, the punchline of the paper uh, was uh, when you meet somebody uh, that uh, knows somebody that you know, uh, you're not supposed to say, what a small world. Uh, it, the theorem was you're supposed to say, what a big world. Um, because of the particular model, the probability that you would know somebody that's, uh, when you meet somebody that they would know somebody that you know, actually increased the bigger the world. Do you remember that? Uh, so, so anyway, it, it struck, uh, what, what struck me about that uh, particularly was uh, it showed that there were other ways of thinking about economics, social interaction, uh, and that, that economics could be really fun. And it could make you think about things that you had taken for granted and see it in, in a somewhat different way. So um, uh, I don't know if you remember how uh, exciting uh, that seminar was. Uh, maybe it wasn't so exciting for you, but it was uh, very, very exciting for 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 your audience. Um, the um, uh, can you go on to the next slide? Um, I'm going to begin by talking about one of uh, Allen's uh, papers that has gotten a, a great deal of attention. Uh, his paper, Whom or What Does the Representative uh, Individual Represent? And I feel uh, uh, um, I have to take a little credit for that paper because I invited Allen to uh, write that paper for the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which was a journal that uh, I found it in the uh, 1980s uh, with the objective of trying to change the mindset of the economics profession. Uh, the American Economic Association uh, had a little bit of surplus money at the time, and I'm not sure how I persuaded them that they should give me that money to uh, start a journal. Um, but I did, and, and particularly for the purpose uh, that uh, I had in mind, which was to change the conventional wisdom. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, I think they came to regret that. Um, and so, uh, as in uh, many th those of you involved in institutional um, creation, uh, institutions you create with one objective eventually get taken over by somebody else and actually become counter the objective. So the Journal of Economic Perspectives has become much more conventional, and it is now serving to perpetuate the conventional wisdom. But uh, when I founded it, um, the uh, there were a couple, uh, there were a number of ideas that I uh, that I wanted to try to uh, move the profession in. One of them, uh, I think, I had some success in, which is behavioral uh, economics. Uh, which was at that time, it was an idea that I had uh, felt uh, very strongly, and uh, we talked about that last night, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, that obviously the model of rationality does not describe uh, individual behavior, uh, let alone how this system as a whole behaves. Um, and uh, uh, in the early 70s, I had gone to seminar by Tversky, and I've been very influenced by it. And in some of my own work in the late 60s, I had had uh, come up with some similar ideas, but it became very clear to me that if, uh, as a young person, I wanted to succeed, I couldn't do that. I had to uh, be more modest and say, let's work within the conventional uh, paradigm but everybody could accept the idea that there was imperfect information and how do you analyze imperfect information? And that was uh, the direction that I took and, and, and it had some success. So I used the journal to, to, to promote uh, uh, behavioral economics and Kahneman now gives uh, the journal credit for having succeeded in pushing behavioral economics mainstream. Well, 
Um, Allen's paper got a lot of attention uh, and some other stuff that we did uh, along that lines. But I have to regret to say we, we didn't change the macroeconomics uh, profession. So uh, um, even though the paper's ideas were not only very clear and well articulated, it, 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 it uh, in some sense uh, didn't, didn't change the profession, but it did help give rise to a large number of streams of work, uh, in which many of you here have participated in, and I think are very important, and I think eventually uh, will prevail. So uh, one of the striking aspects of Allen's work is that he leaned against the wind in an era when macroeconomics descended into representative Asian models, um, purportedly attempting to provide micro foundations, Alan argued that the profession had taken a wrong turn. And a couple of the four ideas that were in that paper are very clear uh, is any set of aggregate demand functions could be derived from utility maximizing behavior. And uh, that was important because uh, it, it emphasized that actually rationality didn't provide any restrictions on the excess demand functions to say that they were micro funded that uh, didn't put restrictions now if you had only one person there are lots of restrictions but again empirically uh, we don't have to do a regression to figure out that there are is more than one person in the economy and that they have differences in uh uh behavior uh, in preferences um and so uh, uh, the second one is that uh, uh, that representative agent model was ill-suited for addressing problems of unemployment. Uh, essential issue was coordination failures. And uh, you can't uh, have coordination failures if you have only one person, uh, unless you're schizophrenic. Uh, and uh, but that then that that flies in the face of the assumption of full rationality. So you have a, uh, a, a schizophrenic attitude about your, even the model of rationality. So um, that, that represented a real uh, problem. Now, in, in the work that I did, one of the, I, I focused on imperfect information, asymmetries of information. And again, a representative agent model without schizophrenia, very hard to think about how you have asymmetries of information. I mean, how how do you not know something um, if you have only one person that, uh, that something that others don't? So, in a sense, if if you believe that these problem uh, a problem of, uh, of coordination or a problem of asymmetry of information are central to the economic problem, you the representative agent is just the wrong way to begin. And yet it is striking how influential that model was. And let me emphasize, it's not about mathematics here. <laughs> you can use a lot of mathematics to solve the model with or without asymmetry information or without coordination problems. It was the beginning hypothesis. You know, it's really thinking, not the math that's the problem. That if you are thinking about how does a, a society function where you have to coordinate individuals to begin with a model where there is no coordination means that you aren't thinking very coherently um the um uh other thing we mentioned uh last yesterday was that the representative agent model uh was a model of an economy with no trade and again that's not a very interesting uh economy and then the final thing that uh, Alan emphasized was that there was no basis for belief that the reaction to policy change will have any similarity to that of a representative agent model. So it, it, it was really a, a, a poor basis for beginning to analyze an economic system. Next slide. Um, next slide. So, um, uh, that uh, set of ideas 
uh, that that was the wrong way to go. Um, that the, it, what Ellen was engaged in was not only criticizing the uh, what were the flaws of the standard paradigm. Uh, he was busy at work creating uh, a rich research agenda um, on display in this conference, thinking about networks, equilibrium, coordination, complexity, interactions, uh, and more welfare uh, economics expectations. And uh, I'm going to only be able to touch on a few, uh, not surprisingly related to areas of my own interest, but uh, I think all these topics will be discussed uh, in the rest of today. So we, in the first hour, we don't have to uh, come to uh, views on all these issues. Um, next slide. But I, I, there are a couple uh, central themes that were brought out yesterday, and I might as well repeat it, repeat them. Uh, the sum of the behavior of simple, economically plausible individuals may generate uh, complicated dynamics. And uh, this is very different. We had a dinner last night, and and uh, there was a view by uh, uh, one person at the dinner of a macroeconomist that said, "Well, maybe macroeconomic, you know, individuals may we may not be able to succeed in describing the individuals. They're all complicated, and you're, but the sum of the individuals may be more uh, simpler." The aggregate may be simpler than the individuals. So it was a little bit of a context of, of the fish market. So that each trader may be may may have complicated motives, loyalties, and things like that, but it still may be the case that the aggregate is simple. And I think uh, that missed one of the central themes of, of Allen's work, which is that in fact there are rich behaviors in the sum that you don't see in any individual. And uh, you, so you don't see in, uh, uh, certainly in the representative agent or in models like uh, the Hank equilibrium models that are an attempt to go beyond the, the simple ones, but not in a, in a deep way. Uh, and the second quote I, is is uh, from Alan is the way to develop appropriate micro foundations for macroeconomics is not to be found by starting from the study of individuals in isolation, but rests in an essential way on studying the aggregate activity resulting from the direct interaction between different individuals. And uh, let me emphasize one aspect of that: that those interactions are not just mediated by the price system that uh, the arrow de Bru model held that people do interact they interact in markets but all the aspects i mean it was a brilliant insight of the arrow de Bru model that you can get so much activity mediated through the price system and it was a good point for a beginning of economic analysis, but it was a bad point for the end of economic analysis. And what happened, uh, uh, was sadly, is that too many people thought it was the end of, of economic analysis. Um, uh, I had, you know, one one of the very interest, uh, interesting aspects of this is, is how, um, uh, there were two people who whose contributions uh, to uh, the development of the foundational theories is really critical, De Bru and Arrow. Um, and they, in some sense, uh, uh, pr proved Adam Smith's invisible hand theorem. Uh, they did more than that. They proved the existence of equilibrium and the uh, first and second fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Um, but the interpretation of that theorem uh, by Arrow and Debru and by people at Chicago and uh, people like Bob Solo were markedly different. Debru said, well, I've proven a theorem. That's it. You know, whether this describes the world or not is not for me to say. It's a theorem. 
So he he had a, I would say, a modest view of his work, uh, uh, accurately modest. Um, but then the Chicago economist took the theorem as if it were a proof of reality. And they took that as a result of describing the economy we live in. Arrow and De Bruyne had proven that the economy was efficient. Of course, you can't prove a theorem. I mean, you can't prove something about the world. You have to show that that model corresponds to the world. You can, uh, the, 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 the theorem is a set of mathematical relations. You have to then say that that is a description of the world. But what Arrow took away, Arrow was my was uh, my teacher at MIT, and then we became very good friends uh, uh, and colleagues uh, at at Stanford. Um, Arrow's conclusion was uh, just the opposite. It proved that the market was not efficient, because if you had to have all these conditions to be satisfied for the market to be efficient, and we know those conditions are not satisfied. No, uh, then we have a pretty good basis for understanding the market is not efficient. And then he went on and, and explored all kinds of things about information, moral hazard, uh, discrimination, uh, you know, lots of other details of the ways in which it failed. But he took the Arrow de Brew theorem as a starting point for a research agenda showing the ways in which the economy was different from their to group model. And Allen really was in many ways taking up the tradition of Arrow in that sense, beginning, you know, having studied the Arrow to group model and, and extending it, then took up, uh, and because he understood it, understood its limitations, and then took up uh, the agenda of, of uh, trying to get a better understanding of how the uh, economy, um, the interaction of individuals uh, actually uh, uh, worked. So the standard macroeconomic uh, economics provided a bad uh, model of the how the economy actually operated. Um, I mentioned yesterday the dynamics of even simple models are highly dependent on specific assumptions like malleable capital, single capital good, nothing. Uh, Alan emphasized that large systems of individuals interacting with each other generally complex systems which mar with markedly different dynamics. Uh, and his uh, there were early work on networks before it became uh, so much more fashionable. And we've learned a lot of ways in which network behavior are different. Um, one of the ways to you, you can think about the inter, uh, uh, relationship between the two is is when there are uh, networks, there are lots of unpriced externalities between the uh, agents. You you just can't have a price system that is as rich as you would need to have in a full air to brew model. And that uh, gives rise to uh, a whole set of complications. And um, a couple of the results of that I mentioned here is that uh, there are rich dynamics uh, with uh, results very sensitive to parameter values, to particular assumptions. So in 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 many ways, I find it an absolutely fascinating thing uh, that that you have this kind of of sensitivity to the whole uh, of behavior, to uh, the modeling and, and particular parameters. Um, and obviously, one important application of that is even in the limited area of financial networks. We have uh, some very strong results uh, that we live through all the time uh, because we keep having financial crises. Uh, and uh, that shouldn't happen in the equilibrium models that have been the mainstay of, of uh, macroeconomics. Um, and uh, one of the important ideas is that, uh, and I'll come back to that over and over again, is that uh, contracts, actions, which are individually rational or individually rational for a bilateral, uh, bilateral tra transaction may not be systemically uh, rational, may give rise to systemic behavior that is dysfunctional, that is unstable. 
And uh, that that really is uh, another way of saying is Adam Smith's invisible hand doesn't always work. And there could be a lot of uh, instability. In fact, we know that in complex financial networks, uh, there may be no equilibrium. There may be multiple equilibrium. Uh, and they, 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 these may exhibit uh, uh, a high level of instability. And uh, one aspect of this is as we get more complex, we may get more instability. Uh, we pay a high price for complexity. And uh, the, the system behavior may, may be very different from what a, a less complex system might look like. Um, so uh, the standard model provides a bad uh, descriptive model, but it also um, uh, is uh, a even worse basis of policy and welfare. Uh, and this goes back to the point that uh, Ellen made, uh, the preferences of the representative agent uh, a representative individual cannot legitimately be used to decide whether one ec economic situation is better than another. So uh, the uh, one of the key insights here are interactions with uh, microeconomic rationality or seeming microeconomic rationality. Uh, and I don't think they're always is that rationality, but assuming that there is that rationality, may have macroeconomic consequences that look uh, far different. And um, one of the papers that I uh, liked uh, a lot of, of Allen's was a paper that he did uh, uh, helping provide insights to uh, the 2008 crisis, um, which is a, obviously an event that you know, any uh, I was involved uh, when I was chief economist of the World Bank in the East Asian financial crisis, and then again uh, in the 2008 crisis, and then in the Euro crisis. And any of us going through those crises wanted to know what was going on, and it was clearly something that was not only not predicted by the standard DSG models, because after all, you're in equilibrium, but they said that couldn't happen. They gave us very little insights into what was going on. And um, Alan, with a couple of his co-authors, some people here, uh, provided a very neat model uh, that I think provided a lot of insights into what was going on. Um, uh, when I uh, was preparing for this talk, I went back to try to read it uh, in detail and, and um, I found it was behind a paywall, so I couldn't read all the reread all the details. Uh, and this is uh, another issue, which is a passion of mine, which is uh, how knowledge has become uh, behind doors because of intellectual property uh, and makes uh, access to knowledge much more difficult. But if any of you, Alan will send you the paper to any of you who who want want the paper. Um, but let me just read these two paragraphs which I, from the from from uh, the the abstract because I think it, they say a lot about uh, how Allen's research uh, about Allen's research agenda. Uh, structural changes in an economy or in the financial markets can arise as a result of agents adopting rules that appear to be the norm around them. Such rules are adopted by implicit consensus as they turn out to be profitable for individuals. However, as rules develop and spread, they may have consequences at the aggregate level, which are not anticipated by the individuals. And uh, what he does is he develops a model motivated by the uh, 2007 a crisis in credit derivatives, uh, showing how coordination on simple and apparently profitable rules may weaken regulatory constraints, rendering the whole system more fragile. The rule in the specific example consists in deciding not to exercise due diligence in the valuation of complex credit derivative products, pre riding on information and operational costs. We show that such rational negligence in the face of deteriorating macroeconomic conditions can bring a market to a sudden collapse. So it really provided an interest, uh, example of 
of, you might say, microeconomic rationality. It was rational for the individuals to have that kind of negligence, but obviously systemically, it was not rational. And that I think uh, is, is part of a, uh, an example of a, a key insight of, of a whole strand of Allen's work. Next. So that leads me to the ob observations. Uh, in the absence of markets extending infinitely far into the future, behavior today has to be based on expectations. Uh, the economy is always changing. Uh, the 19th century equilibrium approach based on physics uh, was, as we talked about uh, yesterday, misguided. Uh, and it's in particular wrong to think of the economy through the lens of stationary stochastic uh, processes. Uh, and uh, um, even of, of an economy just adapting to exogenous shocks, because the system creates the shocks to which others have to adapt. Um, and there's no way to check whether those expectations are, are consistent. Uh, and given the rich array of shocks to the economy, not all of which can be anticipated, it is inevitable that there will be shocks that mean the PAP plans will not be fulfilled, generating disequilibrium behavior. So uh, the point that, uh, uh, I'm trying to emphasize here is that the equilibrium approach to macroeconomics is fundamentally flawed. There is no way the economy could be on an equilibrium trajectory. Uh, it would be, you know, you could imagine, let me say, you could imagine a toy economy that was in which there was no technical progress, in which the only thing going on were variations in the weather, and it's a simple agrarian economy. So you can imagine that, but that's not the economy we live in. It's not the economy we've lived in for 250 years since the Industrial Revolution. We've been engaged in creating changes in technology which keep upsetting the equilibrium that we're in. And we're not in the equilibrium, that's the whole point, because we know that we don't know. We know that there will be changes. And uh, just to give you one example, uh, I think I mentioned yesterday, the fact that we have internet banking means that the ease with which it, to have a run against the bank has been, uh, it's much easier to have a run against the bank now than we actually had to go up down to the bank and stand in line to get your money. Now it takes uh, a nanosecond sitting on your computer to order the bank to transfer a billion dollars out of the bank. It may not listen to you. The servers may collapse. There may be other things going around. We have to have legal structures for that. But the innovation has totally changed the stickiness of uh, bank deposits. So uh, we are in this world of uh, constant uh, change. So that brings us to um, the fact that uh, because there's change, we and there are not markets extending infinitely far into the future, we have to form expectations that we can't really verify. And therefore, we get into uh, a world where we have what uh, George Soros referred to as reflexivity. Our beliefs affect behavior, and we have to take in, we were talking last night about the differences between economics and other sciences, uh, including other social sciences. And one of the differences is that as our beliefs change, the economic system changes. And as the economic system changes, our beliefs change. And that two-way interaction, you know, if our beliefs about the molecules change, the molecules don't change their behavior. Now, there are some aspects of how we observe the world may change the world. And that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Heisenberg and all that. But, but the fact is that certainly the molecules don't change their behavior simply because our conception of the molecules change. But our conception of the economic system will change our behavior, and that will change the behavior of the economic system. And that is a fundamental difference between uh, 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 economics and other sciences. Well, 
Uh, we've done a little work uh, with uh, Giovanni Dozzi and uh, Andrea Roventi uh, um, and uh, Merle Napolitano and uh, trying to model this in a, in a simple way uh, where we had um, uh, deep innovations, when I say deep, uh, generated by a random distribution in a particular form, but sufficiently deep in the system that it was very nonlinear. So you couldn't extract information from it by a linear regression. And then we, you know, it, the way we did it biased the results in, in some sense. But what we, what we asked was if you had more sophisticated ways of making inferences, did that improve the performance of the economic system? And the answer was, because the world was very nonlinear, if you used more sophisticated linear prediction models, the, si your performance, uh, the system performance went down and profits went down. And we even uh, had uh, variants of the model where people would choose, switch from using one forecasting model to another, naive versus more sophisticated. And the evolutionary process did not settle on the, uh, a, a system of prediction, which was best for the system performance. And that's consistent with a, a, a more fundamental notion that um, there's no teleology in evolution. Um, and, and this is another one of the many mistakes that Hayek made. He somehow thought that evolution uh, had a, a kind of theology and we were getting to a more and more efficient uh, system. There's uh, one of the things I, I pointed out in my book, Wither Socialism, that that was not true. There was no basis for believing that evolutionary processes would lead to more efficient uh, uh, economic systems. And we can talk about why that is uh, if we have time. But I, in the last few minutes, uh, I wanted to um, uh, talk about one other aspect of, of this, of what I've just been talking about, which is that um, once you recognize that there is this ever, uh, that changes, always going on and we can't predict it very well. Uh, there's a kind of what I refer to, to uh, as deep uncertainty. Uh, this is not only true in macroeconomics, but it's true in one of the other I issues that, that we are facing, climate change. I gave the example a little bit earlier of a simple agrarian economy as one where the standard DSGE model might have been relevant. That is, you know, if we weren't studying a modern industrial economy, no change, technological change, it might have been true. But it's no longer true even there because of climate change. Where there's profound changes in climate, so we can't even predict. The even weather is not described by a stationary stochastic process. And we know that it's not, uh, and there is deep uncertainty. And so the uh, question is, how do we analyze policy in that context? Well, a major strand of work in economics uh, has been the integrated assessment models uh, for which, for instance, Bill Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize. And they have all the flaws of the DSGE models. and uh, with even worse consequences, because with DSGE, we have crises, we have macroeconomic crises that we could have avoided, I believe. They contributed to the crises, but we get over the recession. You know, it took 10 years, but and a lot of people's lives were destroyed, but we, we got over that. In the case of climate change, Nornhaus recommends that we let the economy rip and let's just accept three and a half, four degrees. That he says that's optimal. He created a model and said solution is that's optimal. Now, um, I know I'm here in Europe 
And whenever I talk to uh, about this uh, to my European colleagues. They say, well, nobody takes that model seriously other than the Nobel Prize Committee in uh, Stockholm. Um, so I feel a little bit uh, at odds because when I talk about this in America, they say, well, obviously uh, Nordhaus is right. Um, you know, uh, the same uh, commitment to equilibrium models leads to a commitment to the integrated assessment models with the implication, if you believe those models, you say, let's accept three and a half to four degrees. Well, here the key issue is that the importance of uncertainty uh, and a high level of uncertainty, the international community has made clear that it doesn't want to accept that risk. And uh, that's an, another example of, you know, the macro models said first order importance was intertemporal, not risk. In the midst of the pandemic, it was risk that was really paramount, not the intertemporal allocations. And in climate change, it's risk that's paramount, not the intertemporal uh, issues. So I've listed uh, on this slide a whole list of um, uh, um, I, I, in the previous slide, I guess it went through it, it, here, a, a, a whole list of what was wrong with those models, but I'm not going to waste uh, time on that because uh, if you don't know the models, you shouldn't learn them. And if you do know models, you know what's wrong with them. So um, let me go on to the uh, um, uh, uh, the the point is uh, the central issue is the risk that society is willing to take. So let me just conclude. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, the themes on which Alan has written are central to economics and the ability of economics to provide guidance on key policy issues of the day. Uh, Alan approached these issues with uh, independence, originality, uh, creativity, uh, and presented an enormously stimulating and enjoyable way uh, that made economics uh, actually fun. And uh, I think at the same time, he set a rich agenda for the future. And thank you, Alan. I first met Alan Kerman in the 1970s at meetings of the Society for Economic Analysis. The Society for Economic Analysis is not quite a secret society, but it's not terribly well known. It was founded in the 1930s by people who were yet then young economists like Abba Lerner and Paul Sweezy in reaction to the dominance of uh, British economics by the old farts of the time like Keynes and Marshall and so on. Uh, and it had a constitution which was designed uh, to preserve the dominance of the society by young economists. And his great success was to publish a journal, the Review of Economic Studies, which as you all know, became one of the major journals in our field. Um, I was a member of that and so was Alan and so were quite a number of other people who became well known subsequently in the profession. Mervyn King, for example, was one. Uh, it's always been my lot to get some of the grubby practical end of it, things. And I became treasurer of this and realized that uh, the fraudster Robert Maxwell was doing very well by pushing up the prices of academic journals. And one could do that for a journal like the Review of Economic Studies, which meant we could have rather luxurious meetings in Oxbridge colleges with excellent wines and food and the like. And as I say, that was the occasion on which I first met, met Alan. We were then, we were the Society for Economic Analysis. We were young and we were ambitious. We'd been equipped with uh, the models that were prevalent at the time. We'd um, learned them as graduate students. We were developing them. The world consisted of rational agents engaged in optimizing behavior. We were, of course, as young people always are, going to change the world. 
we were going to re-establish macroeconomics on micro foundations. We were also imperialist. Rational choice modeling was something that could be taken not just through economics, but through social sciences more generally, to politics, anthropology, other social sciences. Uh, people still clung in those days to these ideas that uh, family life was something to do with hormones and romantic luck, that sort of thing. Whereas we all know, knew that Becker had demonstrated <laughs> that it was actually about uh, economies of scale and division of labor in household production. Uh, people persisted, however, in um, engaging in these non-rigorous uh, observations. Um, non-rigorous, of course, meant non-mathematical. We'd read Pride and Prejudice. We'd even been allowed mm. by the courts to read Lady Chatterley's Lover. <laughs> but we asked, where are the equations? Or what are the models that are being used? And there were no good answers to that question, or there didn't seem to be at the time. And Alan was present at these uh, uh, these meetings, and Alan sat through them with the kind of impish smile, which I've always regarded as a characteristic of Alan Kerman, an impish smile, which perhaps suggested, and it would certainly have been correct to suggest, that we were all just taking ourselves far too seriously. So we were um, uh, we were going to rebuild macroeconomics on micro foundations. And all of this was motivated by the idea that by pursuing rational choice and optimization, we had something that was a sort of true model of the world and we had an idea of what it was. And that took us, of course, to rational expectations because if there was a true model of the world, then agents would have to have expectations that were consistent with that model of the world. And that may be the only case in uh, the philosophy of science in which people have developed a reductio ad absurdum argument and then concluded not that the premise that gave rise to the absurd conclusion is <laughs> false, uh, but that the absurdum must be true. And that, um, and that became part of the professional profession's beliefs uh, for some years since. And even now, uh, the, um, there is a reluctance to acknowledge that the idea of building macro models on micro foundations is one that has not been successful and it's not been successful because the assumptions that one needs to make, not just about assumption, uh, about expectations, but about individual behavior and the interactions as Joe and Alan have described, are so demanding as not to provide a, a, a persuasive explanation of anything about the world. Now, a paper that shook me out of uh, this kind of naive belief uh, was one of Joe's in 1980, the paper with Grossman, that explained why there was an inherent contradiction in the efficient market hypothesis, because if the efficient market hypothesis were true, there would be no incentive to gather the information which made uh, markets efficient in the first place. And that was a shock for me, not just because I had subscribed to the efficient market hypothesis, but it was also a shock in terms of the way one thought about economic methodology. Because there was a lot of truth in the efficient market hypothesis. It was obviously the case that a great deal of publicly inf available information was incorporated in, in market prices. But that was different from saying that the efficient market hypothesis was a true description of the world. In fact, Warren Buffett put, put it very well when he said, uh, observing that markets were often efficient, they, the academics he was talking about, believed they were always efficient. And Buffett went on, the difference between these two propositions is <laughs> night and day. In the case of Buffett, it's, it's, it's about about $100 billion. <laughs> In fact, uh, Buffett went on to say, if markets were efficient, I would be a bum on the street with a tin cup. <laughs> uh, is, um, certainly not that. What that did, certainly for me, and it may have done so for other for some other people, was shook one out of the mindset that said 
there is a true model of the world and that what we're doing in economics is elaborating that true model of the world. It was a, a out of the mindset which the American philosopher Richard Rorty described as a, looking for a description of the world as it really is, a mirror of reality. There is no such uh, reality in economics. There's an interesting question, which is the whole behind the whole US school of pragmatic philosophy as to whether there is such a model in any branch of science, but the plainly is not in economics. Um, and uh, what that led me to learn, and I think has learned some of the people, most of the people who are in this seminar to learn, is the need for eclecticism in our models. There is no true model of the world. There are only a variety of models which are part of our toolkit as economists. Uh, that kind of eclecticism is reflected in the famous George Fox observation that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. What we have as economists is a true, true toolkit of models in which some are actually useful. And what Alan has done, as indeed Joe has done, is to develop a whole variety of elements of that particular toolkit. There are many different models and there is no true model. Alan described earlier uh, yesterday uh, what he called rencontres with uh, mathematicians. And I held one such uh, encounter in Oxford with a group of anthropologists to see what anthropologists and economists could learn from each other. Um, the encounter was not altogether a success, but nevertheless, at the end of it, we went down to the pub and uh, had a drink, and then we degenerated into an argument as to why people bought rounds of drinks in pubs. Uh, for the anthropologists, it was straightforward. This was ritual gift exchange of the kind which they'd observed in the tribes in um, New Guinea and um, <laughs> other places. Uh, and for the economists, it was also straightforward what the answer was, which was this is a way of economizing on transactions costs. <laughs> so I then propose a test for this, um, which was if you went away at the end of the evening, having bought more drinks than you had been bought for you, did you feel you'd had a successful evening or an unsuccessful <laughs> evening? The trouble was that the economist thought it was to have more drinks bought for you, and the anthropologist thought it was uh, better to uh, buy more drinks for other people and have them in your in your debt. The, the there were two lessons for me. One was that if you're going down to the pub, it's better to go with anthropologists than with economists. There are many reasons why that's true, actually, uh, but this is one of them. But the other was thinking about it afterwards. The idea that one is trying to find a true model and that there is an empirical test as to which is the true model is not is not a way of thinking about these kind of social phenomena. Actually, an anthro a very well known anthropologist, Clifford Greats, uh, talked about thick description. That is, there are many layers of explanation of social phenomena and all of them were true in some sense. The gift exchange observation was partly true uh, and the transaction cost explanation was partly true, but neither of them were the truth and neither of them provided an explanation of the whole. So that is a need to think about models and economics in this kind of eclectic way and reversing that imperialism, economic imperialism of the 1970s. I think we as economists have a great deal to learn from other social sciences and need to do so. And the one which has been making certainly for me most impact on the ways one should think about economics is actually the developments of evolutionary psychology. Um, uh, uh, Alan has uh, written eloquently uh, on models of um, interacting behavior based on ants. We are not ants, of course, as people occasionally point out. That doesn't mean the model of ants is not, uh, is not without its value. The truth about ants is that they are, like humans, one of the relatively few successful social species, and they have evolved to be very good at being ants. As, uh, as Joe has described, uh, 
optimize the right evolution does not really lead to optimization. It leads to adaptation to the circumstances in which you, you find yourselves. And ants are very good at building ant nests. They're not good as humans are at building Westminster Abbey. And we can, well, if we understand the evolutionary mechanisms, we can understand these processes of adaptation. And that's why for me, the book I've learned, the thing I've learned most about economics from the last five years, I would say is not an economics, it is not an economics paper. It's Joe Henry's uh, work on, um, on what he calls the secret of our success as humans. It's also Nick Christakis's work on what he calls blueprint and evolutionary psychology. I think we have a great deal to learn from that. And we also have a great deal to learn as to why behavioral economics is not, as it were, the panacea for critiques of rationality that some people think it is. The biases to which we're subject, uh, allegedly subject, are not things that we ought to be knocked over the head and persuaded not to do. They are adaptive responses to an uncertain and complex environment. And Alan and Joe's contribution to our subject is really to help us understand these adaptive responses to a complex and uncertain environment. Thank you very much indeed, John. We're running a little bit behind time, so I think it's uh, only fair if we move on to the next panel, but I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunity at the interval uh, to approach both of you and ask any questions that you may have. Uh, so, Mary, can I ask you to uh, come down the screen? Go to the next session, please. So, um, my name is Mary Morgan, I'm from LSE, and it's uh, my pleasure to um, introduce this roundtable session on equilibrium. Uh, we have three speakers, um, Sam Bowles from the Santa Fe Institute, who will be uh, joining us remotely. Um, Ed Hopkins, <laughs> sorry, I should know which one is which, <laughs> um, from Edinburgh, and um, uh, Ramakant from Oxford. Uh, we are a bit short of time, so I'm uh, going to um, not spend long introductions because they are all in these wonderful notes, uh, and we should go straight into uh, enjoying the contributions. Um, so, can we? Are we ready with um, Sam Bowles? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Yes. So, Sam, can I in invite you to give your talk and? And can I remind you, we're on a rather tight schedule here, so um, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. <clears throat> Thanks very much. It's uh, wonderful to be there. Can you hear me properly? Um, Not quite as well as before. Doesn't seem to be. Not quite as well as before, Sam. So whatever uh, you've done differently. Um, I haven't changed anything, but. Um, oh, that's it. Uh, that's that's well. that's yeah. Is that good? It, yeah. uh, it's, uh, well, first, I'm terribly sorry I can't be there with you. Uh, uh, as you see, I just took off my mask. I'm, I've got COVID, and so uh, that's just the breaks of the game. Uh, I, it's it's such a wonderful event to celebrate, uh, Alan. Uh, you you can see uh, uh, in the picture here uh, uh, with the red halo. Uh, Joe, it's great you mentioned that Alan made economics uh, and uh, theory fun. And as you can see, um, we had a, a lot of fun there uh, at the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, and there's a group of us working on a joint problem. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I want to start, uh, Joe, by disagreeing with you. And this is, uh, uh, wait, sorry. I seem to have got my slides are out of order, but they'll, Uh, okay, uh, Joe, you you said uh, that um, uh, Gerard was modest about his claims. Uh, <laughs> look at this. Uh, this is what he said. Well, actually, the headline isn't exactly what he said. Uh, the headline is uh, the superiority of the liberal economy is incontestable and can be demonstrated mathematically. <laughs> well, uh, I want to talk about that because it seems to me that the idea that mathematics has 
justify the liberal economy was really an important part, not just of the Chicago School, but occasionally I think uh, de Burr may have slipped into thinking that himself. Now, Alan knows a lot about this particular quote, and Alan, perhaps later you'll recount your conversation with Gerard uh, about this. But the main, I mean, the main element of Alan's conversation with Gerard about this was his paper, of course, The, uh, uh, the Emperor uh, Has No Clothes. Um, and uh, I would just like to review what uh, Alan showed there, uh, drawing on existing results from de Brew himself, actually, uh, as well as, of course, Sun and Shine and others, uh, before extending this to a different case of something very much like what I think Alan uh, uh, showed in his No Clothes paper. Um, the, um, uh, the No Clothes paper was really about the uh, excess demand functions and their arbitrary nature. Uh, uh, in the standard model. And just in case you're wondering what a, uh, an arbitrary excess demand function looks like, there's one down in the lower right. Uh, obviously not something we would like to see. Um, so just let me review the, I'm quoting here from Alan. Uh, any continuous function satisfying Walras law, law uh, can be an excess demand function. Well, that's bad news. Uh, that means, of course, they don't have to be downward sloping just to be clear what's going on. Now, Alan's diagnosis of the problem is interesting. The problem seems to be embodied in was an essential feature of a centuries long tradition in economics, that of treating individuals as acting independently of each other. And he goes on to say that this plays an essential role in generating the arbitrary excess demand functions. Uh, and he put his finger on the following, which I think is a profound and uh, statement of much greater importance than in just the question of general equilibrium theory. Uh, as soon uh, as it is removed, that is the assumption of independence, uh, autonomy and so on, as soon as it is removed, the class of functions that can be generated is limited. Uh, so that's his way out. Uh, and the conclusion is in the standard framework, we have too much freedom in constructing individuals. That's the point I want to come back to because I think this is not the only case where it's true. Now, Alan suggested some escape routes uh, and uh, a number of authors have, of course, said, well, yes, we can really, we can essentially rescue the general equilibrium theory by essentially substituting a bargaining process for the auctioneer. By the way, I tried out this, I mean, this idea was associated with Smale and Duncan Foley and a number of other people. I tried this idea out on Ken Arrow a number of times, and he was not very warm to the idea at all, that we essentially let people bargain to the, to the efficient uh, con uh, uh, contract locus. Uh, so, um, uh, with, but some people uh, developed this as an alternative. The sun and shine at all was taken as a bombshell only because of the hegemonic status of the Walrasian paradigm at the, at the time. But the widespread sense uh, that the abstract economic theory of multi-market competitive interactions uh, had reached a dead end is not misplaced. And uh, then uh, Smale Foley uh, could be drawn on to say we replace the uh, Walrasian auctioneer by a bargaining process, a uh, cosine process, and we get approximate Pareto optimality when impediments to trade or non-market transactions are absent. So this is a, a kind of attempted escape. And you may wonder who wrote that. That was me in my textbook, essentially arguing for, the, for a cozy and rescue operation. And um, I still think it's a good idea. I think it's an excellent idea. I think that's the way we should be theorizing when we theorize about general equilibrium problems. But um, uh, let me bring up there's a fundamental problem, even with the bargaining, even when, when impediments to bargaining, at least of the type that we usually discuss, are present. So let's think about what I call the liberal trinity. I think most people, when they think about the Valrasian paradigm, they think it has shown some, uh, some, uh, some results about the liberal economy, as we recalled it. Uh, and let me lay out what they are. Uh, and I'll identify these as the Trinity. Barring contractual incompleteness, uh, the following desiderata uh, can jointly obtain. Uh, neutral preferences. People can have any preferences you want, including unmitigated self-interest. Their actions, including participation in any exchange, are voluntary, uh, whatever these preferences happen to be. And finally, the resulting allocations uh, from exchange are Pareto efficient. Uh, now, 
uh, I'm going to come back to that, that the trinity of those three results uh, 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 as being a fundamental idea so that we can see the Walrasian paradigm as the foundation of a liberal economy. But the idea of essentially test driving institutions by assuming unmitigated self-interest, which is very common, for example, in mechanism design, uh, it's not a new idea at all. Uh, um, Alan, you can probably translate this, but just in case uh, you don't have a mic, uh, the basic idea from, from Machiavelli is uh, uh, it's necessary for anyone who would establish a republic and set up its laws to suppose that all men are wicked. Uh, uh, Hume said something almost so similar, it's almost as if he must have read Machiavelli. In contriving any system of government, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other end in all of his actions than his private uh, interest. Now, by the way, neither Machiavelli nor Hume, Hume thought that that was true. They, they right away say, oh, this is not really what people are like. Um, okay, um, the, the part of the liberal trinity which is most uh, unfamiliar to economists is the idea of what's called liberal neutrality. Uh, uh, we use the term unrestricted preferences in mechanism design. But I, I think you'll see it's a familiar idea. Here's Dworkin saying uh, political decisions must be independent of any particular conception of what gives value to life or the good life. It's not the function of the state uh, to impose the pursuit of any particular set of ends. Uh, and so basically the idea is that however the liberal economy works, it should work under any set of preferences, of course, including uh, unmitigated self-interest. Now this comes back to Alan's remark. <clears throat> In the standard framework, we have too much freedom in constructing individuals. Well, that's just what mechanism design has done. Done basically is that individuals bring them on. We don't care what they're like. Well, I, I, where this is going, you can imagine is we have to care what they're like, and I think that's what Alan, the point Alan is making in his no clothes paper. Uh, <clears throat> so, if we translate the liberal uh, trinity into economic language, it's basically this. Under unrestricted preferences, the Nash equilibrium is satisfying both a participation constraint and an incentive compatibility constraint would be Pareto efficient. Now, I, I want to understand, uh, I want to underscore these as philosophical statements because I think we understand very well how they work economically. So I'll call them respectively preference neutrality, liberty, and efficiency. Uh, now, with my co-author, Sung Ha Wang, uh, we basically have shown, actually drawing on standard results from mechanism design, that you can't get all three. They're, they're uh, uh, mutually incompatible. You can get any two, uh, any two simultaneously, but you can't have all three, even in a very, very simple case. Uh, and uh, so this is the uh, this is the trinity, the idea that we can have all of these three things. The vertices are the the desert desiderata, uh, and um, uh, essentially, well, I'm repeating what I said before there. Let's consider a simple case. This is uh, a, a double auction mechanism studied by Chatterjee and Samuelson, also by Meyerson uh, and, and, and others, uh, satisfied. Uh, the basic result they show is uh, in this double auction, participation constraint and incentive compatibility constraint with unrestricted preferences imply that you're going to have unexploited gains from trade. Now, this is not a case in which you have public good aspects or externalities or anything of the kind. It's a simple case of ex exchanging goods in a bargaining setup. Uh, uh, just to review, I'm sure this is a very familiar bargaining setup, I'm sure. The goods, uh, uh, some people have goods, others may purchase them. The good may be worth anything uh, to the buyer or the seller from zero to one. Uh, the VS is the value of the good to the seller. VB is the value of the good to the buyer. So gains from trade or any trade at a price in between those two. Uh, <clears throat> now the the setup uh, in the in the double auction is that uh, people announce their uh, bids uh, B and S as the price at which they're willing to sell or buy. Uh, a trade may take place uh, if the uh, um, uh, uh, a trade may not take place if, this, if the selling price exceeds the buying price. And of course, a trade may take place uh, in the other case. And it takes place at some price based on uh, the two bids, S and B. The standard one is split the difference, but uh, the theorem that results here doesn't depend at all on the uh, 
the pricing rule as long as both bids are uh, part of the price. Uh, and what, what Chatterjee uh, actually showed in his dissertation, uh, that it's not a best response to report truthfully your evaluation. That is, so the uh, S will never be equal to B sub S and B will never be equal to V sub B. And therefore, there's going to be some range of, uh, of offers such that a Pareto improving trade will not take place. Um, essentially, uh, the, uh, the buyers uh, understate their values and the sellers overstate their values. And the reason is because the price depends on that. Uh, you, you may miss out on a trade, but if you get a trade, you'll have a better price. It's a very simple idea. Uh, now, so what, th what that says in terms of the, of the Trinity is you can't have uh, preference neutrality, voluntary participation, and Pareto efficiency. Now, if, for example, I mean, there are all kinds of things you could, you could impose truth telling on people or you could say something about what the individuals can do, but unrestricted preferences give you the Chatterjee, Samuelson, uh, Myerson, Satterthwaite uh, problem. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> now, uh, you may think that there is a way out, and in fact, there is a way out, it's ingenious. It's, of course, the first thing you'd think of if you're into welfare economics, which is, oh, well, there's an external effect here. By, by, by me misrepresenting my valuation of the good, I'm imposing a cost on you because that'll affect the price in my favor. So why not uh, uh, design? Can we reverse engineer what is the tax that could be imposed on the person giving the bid such that that externality would be internalized? And it turns out, of course, that there is such a tax. Uh, this was, uh, it was developed for this particular case by, uh, by Chatterjee in a paper in uh, uh, 1982. Uh, and uh, the, the difficulty is that in order for the tax to do the internalization, it has to be imposed irrespective of whether a trade takes place or not. Uh, now, if that's the case, uh, then of course, some people uh, will, there will be a, there'll, there'll be a tax, but there may not be any trade because there's no reason for trade. If I value, the, if I'm selling and I value the good at one and you value the good at zero, there shouldn't be a trade, but there will be a transfer. Uh, now, what that means is that a number of people having found out the good that they value and having found out what the pricing scheme is and the tax would prefer to withdraw. They would never agree to do that in advance. In other words, this taxing the externality violates uh, their participation constraint. Uh, well, um, what, what that does is, if, if you look in the uh, right there, essentially, uh, you, can, uh, you, can have Pareto, um, you can have Pareto efficiency and you can have preference neutrality, but you can't have voluntary participation. That is, the way you internalize that essentially is violating the participation constraint. What Huang and I showed uh, in a paper, which we still haven't published, just out of indolence, basically, uh, is that uh, um, the, uh, you can solve the problem through preferences also. Uh, uh, if, um, if either buyer or seller, one of them is enough, is sufficiently altruistic, uh, then no mutually beneficial traits will go unrealized. And uh, if you wonder how this works, it's exactly like Becker's uh, family altruist in the Rotten Kid Theorem. Uh, now, if you look at the picture, uh, uh, this essentially basically says uh, that uh, if, you, if you give up some freedom in constructing individuals, like make them altruistic or truth telling and so on, you get out of the problem. But given the liberal assumptions, which I think are faithful to the way liberals think that they ought to think about society, preference, neutrality, voluntary participation, and so on. Uh, the, the, the trinity is a trilemma. Uh, now, uh, so um, uh, we, we come back now to the larger issue. Um, what's wrong with Hume's constitution for knaves or, uh, or uh, Machiavelli's constitution for the wicked? Uh, the, um, uh, the basic idea, and it comes out of the Chatterjee Samuelson model and Myerson's Satterthwaite and so on, is that other regarding preferences and other and uh, commitments facilitate exchanges that in the absence of these ethical commitments would not occur. 
even in, even if you have a, a mechanism designer. The point here is, no matter how clever you are as a mechanism designer, you can't get around the problem that self-interested individuals are not going to come to greater efficient outcomes in a very large class of cases unless you violate a participation constraint. Uh, uh, now, um, uh, the um, uh, Arrow, as usual, wisely said, this is a paper about general equilibrium. He says processes of exchange require at least greatly facilitated by the presence of several virtues, not only truth, but also trust, loyalty, justice, and future dealings. In the absence of trust, opportunities for mutually beneficial cooperation would have to be foregone. Norms of social behavior, including ethical and moral codes, may be reactions of society to compensate for market failures. Uh, the uh, I, I quote Tim Besley here, uh, uh, he, he laid out a, a logic more or less along these lines, uh, and uh, he uh, concludes perhaps the solution can only be in creating better people. Well, I mean, obviously that is anathema to liberalism uh, because it's max of paternalism uh, and uh, all of the dangers uh, associated uh, with it. Uh, they, um, now, um, I think more modestly than what Tim said, uh, I would say it's, it seems to me important that we, uh, as Alan would put it, we, sh we have to restrict our freedom in constructing individuals. And we don't have to do this hypothetically or th by our imagination. We don't have to imagine what we would like people to be like. We can do what the great uh, philosophers like, for example, Hume and Machiavelli in other settings did, which is to take people um, as they are. We know a lot about what people are like, and we can, we can uh, uh, I think we have to, uh, do the heavy lifting of taking people as they are, describing them through empirical work experiments and so on, and see what we can do with that kind of theory. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Alan, for everything you've done for me personally. It's been an exciting ride. I love working with you, and thanks for your contributions to economics. Thank you very much, Sam, indeed. We're going to move on to the next paper and do the Q&A at the end when we've had the three papers. Hmm. So hang in there, please. Um, what do you need? Uh, what you so just need the laptop because right. four slides and then even we'll have to go through them at some speed. OK, great. Thanks so much. OK, so Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. OK, so non-equilibrium analysis and um, this Title alludes to Alan's well-known book, which has already been mentioned with Werner Hildenbrand, uh, but it rephrases the point towards another area that um, Alan has worked on. And um, so I think it's already been mentioned by a number of people that um, a lot of economics assumes equilibrium, and this may in fact be a bad thing. Um, Alan got there a long time ago, um, the paper in 1975, learned by firms about demand con con conditions. Um, was one of the first modern papers to ask, uh, rather than assuming equilibrium, ask the question, well, how do we get there and will we get there? Right. So in fact, Alan, so one idea about Alan's career is that he was um, conventional in the early days and only later became, um, widened his um, approach to include um, wider methods than general equilibrium. But this is evidence that in fact, Alan's been out of equilibrium for longer than you thought. <laughs> Um, so, um, but the other thing that, of course, Alan has worked on a lot is the idea of price formation, which um, could be taken in a number of different ways. But it's, I think a lot of it is this question about how prices are formed in practice without assuming equilibrium. Right? Um, now, equilibrium is convenient for everybody working in economic theory, but uh, I certainly would agree that it's not the whole story. Um, now, if we're talking about markets and about prices, then I think inevitably in practice, uh, sellers, choose, sellers choose prices over time and in response to, the, what their, to what do they experience. And this was what we call the process of price formation. And if you are going to do this, if you can analyze this process, this also should be informed by um, empirical work, by experience, by actually looking at what um, sellers really do. And this is not just about the methodology, though it is about methodology. It's also about getting different results, because if you do this seriously, and uh, Alan has always suggested that we should, um, we may indeed, and I think we do, get different results. So, 
Right. Um, in the in time available, I'd like to talk about in, um, non equilibrium approaches and strategic situations, since this is largely what I work on now. Um, um, although most of economics uh, does indeed assume equilibrium, there's at least one area of economics, uh, not a big area of economics, which is uh, either called evolutionary game theory or behavioral game theory, where actually we work all the time out of equilibrium. Um, anyway, um, and in talking about this, I want to go from um, from the 19th century, um, which is a long time ago, which is a period I certainly do not remember, to the 1990s, which I do remember with great affection, because that's when I did a PhD under Alan's supervision at the European University Institute. That's where I got started on these things. Um, and what I've been involved with more recently is uh, lab experiments in continuous time. And um, I mean, there are a lot of different lab laboratory experiments, but uh, the continuous time aspect is a relatively new one. And I'd like to propose that it's actually, it's actually very useful at looking at these issues about what happens out of equilibrium. Now, um, of the people I've talked to in general, I don't know any other economist who knows more about the history of economic thought in practice than Alan. So um, I hesitate to talk about a 19th century economist in front of him because uh, he knows far more than I ever will. But here are some of them. Um, and uh, Corner, Bertrand and Edgeworth all had their own take upon the, what they would call the duopoly problem um, back in the 19th century. Um, and just to say that they did it in a very different way than um, is now currently taught in textbooks to uh, either at the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, now, they in some ways were much more realistic because they um, recognized and that, of course, in practice, Price formation takes place over time. Um, firms don't set up for one day, choose a price, and then shut down. Um, they inevitably engage in competition over time. And Corno had an idea, a very simple, but possibly a naive or, and also restrictive idea about how they would do this. But um, at least he thought about it as a process. Um, and um, we also have an early contribution from Edgeworth to say that this process is not necessarily an equi equilibrating process, that you can run this process and in fact it's not going to converge, that we don't get equilibrium even if we follow this process indefinitely. Now, progress. Um, this is not my idea, but I borrowed it. And here we have two maps of Africa, and the one at the bottom actually is uh, um, is after it is more recent than the one that is above and you notice the difference apart from the uh, color is that actually in the second one there are more blank spaces right so with progress we have more blanks right now this was observed by uh, paul krugman uh, in a very different context but this is also what's happened with game theory so we have a very simple kind of game theory in the 19th century which was we'd say relatively realistic at least had some idea also, but wanted to propose something about how prices be formed over time. Now, more recently, um, modern economic theory decided that wasn't rigorous enough because it doesn't really pin down how people are going to behave and doesn't pin down many other things. Um, and therefore, modern economic theory has uh, largely excluded that approach. Uh, and instead has proposed something which is very rigorous, very well defined and completely wrong. Right. In the sense that it, um, it, it is a theory which is um, precise, rigorous, and fails completely empirically. The aim of the theory was, in any theory, I hope, is to actually make a prediction which corresponds to, um, is able to make some kind of predictions which are correct, um, but it doesn't. Um, well, almost never. So, it was, of course, a, was, um, I would still say that um, Nash's uh, contribution, uh, more recent 1950s contribution, inventing what is now called Nash Equilibrium, it was still a major intellectual step forward. But the way that it's been applied um, and taken in, in standard theory is to say that we have this situation where indeed what our model of how firms behave is that they turn out for one day, choose one price and then shut down. Right. Now, this is um, has the advantage, 
us of, 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 of rigor. And it clarifies the difference between static and dynamic uh, models and uh, static and dynamic games. But if you take that um, specific model, not only is it not realistic, it fails to predict. Uh, I also do quite a lot of experimental work. And uh, one thing we know for sure, uh, though we tend not to repeat it very often, is that if you run that exactly kind of setup where you ask people to choose, say, a price exactly once, you don't get equilibrium. Nash equilibrium does not predict in those circumstances. Um, right. But um, things had the 1990s, I think, had swung around again a bit. And uh, there had been a lot of work in behavioral. There's been a quite a lot of work in experimental too. And I think it became had become apparent that um, an, a naive and direct application of the, uh, Nash equilibrium or an equilibrium approach in explaining how people actually chose uh, in games or people would actually choose prices in an oligopoly situation. The um, basic or standard uh, theory was rigorous and fair, but at the same time failed to predict accurately. And something which was very memorable for me was a conference in uh, Florence in 1991 at the European University Institute, which was organized by Alan, which brought together people uh, from micro and macro who are all working on this issue about learning, about uh, how to integrate adaptive expectations um, into economic models. And it's also worth remarking is that um, Alan has worked on networks in theory. He also works in networks in practice. And he's one of the great connectors of the profession where he brings people together and knows an enormous number of people, uh, some of, of course, many of people here today, but also other people in the profession all seem to know who Alan is um, and have warm, warm opinions of, of him. So anyway, um, so if in the 1990s, we also had a problem because we didn't know what to do because uh, this was new and we had to uh, borrow things from other disciplines. Occasionally economics does do that, not often, but sometimes. And evolutionary game theory is one thing that we turn to. Um, and I think there's a kind of uh, consensus uh, in evolutionary game theory now, which is what we think about really about how uh, games run in practice or how, for example, pricing games would run in practice, right, is we don't just play just once, we play repeatedly. We have a bunch of people, the players who interact repeatedly and um, they learn by experience and change the, the way they behave according to experience. And strangely enough, we're back again, not too far from what was proposed by Cournot back in the 19th century. Uh, the, the difference is I hope that we've, unfortunately, uh, it becomes a bit mathematical, but I think you can use math in some cases to make predictions. And um, we can make some um, sometimes relatively precise predictions about what we think is going to come out of this process. Um, however, by the way, it remains this is still kind of behavioral, not as kind of mainstream stuff. And um, I, I confuse a lot of my colleagues by talking about things this way. Um, OK, now the thing is, what some of these theoretical results show is that you can get Nash equilibrium in the long run. Right. This is a theory, at least that you apply these adaptive processes. You will say for people who follow simple rules and they learn by experience and um, don't have correct beliefs in the beginning, uh, but maybe they adjust those beliefs over time. And we see and we predict what would happen if the uh, process was followed. And we have, there are results which show that we will converge to Nash equilibrium in the long run. Um, now, long before this, there was Milton Friedman who said that the um, reason why we assume rational agents um, is because they will learn to be rational in the long run. So this is a game theoretic version of that, of uh, Milton Friedman's classic defense, in a sense, and saying that um, if everything is, is um, even if people are adaptive, people don't know the equilibrium, uh, people will find it over time. OK, now, um, right. And I think the thing is, is a lot of people would like to stop there. A lot of people in the profession would like, in as much as they acknowledge this, would like to say, well, yes, this works. We can assume equilibrium because people will learn it over time. Um, what I would say, and I think this is something which I, I think 
is also Alan's repeated service to the profession is that you can't do this or you shouldn't do this. It's not intellectually honest, right? The same theories which say that you do get convergence in some cases is um, says that you will not get convergence in others. Right? And um, Alan as, uh, was saying this from 1975 onwards. Right? Now, um, I think what Alan was interested in was the idea that um, that people have a misspecified model and therefore it actually stops um, learning, or learning the truth because you start out misspecified and everything you see uh, confirms um, your prejudice, as it were. Now, this type of model has actually become more popular again in a mainstream economic theory of the last few years because people want to apply it to voters. I've got no idea why. Um, anyway, that, but what I wanted to talk about in the remaining time, and the time is very brief, is about a different kind of uh, non-convergence result, which it just says that some equilibria are fundamentally unstable. And this applies, I think, in particular to um, mixed equilibria. Now, um, and you can also apply it to what are called Edgeworth cycles. So I mentioned in the past, but way back in 1897, Edgeworth said these kind of adjustment processes don't necessarily lead to equilibrium. And um, the modern economist comes along and says, well, of course, we can solve that because we have something now called mixed e Nash equilibrium. And we can resolve the problem that Edgeworth set up by getting people to randomize. If people randomize in a particular way, that's an equilibrium. And that is our, the modern prediction in the type of duopoly that Edgeworth first analyzed back in the 19th century. Right? So we don't get cycles, people just randomize. Right? So that's an equilibrium. Now, um, if you take that seriously, you can take what I, uh, this kind of adaptive evolutionary approach seriously, we say, well, yes, that's a possibility. It's a possibility that people learn over time and we will get to that modern mixed equilibrium. But first of all, I want to say is that along the way, we will get cycles. Even in the positive case, Right? where we get convergence, we will get a, we will get Edgeworth cycles. Right? Um, on the other hand, um, we, if you do the math, we can find out that actually in a number of cases, this the equilibrium will be unstable. So these cycles never go away, but they will persist forever. Right, right. and this is something that uh, I, I was able to work with uh, Tim Kaysen and Dan Freeman to run an experimental test of this. Right. And um, I mean, lags are sometimes long, but also there's a change in technology. This is testing some theory that originally was in my PhD dissertation under Alan's supervision, but um, we now have different technology in terms of continuous time experiments. Um, the time is very short, so I will be as brief as possible. What we did in the lab was we get a, a six sellers uh, choosing prices, right? And but the big difference is we run it in continuous time, which the, what really it means is it's a free form. Anything goes, you can change your price whenever you want or just leave it as it is. And this is the way that it differs from um, most previous experiments. Right? So it is, um, prices will be formed over time, the way that the sellers actually want them to be formed. They don't, they're not constrained to change prices at any particular time or to change prices simultaneously. They can change whenever they want, right? If you were a participant in the experiment, this is what you would see. You have this information. Um, you get to uh, slide at the bottom left to choose your price and you can move this up and down whenever you want or just leave it as it is and your price won't change. We have information about what the other sellers are doing and um, how prices are changing over time and on the bottom right, what you are earning, given your prices and the other prices of the other people. Right, so, okay. Now, um, let's, as time is short, let's skip to what the predictions are in a very simple sense. We ran it in two treatments, one with um, parameters such the equilibrium is stable, and um, in, we have an S for stable, and we have, this is a graph uh, where there's price, basically a median price on the horizontal axis, and dispersion of prices on the vertical axis. And um, 
there's a stable equilibrium and we should get convergence to that stable equilibrium when we have those parameters. And uh, in the unstable equilibrium, we should follow the red clockwise cycle around the unstable equilibrium. We should never get to the equilibrium. Right. OK, now um, what we see uh, in practice, we get cycles over time. This is uh, in the time dimension that we go around in circles, clockwise wise circles, as the theory predicts. And uh, things in everything experiments are much more complicated than the theory. Um, right? The red is remember what we predict. The blue is what we see. We get a lot of spaghetti, basically, rather than something neat and tidy. And, and let me just explain really uh, again to get to the end just as quickly as possible. Is you might not have expected to see this, but this is actually kind of important. Um, right, this is London. We are somewhere in the middle, but but round about the edge, there is the wonderful institution called the M25 Orbital Motor Motorway. Now, the thing is about this, this is a paradox, but it's kind of obvious when you think about it this way is if you were in a car driving at a constant speed around the M25 forever, just think about that as a concept, it's not good. Um, but you had a modern satellite nav nav navigation system in your, in your car, at least to keep you company on this uh, endless journey, and you recorded this constantly, and then you averaged it, right? The average is not the M25 motorway, is actually the centre of London. I did some rough calculations and I found the nearest point of interest is the Ministry of Sound nightclub, right? Um, right? So the point is, it's actually very paradoxical. You run this experiment, we get tremendous cycles, we go round and round and round and round, you average it out over time and you hit the equilibrium, right? Which is like saying, um, if you look at the average, we are in equilibrium, we are in the nightclub, but of course we're not. We're going around the M25. The only thing, other thing I want to add to that is, um, yeah, the difference in the theoretical difference between stable and unstable is the difference between the M25 and the north and south circular, right? So the unstable equilibrium is going around the big circle and the stable equilibrium generates behavior which goes around the small circle. But in neither case do we actually go to the Ministry of Sound. We don't actually go to the equilibrium we go around in cycles around the outs, outer parts of London. Um, as a lo ex Londoner, uh, well, I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. Um, yeah, that's all that. Okay. Um, look, we do have some tools to talk about things out of equilibrium. I think they should be used more often. I learned about this kind of stuff from Alan, and I would like to just to thank him very much for uh, encouraging all me and all of us to think about things out of equilibrium. Thanks very much. London. <laughs> yeah, trying to avoid the M25. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here uh, uh, at this event uh, for Alan because mm -hmm. Alan, uh, from uh, from my student days, he has been an inspiration for me, an intellectual inspiration for me and many other in our field. Uh, more specifically, I, I did my PhD at the end of the previous century, and uh, Alan had already published two, two very important papers which inspired me a lot. So my uh, the work I did in my PhD was uh, related to the narrow area of financial networks, as Joe Stiglitz put it. And uh, on this topic, Alan had published two very interesting papers. One was communication and markets a suggested approach. I think that's roughly what Alan looked like uh, when he wrote that paper, this picture here. <laughs> and then uh, uh, during my PhD, he published another paper in Journal of Evolutionary Economics, uh, The Economy as an Evolving Network. And I think both of these papers were highly influential in the adoption of stochastic uh, graphs and networks uh, as a modeling framework in in finance in particular, and uh, at the time we were looking at this, it was pretty exotic, but now, as you can see, they have be become standard tools in the modeling of financial stability in particular. So that was uh, uh, my first intellectual contact with Alain. 
And since then, I've been uh, uh, I've continued to uh, read what he has been producing, and uh, it has been always in inspiring. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, Alan also wrote, uh, uh, of course, a lot of things about equilibrium dynamics and uh, the insufficiency of equilibrium concepts, and and one of his papers uh, is. Uh, a more recent paper uh, uh, called Wallace's Unfortunate Legacy, uh, in which he has the following paragraph. He says that uh, Wallace's specific vision of the nature of equilibrium became the, bench became the bench benchmark for modern economic theory and led us to the Arrow-Dubro model, which is characterized by its lack of institutional features and the lack of any proof of stability under adjustment. Above all, there is no place in this framework for out of equilibrium dynamics. And this is, I think, related to the previous uh, to uh, uh, talks, and this is also what I'm going to talk, talk about here a little bit. So, uh, so why would you study out of equilibrium dynamics? I think many people in this audience would not need this explanation, but just to uh, say what we're talking about here, there are many motivations, of course, for studying uh, e economic dynamics in general, uh, out of equilibrium dynamics in particular. So, in the literature, in the economic lit literature, the the first uh, um, Motivation for this was historically to uh, look at dynamics as a mechanism for justifying equilibrium. So why do we actually see e equilibrium? There should be some mechanism which makes us converge to equilibrium. And more generally, when we're faced with multiple equilibria, as is often the case in sophisticated models with uh, uh, some, uh, some degree of realism, as a mechanism for equilibrium selection. So uh, are there, what's the role of initial conditions? Uh, if we want to direct the system towards a specific equilibrium, uh, we can try to analyze uh, the role of incentives and policies in directing this dynamic. So here we're this type of literature dealt with uh, near equilibrium dynamics or the stability of equilibria under perturbations. And this was already something that uh, was uh, re reflected in the work of Walras, as Alan put it in his pay paper. Uh, he has a, so Walras has a very nice way of putting it. He, he actually uh, described, he, he actually did not uh, stipulate that uh, economic systems are in permanent equilibrium. He, he never said that. And the, the sentence he has is, uh, he compares uh, the economy to a lake stirred by the wind in which the water continually seeks its equilibrium without ever achieving it. That's the exact phrase of Wallace. So he was thinking about uh, systems uh, as, uh, economic systems as close to equilibrium, but never exactly ach achieving it. As, uh, and he thought of equilibrium as an ideal state. But here we're still, the we're talking about still, um, the same type of mathematical tool that you would use to study uh, equilibrium uh, themselves, so fixed point theory uh, and uh, and uh, and convex analysis for looking at uh, existence of uniqueness of equilibrium. Then the second uh, type of uh, analysis which has looked at uh, non-equilibrium dynamics is uh, studying transitions between equilibria often under external shocks. For example, uh, one of the famous examples of this is bank run models. A lot of uh, talk about this uh, in the recent uh, news, of course, and also there was the, the Nobel Prize last year attributed to Diamond and Dipic for their very important work in, work mm -hmm. in this area. So the Diamond and Dipic model of bank runs and also uh, the, uh, the work that has followed these models of, uh, on, on the variance of this, uh, you can think of it as, uh, um, uh, describing a bank run as a transition between two equilibria, so uh, an, e an equilibrium in which the bank is healthy, and then all of a sudden there, there can be uh, another equilibrium in which uh, depositors have already withdrawn their de deposits and the bank is in default. Uh, so uh, the bank run itself, however, is not either of these, it's the transition between the two. And what we've seen in the recent examples is that this can be a very impressive transition. For example, uh, I think what we witnessed in the SVB default is probably the largest bank run in history. I think Joe Stiglitz alluded to this several times. Uh, it's uh, we, we saw a withdrawal of 42 billion in one day. That's more than $1 million per second. So think of this. 
So, and, and I think nobody would claim that you can describe a $1, a $1 million per second withdrawal of deposits as an equilibrium phenomena itself, nor, as some people would have said, uh, a sequence of temporary equilibria. As, as some of the, there's a technical fix that was proposed. So, uh, this is a transition between equilibria and uh, many of the uh, um, of the discussions, policy discussions, are focused on uh, crisis management, which means how to manage the transitions between these equilibria. Even if you consider the initial and the final state as equilibrium of of, of the system, uh, managing the transition is uh, is very uh, is is what's the crux of crisis management. And many policy tools are indeed uh, uh, designed to deal with this. And this is also um, this idea of looking at transitions between e equilibria uh, generated by external shocks is also implicitly the point of view adopted in many macro stress tests. For example, if you look at the IMF uh, stability exercises, the financial stability exercises run by the IMF, they, uh, of course, they look at uh, um, economies subject to large external shocks, interest rate shocks, other types of shocks. But uh, uh, the way they think about it is that, well, we start from the current state, we sub subject uh, the system to external shocks, which, but by the way, are the, the origin of these shocks is not explicitly described. They're exogenously given in stress test exercises. But then the assumption, and this is a big assumption, is that somehow the economy equilibrates uh, to a new state. And so basically the stress test exercise consists in computing this new equilibrium and then comparing it to the current state and then seeing what has moved and computing the losses of various institutions in this new state. So it is so implicitly the idea is that although we have these severe external shocks, which uh, really represent a crisis situation, the uh, the variables have the time to adjust and we will be eventually computing a new equilibrium. So even inside these stress test exercises, uh, you have uh, uh, someone in the basement who is running an equilibrium model of DSG type and computing the new equilibrium and comparing it with the old one and then looking at the variation. So this is again the idea of equilibrium creeps back into the stress test, which which is kind of paradoxical because you would think of a stress test as, as modeling some out of equilibrium state, you know, by the definition. But the way it's done in, in many institutions, especially uh, an institution in, uh, by the regulators, is really uh, the equilibrium dynamics creeps back in. So what I would like to talk about here is the third uh, uh, topic here, which I call far from equilibrium dynamics to, to insist, to em emphasize the fact that we're not uh, using dynamics as a device to describe relaxation to equilibrium or as a mechanism for examining the stability of equilibrium, but really the idea is we start from uh, the initial state of an economic system, which is empirically observed. So. Um, and then, uh, so many of these economic systems, and I'm going to talk about financial markets in a minute because that's what uh, uh, I'm studying. Uh, these are subject to a perpetual uh, stream of external random shocks, and also they're subject to feedback effects that govern their internal dynamics. And the combined effect of these two may lead to the system actually never converging uh, or even coming close to an equilibrium in the uh, in the classical sense, and I will show examples in which uh, these are of systems in which we can perfectly define notions of equilibria as fixed points of some best response functions, and then we can also look at realistic models of dynamics for the variables in the system based on empirical data or uh, or um, behavioral studies, and we can compare the outcomes of these two and see whether uh, there is actually convergence to equilibrium or we are in a perpetual um, uh, uh, cycle or, uh, or, or random evolution, which doesn't go close to this equilibrium. So the two examples I'm going to give are, are contagion and financial networks, and then I'll have an example from market banking dynamics. So, um, in, uh, so the field of my study is, is the mathematical modeling of financial markets, and although it's a narrow area, 
it, it's actually, I think, an interesting area for economic theory in general because one can think as, as financial bank, uh, of financial bank market as as the laboratories for testing a lot of uh, economic theories. The reason is that um, if any market comes close to the Walrasian ideal of competitive markets with, you know, with the profit maximizing agents, it's these financial markets. We have admittedly participants in financial markets are there for the profits. So there is a, uh, it's not a big leap to assume that they're indeed uh, choosing their actions for profit maximization motives. And uh, there is actually a Walrasian auctioneer uh, uh, called the market maker. So we are actually in, in a situation where there, there are such agents. And also uh, in organized markets like stock exchanges, uh, the situation uh, in the last decades is that we actually have a centralized limit order book in which agents can observe the supply and demand curve. So it's a very close to what you would describe as the ideal situation in which you have a competitive market where you actually can observe the supply and demand curves and you can react to it. You can uh, have coating strategies in, in response to uh, these, uh, this, uh, the, the order flow of other market uh, par par participants. And in fact, uh, the way uh, the market, uh, uh, but, but the market participants in these listed um, the financial markets behave is that they actually have algorithms which are which uh, people call quoting strategies and the quoting strategies are in fact uh, not just uh, 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 a a price proposed for uh, for the for the financial asset being traded at a point in time but rather a function uh, which gives the price as a function of the incoming order flow so it's really uh, what you would call a an inverse demand function as as the theorized in the in the classical theory. So we're very close to what could be a competitive bar market with really all the ingredients needed. And yet these are bar markets in which we see a lot of uh, disruptions, there are bubbles, crashes, crises, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of market discontinuities and extreme events. So uh, the quest question is what's uh, what's dri driving this? So in, of course, uh, it's also a um, a market in which there has been a dominant, uh, you know, paradigm the efficient market theory, and uh, from the point of view of efficient efficient market theory, so uh, of course there are all these heavy tails and uh, large uh, uh, movements in bar, 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 in markets, uh, extreme events, but these are typically uh, treated as statistical outliers or uh, black swan events and such. But this uh, just uh, sweeps the problem under the rug and uh, because one needs to explain why these statistical an anomalies and heavy tail events come by. So here I'm going to describe a little bit two uh, examples in which uh, one can uh, uh, one can see uh, how uh, how the adopting an equilibrium point of view implicitly uh, actually uh, um, uh, turns us away from, from finding a, an explanation for these phenomena and how other tools are available uh, for exploring, uh, exploring these problems. So the first uh, example is, uh, is related to financial networks. So this is related to the work of Alan and, and many others in this area. So it's um, so now uh, I think it's uh, it, it has, has become standard to use uh, the network models in modeling uh, the financial systems in particular uh, the network models have been used extensively to model for example the the dynamics of con contagion in banking systems and other financial systems uh, especially post 2008 where the role of interconnectedness was really underlined by what happened in the banking system in the US and internationally but uh, so here uh, the fact of having a network uh, doesn't fully define the dy dynamics of the system you can look at networks from an equilibrium standpoint or you can look at them th differently and this is what i want, want to underline here so um one of the uh one of the uh the dominant paradigms in this network literature is uh is uh, uh something that is based on a a paper of eisenberg and noe so the idea is that you have a network of liabilities uh, describing the exposures of different financial institutions or market participants with respect to each other. And then 
uh, the idea of Eisenberg Neub was to say, well, you know, think of this as some kind of payment system every night at mid midnight, the Fedwire system or whatever, the CHAP system in the UK. You have uh, lots of li liabilities in between these, uh, these banks and there is a clearing that takes place. So uh, this clearing, uh, uh, the, the clearing system will determine how much each bank uh, has to pay to the other, and uh, then this uh, this uh, this clearing vector uh, is uh, can be described as a fixed point of a certain function. Which uh, then, uh, uh, if you uh, if you com compute this clearing vector and then you determine how much each bank has to pay to all its counterparts, then this achieves. Uh, uh, this achieves the market clearing, and uh, that's what uh, describes the equilibrium of the system. Now, this model was really built by Eisenberg and Noah to describe payment systems. And in fact, uh, in payment systems, that's what happens every day at midnight. In Fedwire system, there is clearing every day. And if a bank cannot meet its clearing obligations, uh, it's declared te technically in default. But this model was then transposed to uh, models of interbank exposures and to model bank insolvency due to uh, uh, exposures of defaulting banks. And there, uh, it's really the equilibrium concept doesn't make sense anymore because uh, if you have certain banks that are in default, the it doesn't work like, like that, that the, uh, the regulator is going to uh, impose the general clearing on all the banking system and say, OK, now we liquidate all the assets of all the banks and then we see how much is left when all the obligations are pay paid out. In fact, if this were the case, uh, the notions of default and insolvency would be identical and we know they're not. And uh, uh, hence we have zombie banks and so on. So this notion of clearing factor and fixed point idea in network modeling seems very natural for those who come from this area, but actually it's uh, it leads to quite unrealistic uh, uh, outcomes and predictions for the model and it uh, and it um, and it neglects one important thing in network cascade dynamics, which is the order in which things happen. So uh, if if one bank fails, then uh, the if if uh, if well, for example, in bank runs, timing is everything. The depositors who withdraw first, they're okay. The depositors who come in late, they're you know they're going to be hold, holding the bag. So in a in a fixed point perspective, there's no such thing. There's no ordering. So uh, you would just uh, attribute the same. You just split the uh, what's left across the depositors uh, proportionally, but that's not what happens. That's what drives the bank run. And in the in the context of networks, uh, one can argue, for example, that what ha happened to Burr, Stearns, and Lehman was an institutional bank run. The timing issue was crucial. The funds that withdrew their uh, uh, the hedge funds that withdrew their funds initially didn't suffer. Those who held their funds with Lehman uh, were were in default, even though uh, two years later, 84% of the funds were, were recovered, they were already in default. So there are irreversible phenomena that happen and there is a timing issue and this fixed point approach to debt networks uh, completely uh, obfuscates this issue. So the second uh, example I would like to discuss is an example of out of equilibrium di dynamics, which is um, um, a, that's something that we've worked on recently. So in um, most of uh, of listed markets or organized markets today uh, in, in the in the financial world, most of these uh, the financial markets today are electronic, fully electronic. And in fact, uh, we heard uh, uh, in the in in Sam Ball's talk, he was referring to people, trust, and so on. Actually, most of the trading in these financial markets is done by out algorithms, there's no people involved. So yeah. algorithms trading against algorithms, more than 90% of trades on the London Stock Exchange are uh, purely algorithmic. But now, uh, so so one of the interesting qu questions that people are studying now is, how do these markets op operate? What's the difference between a market where algos trade against algos compared to fish markets or you know other markets where there is a human component? And uh, there's a lot of data on this because we have uh, high frequency records of prices, quantities, order flow on these bond markets. 
we have terabytes of data. And also we have a good understanding of the types of algorithms that are being used. So one of the crucial components of these algorithms is that they are based on machine learning, meaning that the algorithms learn continuously from the inflow of data about price behavior, but also about what the other participants are doing because they see the order flow. So they're adaptive um, algorithms. And typically, uh, so here's an example of which we studied in our model. So it's, uh, so we have, um, um, in these markets, multiple market makers and uh, clients come in where they have a request for quotes and then in return, the market makers observe this order flow and they quote uh, buy and sell prices, bid and ask prices. So they learn how to quote by observing the effectiveness of their quoting strategy in the re recent past and by observing how the order flow reacts to their quotes. And this is, these are public domain algorithms based on reinforcement learning. So they learn from the profit they make and uh, they are uh, used extensively. And this uh, topic became important for regulators in the recent years because they realized that many markets in which uh, these algorithms are deployed end up by exhibiting rather strange behavior. Uh, reminiscent of collusion. So this is something that some people have alluded to as algorithmic collusion. So the question was, are these uh, algos colluding or is there some funny thing going on in the dynamics that makes them look like colluding or what, what's going on? So the good news is that um, this, uh, so there, there are tools for, for, for modeling these situations. The tools are not fixed point theory or or, or, or the concept of Nash equilibrium in game theory, but uh, we can model explicitly the dynamics of these learning algorithms uh, and uh, through the use of systems called of, of, of multi-agent reinforcement learning. And uh, so what we can do is we can uh, build uh, simulation models of these al algos uh, where we have multiple interacting market bank makers learning from the order flow. So there's no direct exchange of information to be collusion, but they learn from the order flow and we can model specifically the ways they learn based on uh, what we know from the actual al algorithms used. Now, the outcome of this oh, is shown here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I'll show the, the result on, on, on the slide. So this slide shows the results of this kind of simulation. So these are uh, um, games, if you like. Uh, uh, you can think of as as a multiplayer uh, but, uh, games where the actors are market made makers. And in these games, we have the luxury of being able to com compute the Nash equilibrium. And we also can look at the uh, realistic uh, behavior rules of these al algos, how, how they interact and look at the uh, outcome of the, the, the evolution of the system. So this, these graphs show uh, the price uh, quotes. Uh, so bid and ask are you know, blue and, and orange uh, as the out outcome of the learning algorithm with two market bid makers, whereas the green and the red uh, bands, uh, the smaller uh, band in between, show uh, the Nash equilibrium computed uh, for the same system. So what we see is that even after a very long uh, learning process, uh, actually the two market makers in this in this configuration they learn to quote larger spreads, which are reminiscent of a collusion. Although in this case there's no direct exchange of information, so this is an example of al algorithmic collusion. Whereas the Nash equilibrium, which is the competitive concept in this case would predict a smaller spread between bid and ask, which is the band in the middle. So here's an example in which you can actually model the realistic dynamics uh, and the dynamics does not lead to the equilibrium, which is predicted by the static theory. The same thing persists in terms of strategies. And this is the, yeah, so this is the last slide. Okay. So the, the strategies also display a similar deviation. So the quoting strategy in Nash equilibrium is shown uh, in, in the uh, 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 in the lines here below. So this is the price is quoted as a function of inventory, whereas the quoting strategy learned by these uh, algos is the one showed in the band. So uh, uh, as you can see, both in terms of strategies and in terms of pricing outcomes, the uh, learning does not lead to the Nash equilibrium, but leads to something different, which is in line with 
what uh, people have observed in foreign exchange markets. This is a, a example specifically trained on the foreign exchanges. So I would just stop here. So my final word is that, uh, well, there was this question by the journalist yesterday about uh, mathematics and uh, how uh, can it be used or not in, in uh, but to improve uh, economic insights. I would just wanted to, uh, uh, through my talk, I just wanted to insist on the fact that mathematics is broader than fixed point theory and convex analysis. And there are many exciting and interesting uh, but, but developments in quantitative modeling that can help model things, including uh, the dynamics of economic systems outside of equilibrium. Thank you. Thank you very much. A few minutes for questions. Uh, questions from or whether um, Alan would like to comment to respond to any of the uh, papers that have been discussions given. Three of our any people that catch their thoughts and some good questions. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, the microphone's coming. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a question for Ed Hopkins. Um, uh, I'm interested in uh, industrial strategy and the economics underpinning industrial strategy. And I wondered whether you thought that the, the that economics had been uh, constrained by excessive interest in, equi in equilibria, uh, or whether the kind of thinking that you're describing is is well integrated into it. Um, I think it's a very interesting question, but yes, I'm afraid I don't know very much. Um, I think the point is, I mean, this is a is a disadvantage about the kind of which are very relatively abstract, but we have unfortunately therefore, but we have very little to say about policy, which I I I, I feel very ashamed about, but that I'm, I'm, unfortunately is the truth because um I. I, th I would say the only general thing I would say about policy is yes, I think you need to uh, economics has to deal with the way things are rather than the way that uh, theory assumes that they that they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Questions, please. Responses. Oh, sorry, I. Sorry, there's somebody on the. No, they just. Yeah. No. Oh, beg your pardon. No. There is. Okay. So maybe I should. Sorry, they're counting while you're figuring out what the question is. Um, yeah, Alan. Oh. Sorry, there's a. Yes, there's, here it is. No, I just wanted to react very quickly to some of the things that were said. And it was so interesting to hear all of these things. Um, and first, Joe, um, he didn't mention one thing which I think was really interesting. It was uh, Buzz Brock and Cass Homis worked on uh, a wonderful thing where they showed that if people uh, have some sort of rules for forecasting, and then they say, well, this all settles down and becomes stable, but once it becomes stable, then people say, well, you know, the, the system is so simple, I will choose a simpler rule, which I don't need to use all this fancy calculations. But as soon as they do that, the whole thing destabilizes again. And they call that rational roots to randomness. Mm. Now, that was one thing. Um, and then uh, John Kay didn't uh, make much play with his work on radical uncertainty, which I think is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And he was too modest to say much about that. Uh, then um, it was, uh, I think, it was probably John who said uh, um, about people that they going to have a round of drinks. Do you remember that? Well, the uh, there was we did have a colleague, Louis André Girardet, who unfortunately passed away. But Louis André had a wonderful gift, which was if you went to a restaurant, for example, and then there would be this question, should we all pay what we add or should we just uh, take the, the average and we all pay the average? And uh, Louis André would always say, well, let's just pay the average or, or let's all pay our own share. But 
it turned out that Louis André was amazingly quick at working out which was to his advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so work out if he had actually eaten above the average, then uh, the, uh, we immediately all started to pay the average and so forth. So, so you know, even though we have this notion that people are simple minded, there's some guys around. <laughs> uh, and then maybe just a couple of other things. Um, Adam Smith, everybody always quotes the book Butcher and the Baker and so forth. And, you know, this is in the general interest. But he also said uh, somewhere else that people have a very nasty, rapacious taste from uh, um, serving their own ends. And that's uh, something which he thought was universal. So Adam Smith also had this very negative view of how people behave. And my last um, observation was about uh, the impossibility of a Parisian liberal. And uh, I think we really come back to Sam in some sense there, that uh, the, you, even in very simple examples, you can show that uh, you couldn't actually have a complete satisfaction of all the criteria you wanted. And I think that was Amartya Sen who uh, first published uh, that uh, paper in that line. Okay, so they're just my reactions to all the things that you said. They're all very interesting. And last remark for Rama, which is that uh, the reason I got on, got on to stochastic graphs, and I think that's the one of the few things I can claim to be the first person on something in economics. But anyway, got on to stochastic graphs. Why was that? Because I was deep and interested, in, not at all. It, at the core where I was at the time, the journals that were refused by the library were thrown on the table and you could read them because we weren't going to subscribe to those. So, of course, I read those. And um, there, uh, there was one called Quality and Quantity, a journal you've never heard of. But that's where I found this result about stochastic graphs. And uh, it was a theorem of Polybas where they showed that, uh, you know, if you have the probability of knowing other people, if society is sufficiently large, whoever you meet, you will have a common friend with them. And that was, I think, Joe also mentioned that. So anyway, so I think in some sense, you know, all of these things sort of ring bells and uh, I'm very happy that so many people should have reacted to them. So thanks a lot. We have one question online. I think this might be um, <clears throat> most appropriate for Joe, actually. I think you sort of hinted it. Uh, the question comes from Martin White and he asks whether the exciting and important uh, discoveries and progress in information uh, and limited transparency is actually going to lead to a threat to many of those who benefit from the use of power uh, for their own profits. And perhaps that's why it's being excluded, particularly in the financial sector, he's saying. So yeah. the progress on many of the areas that you've worked on, are they just kept out of the, our way of wanting to deal with this? Uh, in some ways, touching on um, what our earlier speakers were saying about going from one equilibrium, being in one equilibrium or the other, but nobody wants to talk about the path. And maybe that's because it's quite a threat to people. Well, let's microphone down here, please. Yeah, uh, yes, I mean, obviously, I, I think one of the things uh, that uh, maintains profits is lack of transparency. Uh, that uh, the standard theories are that uh, if you have profits and everything is transparent, they get bit away, and that uh, you have ranks associated with imperfections of information. Uh, so one of the things that's been particularly troubling uh, is the fact that uh, as we've developed more quote, more efficient markets, actually more of the market, more of the trades are going into deep markets, like within Goldman Sachs, the story of S, uh, SVB, uh, all the sales of, of their bonds were not being done over the market, but over uh, dealers. So in fact, uh, we have uh, two things going on in financial markets. One uh, that was referred to, uh, all the transactions are by computers with computers. Uh, and the other one, it, it, and, and with algorithmic trading where we don't know uh, what really the utility function is, and there are 
playing these complicated games and and uh, perhaps tacitly colluding with each other, uh, all kinds of algorithmic biases. And then at the same time, we have uh, that that is going on more and more. The trades are also going on uh, in secret markets uh, inside Goldman Sachs, inside uh, the banks itself. So while uh, while modern technology has many people thought facilitated our moving towards a more informative market. Uh, it's not clear that that is the direction that we are actually moving, that it actually has facilitated uh, maybe a, a market where there is really uh, a, a, the ability to harbor uh, more information uh, privately. Uh, one of the things I just want a couple of comments, uh, as long as I have the microphone, uh, very briefly, I know. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, in terms of Silicon Valley, uh, they talked about how much money went out per second. Um, what they didn't reveal was that many of the people who sent in messages to take out their money did not get those messages honored. And uh, so that, in fact, the full size of the run on SVB uh, won't be realized, well, we will probably never be revealed because there were many part of the, you might say, order flow where the, the computers were not able to keep up and the legal framework for dealing with what happens to those orders that were, you know, ordered to be executed weren't uh, realized. Um, a second related th uh, uh, thing is in some of the order uh, flow that um, uh, one of the questions is uh, the computers learn from the order flow and uh, people know that the computers are learning from the order flow. So the question then became uh, how long when you when you put up an order, uh, how long do you allow it to be uh, a standing order. And um, at one point, uh, it was really for a nanosecond. So orders were not meant to be executed. They were fishing expeditions, or they were uh, uh, messages sent to confuse other computers. So um, uh, I was on a, a commission uh, after there, there was the uh, flash crash in 2010, I think it was, where uh, officially uh, several trillion dollars were wiped out of the value of the uh, equity markets in the United States in 20 seconds. Uh, and you ask, you know, was value destroyed at that rapid rate? It's even uh, more rapid than the uh, 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 taking out the, the 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 withdrawals on the um, uh, S. VB. Um, and in our commission of proposal uh, was made that if you made a uh, offer to buy or sell, you had to have it as a standing offer for at least uh, a millisecond. And um, the response of uh, the uh, guys in the uh, stock market is, uh, do you want to go back to the Middle Ages? <laughs> uh, so what was very clear is uh, what is going on here is not about necessarily the efficiency of the market or uh, the stability of the market. Uh, it is about various ways of rent extraction. And I think this really goes back to one of the themes that uh, Alan has emphasized. Uh, each guy thinks about this as given the way the system, what he can extract in an individual uh, behavior. But none of them are really thinking about how the the whole system uh, will behave. And, and that becomes uh, really critical. And then the final remark I want to make uh, relates to um, the uh, network financial, uh, as an Eisenberg and Noy uh, thing. A critical question about uh, when it makes a really big difference of the order is when 
uh, that you resolve things is when there are bankruptcy costs. There are fixed costs and the system is not a conservative system. When it's not a conservative system, that order really becomes critical. And of course, their system was one in which there were no bankruptcy costs. And the bankruptcy costs introduce a non-convexity. And that really makes the way these networks behave uh, very different from that in the uh, Eisenberg and Noe models. OK, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time. I know you have a question, but maybe you can come up and ask it. So thank you very much to all our speakers, um, some online. Oh. Have a 15 minute coffee break uh, outside, but we're going to keep quite tight. So if you could be back in here, please. Uh, it's now 20 minutes past 11. I'll be back here at uh, 11.35. That'd be terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah. uh, let's start uh, this, the session on uh, coordination. Um, this has been a very interesting morning so far, a lot of very wide ranging and deep discussions, but coordination is, of course, a topic around how the aggregate system behaves when there are strategic interactions between individuals. Um, and we ha I have a pleasure to welcome uh, three uh, speakers in this session. And I would like to start with Professor Jean-Pierre Nadal, who is now uh, joining us remotely from uh, Ecole des Eaux Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Um, so it would be great if all the speakers could spend about 20 minutes each so that we can leave some questions at the end. Thank you. I think, Jean-Pierre, you have to Thank unmute you. yourself. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so. I have to, okay, that should be this. Okay. <coughs> okay, I don't see my own file. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for um, allowing me to contribute to this very nice event, uh, even uh, not being with you for a stupid problem of uh, passport. <laughs> um, so I, I will talk about a topic uh, on which I worked uh, some years ago, but I, I choose it because it, I think it corresponds the, the best to the um, to this uh, workshop. So first, of course, a few words about um, Alan and me. So for myself, I met Alan in uh, 1996. So I'm a physicist and uh, at the physics department of the ENS, so G G Gerard Weisbusch, introduced me to, to Alan. They were working together on the Marseille uh, fish market. And uh, we work on uh, some interpretation of the logic choice function uh, in terms of uh, exploration, exploitation compromise, formalized uh, in the framework of the maximum entropy principle, which is a standard uh, tools and uh, concept in uh, statistical mechanics. And actually, this was my very first work in the field of social and uh, economic science. So the topic uh, we present is a work motivated by uh, um, uh, a model uh, introduced by uh, Schelling, uh, the so-called dying seminar, uh, to which uh, one can give the different formulation, which allows a much, much broader interpretation and I will discuss um, the, the properties of this model and uh, show that it has very interesting uh, uh, properties due to social and interaction and uh, heterogeneities. So as you know, Schelling uh, worked a lot about on uh, how individual behaviors aggregate into unexpected uh, social phenomena. And this is what we call the collective phenomena in, uh, in uh, physics. And in this particular work, uh, uh, the dying seminar, um, uh, he's uh, discussing uh, uh, how um, um, scientists may join or not a seminar depending on the number of participants. And it appeared that the, the model is formally equivalent to a, a very important model in uh, physics, which is called the random field uh, Ising model. So it doesn't uh, matter why and uh, 
what it is exactly, but it just formally just the same uh, model and of course introduced for very different reason in the context of physics. So the, um, the model, so the in, in a formulation which make it uh, close to the physics model is the following. So uh, we have an uh, agent we have to which have to make a binary de decision to buy or not to buy a single unit of uh, homogeneous good like uh, this book uh, at this uh, posted price, uh, two euros. Or it might be in a non-economic con context, for example, in the current uh, climate change uh, context. So we have to make a binary decision to adopt or not to adopt a new behavior at some estimated cost, which includes the cost of uh, riding a bicycle under the rain. But uh, of course, going, for example, to a restaurant, uh, this is best with friends and even better in a crowded restaurant. And to change behavior is easier if others do the same. So the, the model is a, a model with positive externalities. So each agent has uh, its uh, idiosyncratic willingness to pay or to adopt. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the actual willingness to, to pay is higher if others buy or adopt a new behavior, for example. So more precisely, the, the model assumes that the increase in uh, willingness to pay is proportional to the number of buyers. So because we are interested in the in system with a large number of um, uh, potential buyers, uh, what matters is a fraction of buyers, which I called here eta. So the, and the decision to, to buy is a yes if the idiosyncratic term plus j times eta is larger than the price, than the cost, and j is the um, strength of the social influence. And we consider heterogeneous agents, so there is a distribution of the uh, idiosyncratic willingness to pay uh, in the population with some mean h and some standard deviation uh, sigma. One can actually normalize the parameters, for example, by uh, the standard deviation, so that there is only three parameters, the posted price, the strength of the social interaction, and the mean willingness to pay, uh, all quantities normalized by the standard deviation. So the dying seminar of Schelling is uh, uh, considering the threshold in terms of number of participants, and so we, you can rewrite the condition for uh, buying or for uh, adopting uh, in terms of a condition of the number of participants. So one can study the Nash equilibria of this model. So uh, uh, and for for example here for uh, any smooth monomodal distribution of the uh, idiosyncratic willingness to pay, one gets this uh, <coughs> um, generic phase diagram. Uh, in which there is a domain, the yellow domain here, with multiple equilibria. So in the white part, there is a single equilibrium. And if, uh, so the, this is in the plane of the uh, strength of the social in influence uh, as um, axis. Uh, and as ordinate, the price minus the mean willingness to pay in the population. So this uh, reduced price. So in this plane, so if you are uh, uh, at the bottom, um, the mean willingness to pay the population. Uh, uh, sorry, if you are in the uh, at the at the top, the mean willingness to pay the population is is uh, uh, very um, um, uh, um, uh, low. Uh, so uh, in that case, there are very few number of buyers, and in the other, uh, in the bottom part, it is the reverse. And in the yellow part, you have uh, two equilibria, one with a large number of buyers and one with a small number of buyers. And the, the shape of this uh, um, uh, domain uh, is generic for any smooth uh, monomodal distribution and one has a generalization to any multimodal uh, distribution. Um, now uh, we can ask what happens for the seller if the seller wants to optimize his uh, profit. There is also a dilemma. Should he sell at a price which is large, targeting um, a small number of customers, or uh, at a price which is small, targeting a large number of customers? 
So again, we can analyze that uh, for this model. So the profit is the number of buyers times the price minus the cost per uh, unit of good. And we can study the nature of the solution uh, for this model in the same way as we did for the uh, problem of the customers. Uh, and again, we get uh, that they are uh, do a domain of multiple equilibria. So here, again, at the x-axis, we have the strength of the social influence. And as, as ordinate, we have here the mean willingness to pay in the population. And we have this domain here, the gray domain, where there is two uh, solution to the uh, optimization problem. Uh, one is a, 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 the op optimum solution with, which gives the maximum profit and the other one gives the log local maximum. Uh, and uh, in this domain, there is a transition line here, the dotted line, uh, where when one cross the line, the optimum solution goes from uh, selling to a small number of customers to selling to a large number of customers. On this transition, the optimal price will then drop from a very high value to very small value. And again, this is a, a generic uh, phase diagram for any um, uh, monomodal distribution. Um, and uh, one important thing to notice is that uh, this multiple uh, solution domain, uh, this solution of multiple equilibria, as for the customers, is in the domain where the mean willingness to pay of, of the customer is negative. That is, in average, the population does not want uh, uh, to buy. So this is uh, also the case, for example, for uh, uh, the change of behavior in the context of climate change. In average, the population is reluctant uh, to, uh, to make the transition, and this induces this uh, domain of multiple solutions. <coughs> so now this is not um, all the story. So the uh, entanglement between demand and supply uh, is something more uh, complicated. So uh, if we look at the demand uh, curve, so the demand versus price, if we are at uh, uh, value of H uh, uh, which is uh, positive or if the strength of the social insurance is smaller than some threshold, we have a standard demand curve which is uh, decreasing uh, as a function of the price. But if we are uh, both at a negative value of H and at a strength of the social insurance which is uh, larger than the threshold, then the demand is B valued. We have, we have the two uh, domains here with a coexistence domain uh, in between. And thus, if we look at the profit, so we have one curve for the profit if the demand corresponds to the high demand, and another one if the uh, demand corresponds to the low demand. So it may occur, depending on the parameters, that there is a local maximum for the low demand, but uh, it will be, in any case, very small compared to the optimal profit for the high demand. So the problem is that uh, the uh, seller, uh, if, he want, if he wants to optimize the profit, the, the best price is uh, in the domain of coexistence of the two solutions. So he's targeting coordination uh, between customers. So we post the price corresponding to this value. But uh, of course, there is a risk that the population do not co uh, coordinate. So this is uh, so this was a qualitative drawing. So if we look to a specific case with uh, here the logistic uh, distribution for the IWP. So just look at the blue curve. So this gives uh, the profit as a function of the price for the high demand, and we see that the, the price at which the maximum of the profit is reached is very close to the price at which the high demand disappears. So, uh, <coughs> so we can uh, study the full phase diagram for the seller. So again, in this plane, J, uh, H. And the, <coughs> so you have in gray again the domain of uh, where there is the two uh, solution for the sellers, but the domain where there is this risk, this systematic risk, uh, is given by, uh, is, is denoted by this uh, double red arrow. So this is all this uh, large domain. So uh, for uh, most situations, 
the seller is uh, facing this risk of uh, posting a price to get the, um, the highest profit, but having the population which do not coordinate. So, uh, finally, so if we write uh, schematically uh, what we have, so the profit as a function of, of the price. So, if we have this systematic systemic risk, which is that the, the best price for the seller is very close to this uh, uh, disappearance of the high uh, demand. So, if, if it uh, posts the price slightly too large, the, the demand will drop and the profit will go the very, um, at a very low value. But then to drive the population back to a nice profit, he will have to lower the price down to the point where the low demand disappears. So we have a strong iteresis effect. Uh, we can also discuss that in a non-context, in a non-market uh, context. So, so for example, if you consider the taxes, uh, put on tobacco or alcohol or the fine for breaking uh, speed limit. So you on the road, uh, if there is no automatic uh, radar, you you may increase your speed just because the others are doing the same. And many uh, young people start to smoke or to drink just because the others do. So we are in this context of positive externalities. So we may expect uh, this kind of situation. So if the tax is large enough, uh, we may have a, a very strong drop of the consumption. Uh, and then the nice thing is that uh, the, the government can lower the tax and, and then we remain in a domain where there is a low number of uh, uh, people consuming uh, alcohol or tobacco, but uh, uh, just with a tax which is uh, not uh, that large. So in conclusion, so uh, what we have is that whenever we have uh, uh, interaction and uh, heterogeneity, we, we get the genericity of uh, multiple equilibria, which in, and one st um, sharp phase transition. Uh, so uh, transition where the, the collective behavior change abruptly, and we get this uh, systemic risk. And in the particular case, this is an illustration of uh, Baker's uh, uh, discussion about why uh, owners of restaurants which are very popular do not increase price um, uh, to increase profits. Uh, so probably <coughs> they are aware that uh, the, this uh, risk uh, uh, exists. So um, thank you. Here are my uh, collaborators on the, these works. Uh, Virta Gordon, who is a physicist, Donifan, economist, uh, Victoria Semenchenko, which is uh, at the interface between physics and economics, and uh, Jean Minus, who is also a physicist. Thank you. Um, perhaps we can move on to the next speaker and then collect questions at the end. Um, I would like to pass the floor, floor to Professor Paul Pezanis Crystal from uh, University of Adelaide. Thank you. Hey, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, OK, so this is a paper on uh, bio coordination on a fish market. Uh, fish markets, as we all know, is a, a topic that is dear to Alan. And uh, what we've just heard, I mean, Jean Pierre also did uh, some work with um, uh, the Adelaide uh, fish market. And what comes out of the studies that um, uh, on which Alan uh, worked and um, his contributions with that and with his co-authors, what, what comes clear is that uh, the food pays matter. And uh, so, for example, the Marseille fish market is a market where there is bilateral trade. So buyers and sellers uh, move around in a market, they meet, there is a particular type of interaction and all the results that we get are coming from this particular type of interaction. Here, the market we are looking at is uh, simplified in the sense that we are only looking at how the interaction of buyers affect the formation of prices, uh, given that the lots to be sold are sold in sequence by means of a descending price or Dutch auction. Um, so, uh, ah, okay. So uh, the formation of prices in these markets um, has uh, triggered a lot of uh, 
theoretical work and uh, a lot of interest uh, following Ashton Felder's observation of a declining price anomaly. And this was observed in wine auctions where uh, the last two lots of wine, identical bottles of wine actually were sold. The last lot would fetch a lower price than the next to last one. And that was uh, at first seen as an obvious violation of uh, the law of one price. And this is what triggered a whole bunch of game theoretic explanations for why that could happen. Each of these explanations will look at a particular aspect of bias preferences, for example, risk aversion or their demands, whether they have multiple uh, unit demands or if they want only one item. Um, and also on some market features, for example, auctions. Uh, some of these auctions are organized such that if you win um, a lot, well, you are given the opportunity to buy several more lots at the same price. So. All these things are quite complicated to analyze uh, game theoretically, and uh, but we have earlier contributions also to that, and showing actually that there would be no declining prices, and this is the standard, uh, actually a benchmark model that was proposed by Milgram and Weber in '82, which assumes risk neutrality, and there the idea is that. If you are risk neutral and if you do the proper backward induction reasoning that is characteristic of these games, uh, you would end up paying on average the same price for every lot, uh, the same unconditional price, unconditional on the private signals. What is interesting also is that there is prior to that there was Sosnik who um, in 63, he first questioned the presence of these declining prices and uh, he found all kinds of reasons why um, prices should not um, should not decline uh, during uh, during an auction. Actually, all the reasons that he gave were later given as formally shown as possible explanations. So uh, it was quite an inspired work and not very much uh, cited. Now the predictions that are uh, we have for these models are quite restrictive in terms of the assumptions that they impose. And typically what we have is an assumption of homogeneity or symmetry. People are the same. They have the same preferences. They have uh, they are very similar in multiple aspects. And the only thing that is different is are the signals that they have, that is their reservation values. And um, because of this, well, it makes um, things quite difficult to test with empirical data. And because in reality, well, we rarely see these assumptions. And here comes uh, Alan with uh, his quarters, Eric Gwerchi and uh, Gwerchi and uh, Sonia Mule. Um, sorry, Sonia Mule. Yeah, Sonia Mule. And uh, where they studied the formation of prices in uh, such markets via agent-based models and. Um, so their buyers uh, are allowed to learn how to improve their profits. They make conjectures about future bids. And uh, what they show there is that um, the declining price may obtain under a variety of conditions. So it's not at all uh, uh, mysterious. It may happen under several different conditions. Now, this study, the study that I will present here is um, anterior, it predates uh, the one of Alan and um, and co-authors. And uh, but so it was done at the time where I still believed that I could try to explain reality with a theoretical model or a game theory model assuming symmetry. But I knew that there would be problems with that. So the idea here is just to see whether these models can still give some intuition about the, the result. And if we could uh, use risk aversion to observe these, um, these price yeah. patterns. And um, I will do that in, uh, in a market which is attended by two different types of uh, buyers. So uh, what, we are, what this study is all about is um, it's a fish market that is attended by two types of buyers, fishmongers actually, and I will uh, described anymore uh, in the next slides and where the supply conditions vary over time. So it is a non-stationary environment. Things change every day, the number of participants, 
uh, the amount of supply provided in the market. And um, yeah, and it is quite difficult to formalize these um, uh, these particularities of this market. And well, there are two simple questions. Well, are the prices declining here? And if so, can they be explained by, uh, in terms of the buyers interactions, the two different types of buyers and the prevailing supply conditions? So, the market I'm looking at is the market of set. So, I hope you can see that on the, the map. Well, you have Marseille where um, there is a fish market of Marseille and uh, a bit on the left there, you have a little city called Set, where um, uh, there is this sequential auction market that is organized. It is organized every weekday. It is an afternoon market. It takes place from three to six. Uh, the trawlers operate daily and from 4 a.m. to uh, 3 p.m. just before the market opens. Uh, it's pretty big. Uh, there are 77 trawlers, 101 buyers. They're all registered buyers and trawlers. And there are about 139 fish species that are traded on, the, on it. Uh, the supply is sorted by uh, fish species and uh, the lots are fixed of about 12, 12 kilos each. Okay, it's a descending price auction. Um, there are no reserve prices. And the market has two characteristics is that the first is that uh, the trawlers disembark in sequence uh, and this is because of limited docking facilities. So essentially uh, as soon as the trawler arrives in the harbor, he lands all the supplies, this goes to the market. So buyers are sitting in the market and they have no idea what will be the total supply of the day. And this is a feature so they're operating under supply uncertainty. Um, and there are two types of uh, fishmongers. There are wholesalers who buy, who tend to buy large quantities and who supply supermarkets or uh, fish processing, different fish processing uh, firms. And there are retailers who are small shop owners or even restaurant owners who come and buy their fish for uh, the day. Um, Um, oh yeah, and the area there that you see is in red is called the Gulf de Lyon, which is where they operate actually every day. So uh, in the morning uh, they go as far as they can and throughout the day they come closer to the coast until they reach the, uh, well, to get to the harbor and start selling this, then they, uh, their supplies. So there is here there is a whole discussion on whether they race for that or whether there is a trade-off between staying a bit longer to get uh, proper amounts of fish or do they just go at the very beginning of the session or do, or do they race to get to the very beginning of the session. The data I'm looking at is our sardines and um, uh, sardines are very popular in uh, this part of France. Uh, there are three months of activity, 60 market days. Um, there were 99 tons of, uh, of it that were supplied, and you see 39 trawlers, 18 wholesalers, and many more retailers. So it's essentially, it is essentially a retailer's market. The type of observations that we have are the, yeah, the date, the lot number, the weight, the price per kilo, and the particularity of this uh, data set is that we really have um, the supply and the buyer IDs. And from this, well, I could uh, figure whether uh, what type of fishmonger the buyer was. And that was uh, an important aspect of this, um, uh, of this study, well, to identify these asymmetries. Here is uh, some, um, view of the supply, uh, the total supplies on the market on the left and the price per kilo reached on the right. So it is not re a really nice step function, but well, we get the flavor of it. In March, these are this is a period of short supplies. The month of April, I would call it a regular month, uh, regular supply month of regular supplies and the month of May was yeah, large supplies. 
what you see uh, in terms of daily averages, well, the number of suppliers, the number of retailers, and the number of wholesalers is pretty constant. And in terms of average prices, well, we have the expected uh, result that it is pretty high in March and not very much different between retailers and wholesalers. It is pretty low in May when the supplies are large and also no much difference between uh, the two, two different types. And it's when, more, when the supplies are regular that we see the, the largest differences. These are in French francs, by the way. So, um, and it was done in, uh, the data is from 93, just to give you an idea. In terms of daily averages, um, we see that uh, Friday is a day of low activity and uh, the good days to buy fish there are Wednesdays and those Fridays, and otherwise it's pretty constant uh, throughout the week. Um, some more descriptive statistics. So here there is uh, one item that, uh, one thing that is particularly important here is whether retailers appear earlier or later than wholesalers on the market. So there are several ways you can check that, but uh, and there's a, one of the simplest ways to do so is just to see, uh, to compare the lot numbers of the lots that are bought by retailers and those that are bought by wholesalers. This in some circumstances, it, well, it can mean that um, if ever you find retailers buying earlier, it can simply mean that there were many lots that were bought uh, that day. And this is, uh, what happened in March? So you have the the data, the details down there. Uh, you see, in March is um, there are mostly uh, retailers come earlier, and these are days with large supplies. Uh, there's no big difference between them in seven days, and in April it is a little less so, and in May it's about equal chance that retailers come earlier or later than. Uh, Wholesalers. Um, excuse me. Um, when we try to explain, well, looking a bit further in terms of the type of lots that are bought by each type of uh, buyer, well, retailers prefer smaller lots, this means around 10, 12 kilos, and wholesalers prefer larger lots, about 12, 14 kilos, about. And also, retailers their discounts successive purchases. So uh, the, the bid that they place for the first item that they buy uh, is significantly higher than the second or the third. And wholesalers is more constant and low. Um, so the idea here the, is first to look at price trends when we control or not for buys at heterogeneity. And, uh, the, the classical hypothesis in theory is to assume that they are homogeneous. And what we see is, so uh, the plain lines are heterogeneous and the dashed lines are when they are heterogeneous, uh, homogeneous, sorry. So the red line, you see that this is the month of March. Uh, so when um, supplies are short and you see that the declining price occurs there. Um, we take quadratic, uh, 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 yeah, well, these are uh, quadratic representation and well, the, the different variables that I considered also is one, one of them is the between, and this is simply the time lapse between uh, since the last sardine lot was on the block, and this is an attempt to measure the surprise effect. Okay, so um, when the supplies are provided on the market, you have the lots are not sorted by fish types, so you may have a lot of sardine and a certain number of lots of another type of fish, and then again a lot of sardines. So this, when there is um, a lot of um, many lots in between, well, this can build up uh, attention for buyers, and well, as soon as they see the next lot, well, they start bidding again. So this is the surprise effect that we have. Um, in green, we have um, when there are large supplies, and here you see, well, it is uh, first increasing and then increasing, but overall it's pretty close to constant compared to March. 
And um, when they are regular, we have this hum shape, which is pretty much uh, unexplained or well, there are some explanations, but it's um, they hinge upon again, very strong assumption, theoretical assumptions on the type of distributions with yield, et cetera. So now we look at the effect of controlling for bias heterogeneity and the purchasing time preference of retailers. That is whenever retailers come early or later, and uh, we would like to see how this affects uh, the different price trends. So taking for reference the case where we do not control for that, this is when uh, the red line, um, whenever uh, retailers come earlier, so these are when we have long series of prices, you see that uh, the prices are declining and we have also a negative time lapse between uh, on the effect of price on the price on prices at the outset of uh, and the end of the sequence. So this well, since we control for the presence of retailers at the beginning, there shouldn't be any price decline or it should be corrected if it causes any that. And if it is not so, uh, I interpret this as being a residual effect of supply uncertainty, or is it an anomaly? Uh, I like to think it is uh, due to uh, an uncertain supply that affects both retailers and uh, wholesalers. Uh, whenever there are no differences, so these are days with short supplies, uh, the price trends are declining more severely, there's a positive time lapse effect uh, on prices, so the surprise effect is there. And uh, wholesalers typically pay less than uh, retailers at the outset of uh, the sequence. So uh, mostly what happened then is uh, prices are declining, thus we can interpret this as a form of, as a result of supply uncertainty or risk aversion, that the higher prices at the beginning are coming from the fact that yeah, they pay this premium because they are unsure about future supplies. And this is what would explain the, the declining phenomenon. The second case is when we have regular supplies. So here, when they come early, we have this uh, these declining price trend. So again, compared to the case where we do not control for uh, the retailers purchasing time. And we see again that um, the prices are declining and well, we, I would attribute that to supply uncertainty again that affects both types of um, bidders. And uh, on the other hand, whenever we have uh, no difference between uh, the two different types of buyers, these are um, the price trends are ham shaped and this is largely unexplained unless we really get into uh, technical assumptions on what is assumed about um, people's willingness to pay, namely if there is affiliation or positive correlation between uh, the different um, uh, reservation values. And we also need to assume a particular type of risk aversion. So under these assumptions, if you are ready to accept that, well, we can have these that could explain the, the ham shape. And finally, uh, when there are large supplies, well, you see that uh, there are hardly any price trends anymore. Prices are almost constant and there are, there's no big difference between uh, uh, days when retailers come earlier or later. Uh, and uh, this is largely due, I think, to the weakened competition. So since there's an excess of supply somehow, competition is uh, low and Therefore, well, we can assume that the risk neutrality assumption holds and therefore the Milgram and Weber result would hold. Um, well, to sum up, so we've looked at uh, a fish market which experiences different supply conditions and there are different types of bidders or buyers attending it who operate in the supply uncertainty. Uh, the price trends that we observe are largely subject to the prevailing supply conditions, uh, which affect the buyer's preferences and beliefs in the aggregate. And um, some aspects of it can be explained by uh, risk aversion and supply uncertainty. Now, the heuristic based models um, either 
those uh, like developed by Nick and Alan and uh, in uh, looking for loyalty and um, uh, those of uh, Gershi and uh, or the work with Gershi and Moulet, uh, which are simulation based, who are the models that are decision theoretic, as uh, what I've, uh, I'm working on with uh, Hangu. Uh, these models that are embracing agents heterogeneity look far more promising to uh, to explain these uh, these patterns. And um, yeah, and well, I take this opportunity to thank Alan for uh, all these long years of discussions that we've had on fish and other things and then <laughs> fish and stuff. And I'm yeah, I owe him a lot both personally and professionally. Yeah. And that's it. Thank you. Paul, uh, let me pass the floor next to Professor Nick Friend, uh, who I believe has co authored that fish market uh, paper with uh, Professor Kerman. Um, I, um, and I think that the title of the talk is um, Learning to Coordinate. Thank you. First, thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about learning to coordinate and this is uh, some research findings that were part of some other paper that has been published in the meantime it uh, was formed by the wayside for various reasons a co-author who didn't like it and then the whole editorial refereeing process it, it disappears so it was on the shelf and then when the invitation for this workshop came i thought about what to do and I thought well let's imagine an almost worst case scenario in which there's just one person besides myself uh, who thinks this is kind of interesting findings and then I thought that should be Alan so let's let's test whether this is uh, actually true um, in any case it's also a way to say thanks to to Alan for always having been uh, very supportive and encouraging to pursue these kind of ideas so now let's hope that Alan likes this uh, otherwise uh, We'll find out. Um, so some motivating quote, it, it's, it's a bit dated quote by now from Osman and Rubenstein from the early 90s, who observed that when people talk in, in, in reality about games, they tend to focus on the fact that there's difference in abilities and cognitive abilities in, uh, b between individuals. And that at that time, they said that's typically something that's missing from the game theoretic analysis of, of uh, games. So that's what uh, in, in this published paper that I just mentioned with the court of Vesela uh, Daskalova, we tried uh, to take up. And of course, many more people have been taking up this idea. In the meantime, what we did in, the, in this paper with Vesela was um, we modeled agents who would be categorizing the strategy spaces and there's different ways to categorize the strategy space. And so that would be a way to model the idea that people may have different cognitive abilities that they, they may have they use a different categorization and by doing that they have a different view of the world and they they use different frames in, in, in some sense to look at reality. Now just to show off a bit like references about categorization because it's a very old idea in all kinds of sciences, philosophy, sociology, cognitive sciences, computer sciences, also in economics and in, in the past two decades especially where initially most of the attention was um, focused on individual decision making but more recently there have been a number of people also looking at categorization in games and if you think about categorization in games there's different things you can categorize you can just categorize games themselves or you can categorize opponents and a third possibility is to categorize the strategy spaces which some people have, people have been doing and that's the thing uh, with, with Daskalova that uh, that we did as well. So what we did there is we, we considered some games in that paper um, where, as I said, there may be alternative possible categorizations of the strategy space. We assume that ex ante all uh, possible frames will be available to all players, and then we consider the dynamic models in which the agents have to learn which of these frames to use. Now, of course, depending on the game, which frame is best for an agent may depend on the frames used by other people. And in the, that paper, we linked it to some uh, experimental data. Now, let me very briefly sketch the 
uh, model. It can be very brief because it's, it's a very simple model. So just think about n uh, players who play repeatedly the same to play a game. And they will be randomly re rematched every period. <clears throat> There's only three decisions to be made by the individuals. First, given the availability of all possible frames, all possible categorizations, they need to choose which one actually to adopt in that period. And we use reinforcement for this, and I get to the details of that, and the logit function. And again, I'll, I'll show the details uh, on the next slide. Um, now, once they have adopted the frame of looking at reality, a, a categorization, there may be different categories, or there will typically be different categories. So they need to choose a category. And again, we apply the reinforcement learning plus the logic to, to, to model that. Once they've settled on, on one category, <clears throat> if there's more than one strategy within that category, we assume that they will choose uniform randomly. This is a typical assumption in this literature on uh, categorization, in, invoking typically the principle of insufficient reason. So the reinforcement is, is pretty standard. So we start with some initial strength for all possible items in, in, in your choice set. And you may in some period I or, or period T, sorry, uh, have some realized payoff by T. And so what you then simply do is that for the item that you had chosen and that led to this payoff, you are updating the strengths of these items, or fitness as some people would call it, by just taking a convex combination of the previous strength of that item and the payoff that you just realized, which means that these, um, these strengths, they tend to converge to the average payoff that you realized um, by choosing that item. And, and the payoffs for the items that you have not chosen, they just stay um, unchanged. Now, given the strengths in any period, we just use the basic logic function to choose so you're choosing such that items that led to higher payoffs in the past, uh, you, you're choosing those with, with a greater probability, applying the logit function, which has this one parameter beta, um, it's, which is basically the pickiness. So if it's beta is zero, it's, as we all know, uh, I, I guess, uh, you choose uniform randomly and the higher the value of beta, um, the, the more picky you are in the sense that the more differences in strength will Re, uh, lead to uh, differences in the probabilities to actually choose this item. And I should highlight that I, I, I just forgot it. Like in, in the reinforcement learning, the, 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 the crucial parameter here is alpha, which is basically the speed of learning. It is how much weight do you assign to the most recent period that you use that item and, and uh, realize the payoff. That's basically all there is uh, to the model. Then what about the game? So the game I want to focus on here is a game uh, published by Blue McGnesi in games in 2010. It's a very interesting game, I think. It's to play a game. They use this disc that I uh, showed here. In the experiment, the actor used a physical object. So it's like a three dimensional object um, that could be passed around between the players and the experimenter. It has an identical back and front and um, when it would be passed from one player to the other by the experimenter, the experimenter might just arbitrarily, randomly flip or rotate uh, this disk. And, and we'll see why this matters uh, in, in a few moments. Um, it, it's a coordination game, so the two players need to choose independently one of these sectors. If they happen to choose exactly the same sector, they get some fixed payoff, say one, and otherwise they get a payoff of zero. Now, game theoretically, it's straightforward just to come up with uh, the norm form of this game. There's five possible strategies for each player, and the payoffs are if one if they are nicely coordinated. Uh, of course, there's two problems with this. I mean, it seems simple enough, but it's two problems with this. One is five Nash equilibria indicated by the gray uh, cells, uh, and, and they are totally equivalent. And the other thing is I didn't put any labels um, for the strategies. And, and in fact, that's one of the issues here, the, the ability or difficulty to actually distinguish some of these strategies. In fact, if you think, if you take a closer look at this game, 
and, and the object where they need to uh, for which they need to choose the cellities. If you think about this dish, you can imagine some line of symmetry, which I've indicated here with this dashed line. And once you once you have done that, you, you may realize that the, the two black sectors are totally symmetric. So you cannot really distinguish them, especially because between the two players choosing the strategy, the experimenter takes it away and kind of randomly flips or rotates without showing what they do exactly to the other player and then passes it on to the other player. And the same applies to the two white sectors that are symmetric along this uh, this red test line. You cannot distinguish them. Uh, you, you wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to, to distinguish these two. Which leaves one unique white sector, just the one in between the two, that's the only sector that you can precisely identify. That's really distinct from any of the other sectors. Now, if you apply this idea of categorization to this game, because this, this game seems kind of like a natural candidate to apply this idea of categorization, if we use like if we show different frames, if you go to frame zero, F0 uh, indicated here in the middle. So if you take a player who looks at this disc and is basically totally blind, I mean beyond color blind, doesn't even distinguish black and white, just choosing a point on this disc. We call this just choose at any point. If you are not totally colorblind and you at least distinguish black and white sectors, we call this frame number one. And then, so the two categories are go for a black sector or go for a white sector. If you understand this uh, stuff with, with, with the line of symmetry, which I showed on the previous slide, you can have a higher cognitive level if you want a frame that's more, that's, that's finer, and that is, you're not only distinguishing black and white sectors, but you realize that one of the white sectors is different because that's a distinct white sector and the other two, they are symmetric and they're equivalent. So that would be frame number two. And then mistakenly, you can believe that you can be even smarter by distinguishing, trying to distinguish privately for yourself these two black sectors and the two other white sectors. I put it between quotation marks because these, these are, really like temporary uh, evanescent labels that you can apply because you cannot share it with the other player and even with yourself. Uh, if the experimenter rotates and flips the disc, you can't lose track as to what is B1 and B2 anyway. But some people might think that they can actually uh, distinguish them. So, so those would be the different kind of categorizations that you can apply. What about expected payoffs if you use these different categorizations? So let me show some examples of two players who each choose a, a certain frame to look at this game. So if both players choose F0, which is on the left hand side of this uh, slide, they're just basically just choosing like any sector uh, of this disk which means there's only one in five chance that they happen to choose the same sector. So the expected pair is only uh, 0.2. If they both do apply uh, frame one, so they do distinguish black from white sectors. If they go for any black sector, both, they would get an expected pair of 0.5 because there's only two black sectors. So it's, it's one in two the chance that they will choose the same black sector. If they go for a white sector, since there's three white sectors, and they just choose any of them randomly, there's only one in three chance that they will actually be coordinated. Um, and what I indicated here in, in red is the pair of dominant nest equilibrium. So the most attractive nest equilibrium, if, if you think about choosing um, categories here, would be for both players to choose a black sector. In frame number two, where if each of them adopts frame number two, they each distinguish the distinct white sector. Um, the pair of dominant nest equilibrium would be to go for that unique white sector, and they expected the pair of would be one because there's only one white sector. So if you both go for that, it will be bingo for both players. Frame number three doesn't really add, add much, I said, because it's just like mistakenly a player might believe that they can distinguish. Uh, black one and black two or white one and white two. 
whereas they are really symmetric, as I said. So the this payoff matrix becomes a bit more messy, but it doesn't really add um, much. Now, of course, it's not said that both players will choose the same categorization because the whole idea has different cognitive abilities. People may adopt different categorizations. So what about asymmetric uh, adoption of, of, uh, of frames? I'll, uh, I won't show you, so, so no worries, I won't show you all possible uh, asymmetries here, but this, here's just one to illustrate a bit the kind of things that's going on here. So assume that one player adopts frame number one and the other player adopts frame number two. So the first one only distinguishes black and white, whereas the second one does realize uh, that is also a unique white sector. As you can see, um, if you adopt frame number two, it, it does matter what the other player adopts, because if the other player adopts frame number one, the payoff dominant nest equilibrium is actually to, to go for a black sector. Even though you are fully aware of the fact that there's a distinct white sector, and it would be best if both players were going to choose a unique uh, white sector, the distinct white sector. But if you think that the other player adopts frame number one, the best you can do um, is for is going for the black sector. So that's the, the pair of dominant nest equilibrium. And that's different, of course, so if both plays adopt frame number two, because then you want to go for the unique white sector. So it really matters what you think. So, so given your own um, categorization that, that you adopt for yourself to look at this game, it really matters what you think that the opponent, um, what, what frame the opponent will use. Now, Bloom and Gnisi, they emphasize uh, a lot in this paper that what matters is in particular two things. One is your own cognitive ability, your ability to, to choose frame number one, zero, uh, so frame, frame zero, frame one, frame two. But also, what, what I just sketched, you believe about the cognitive ability of the opponent. And of course, we, we can add to this also higher order beliefs because um, what also matters is your belief about the opponent's belief about your cognitive ability, etc. Et so all kinds of higher order beliefs are here relevant as well. And what Bloom and Ganesi did in their experiment is they had a very clever novel design where they introduced a treatment variable, partner versus self. So in one treatment, they just like another player and another subject in, in, in the experiment. But they had a treatment where you actually played against yourself. So you you got this disc, you choose one of the sectors, the experiment would take it away, rotate and flip it, and then give it again to you. And you know that you play against yourself and you need to choose again a sector. And again, the payoffs are exactly the same, exactly the same game. So are you able to coordinate with yourself? As, 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 as you mentioned, uh, or not. And so this is a very clever design and, and it was novel because it allows you to distinguish the two things mentioned at the top, your own cognitive ability, because that's the same if if you're in the partner treatment or in the self-treatment, your cognitive ability presumably doesn't change. But what is different is your belief about the other player and all kinds of higher order beliefs. So they are able to distinguish those two factors, cognitive ability from beliefs and possibly higher order beliefs about uh, the opponent. So what happens with uh, <clears throat> these results? So what they show is that if you move to the self uh, treatment, people do choose more often the distinct white and less often go for a black sector. And what this means in average payoffs is in fact that in the self-treatment, coordination success is much higher. It goes to 80%, where it was just above 20% in the partner treatment, and, and which is hardly above random. Um, and, and the main factor in this is actually um, the distinct white, uh, where ma many more uh, players go for. But as you can see, it, it doesn't go to 100%. So cognitive abilities may play some role as well. Now the stylus factor is uh, from this experiment, people are not choosing exclusively the distinct white, uh, but the, dis the frequency of distinct white is greater in the self than in the partner treatment, and overall the success is much greater in the self than in the partner treatment. Now what about, <clears throat> and, and so Blue Magnesi, 
they conclude that th this issue of beliefs about cognitive abilities is really important um, and, and keeps uh, distinct wide down in the partner treatment. What about the computational model? So we did the grid search of these three parameters. We, we kept it really simple, um, same parameter values for all players, all periods and all decisions. Look at 10,000 periods and then try to maximize payoffs over that uh, period. And then we, we implement a partner and, and, and a self-treatment in the model as well. Um, where it's in, the, in the partner treatment, there would be the standards random rematching every period. And in the self-treatment, you, you would be choosing a frame and the category, but you would choose that obviously once, just like what you would assume, unless you're, as, as Joe said, unless you're schizophrenic, uh, that, that's what you would do. So that was implemented in the computational model too. The, results are here what you see i focus here on the average payoffs in the part and self-treatment in, in the first 100 periods and you you see the clear difference in um in 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 the payoffs and in particular the the payoff realized by the distinct white it's much higher by this simple self uh, simple reinforcement learning model in in the self-treatment let me Skip, skip this. Um, the style effects are in fact the same as what we saw for the experiments. So people not using exclusively distinct white, it's it's great in the self-treatment and, and, and the payoff success will be much higher in, in the self-treatment. Now, very briefly the discussion then, because as I said, Blue Magnesi did this, they focused on cognitive ability and the role of high order beliefs. Um, the models recovers the style effect, but the reinforcement learning model is really a low cognitive ability kind of modeling, and there's no explicit belief in the reinforcement learning model. So let me very briefly get to the beliefs and, um, and the cognitive ability. So the first observation is, I mean, you, you, you do have beliefs implicitly in the reinforcement learning model because these strengths, they're basically a reflection of, of the expected payoffs. And expected payoffs are, of course, just the nominal payoffs in the game multiplied by the probability that this outcome will actually occur, which depends in part on the probability that your opponent will choose the corresponding uh, actions. So whereas in the experiment, you see that in the partner treatment, there is uncertainty about the opponent and the corresponding beliefs, and this is eliminated in the self-treatment. Correspondingly, in the model, this stochasticity about the opponent's choice of the frame in the category, but this will be eliminated in the part in, in self-treatment. Uh, and, and that's picked up by the reinforcement learning. So in some sense, what you see with the model, the reinforcement learning playing repeatedly and looking backwards, the reinforcement learning model learns to behave as if it's forward looking. And that's maybe not that surprising nowadays with what we know about DeepMind's Alpha Zero, for example, playing chess by doing exactly the same, looking backwards to start learning to behave as if you're forward looking. The only other thing to, 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 to wrap this up is then, but what about cognitive abilities? Because I explained that when we set up this model of categorization, we made all frames and categories available to all players at the start. So somebody might argue, as I put between quotation marks here, that in some sense, all players in our model are high cognition players, and, and, and our model is not really about difference in cognitive abilities. And I think that's fair, but in some sense, we can turn this around and say, well, if you think about the issue of recognizing the distinct white, that's maybe nothing to do or not much to do with cognitive ability, because understanding that there's a distinct white sector, that's not really rocket science. I mean, everybody will understand this. The crucial question is whether somebody pays attention to this. And if you just imagine, just a quick thought experiment, this game in a lab experiment, just playing 10 rounds uh, after each other, you can imagine that people will over time choose a distinct white more often. It's not, I think, because of improving cognitive abilities, because cognitive abilities, they're either hard white or evolve very slowly. But what you see is an increasing awareness or alertness or attentiveness of the players to this issue that is a distinct white sector. And I think that's exactly covered by uh, this reinforcement learning model. And that seems a good point to say thank you.
to uh, Nick for a very interesting presentation. I think we have some time for questions uh, for all speakers. Yes, please. I have a question for Nick. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'm I'm a bit um, by the way you model cognitive ability because uh, that's what you started from and then the, you modeled it through these frames. Uh, I would think that when uh, the interviews you refer to people playing games refer to this difference in cognitive ability, it's more about the speed with which the players process the information. So uh, in, you know, in typical everyday game settings, that's what you refer to as cognitive ability. So in a static setting, of course, you cannot make sense of the speed issue, but you would have to have some non uh, an, um, an asynchronous game setting where you could have players quickly and whether and this ha would have to translate into some advantage. I think there's no timing uh, in the frameworks you look at, so um, that's what I would. But but if you look at this from a computational point, point of view, so at the end you refer to deep enforcement learning games there of course it's it's uh, easy to model this because you you can tune some parameters in the reinforcement lear learning al algorithms which make one category of players uh, have a, a processing speed which is higher than the other so it's something that we can model and people have been looking at this in the context of multi-agent reinforcement learning games uh, so that was just a comment on how, how you translate this concept of cognitive ability. Can we um, take a few questions perhaps? Yes, please. Thanks. Also for Nick, I have something similar in mind. I was thinking about this beta in the logit, and I'm thinking that this might be also related to different types of abilities or different types of influences with respect to what you see. Because there is a beta and there's not this scale parameter that we would see in a logistic distribution, I think this, I mean, it's already in there. So it kind of plays a role of uh, different other factors that influence you compared to actually this S that you see, right? So I think there is something there about cognitive abilities as well. And also how you chose this number for beta 20 or how what it was because i think if it was around two maybe the behavior would be more funky i'd like to yeah no, no i i i i totally appreciate the, these kind of comments um but, but keep in mind so, so, so the objective is is not to was not here to come up say with the best learning model the best model to deal to deal with cognitive ab ability if, if you think about the literature on learning, uh, uh, boundlessly rational uh, agents learning their way uh, how to behave, th th there was some kind of great race starting possibly like in the early 90s and, and went on beyond the 90s. Um, so this th this study here, these results that I present here, does not pretend to take part of that. So it does not pretend to take part of like come up with like best model or the most reasonable model about cognitive to 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 deal with model to deal with cognitive ability. And and the same applies to the beta. Yes, you can, you can refine it. You 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 can use. Uh, the, you consider different parameters. You can also consider heterogeneity, for example. So there's many things you can you can analyze there. But the objective is rather to, to come up with an almost as simple as possible model to to have this phenomenon from these experiments where these people emphasized in their publication a lot the issue of cognitive ability and the order of, uh, the issue of beliefs and higher order beliefs and. So, so we wanted to show in the simplest possible model where you, you would think it's it, it, it's not very intuitive that uh, beliefs can play a role or, or that cognitive ability is, is is kind of interesting in that kind of model because typically people saw reinforcement learning like like about the lowest of the lowest possible uh, in terms of cognitive ability. But, but the challenge was what, what we wanted to show is that even in that kind of simple model, maybe surprisingly uh, and, and maybe not uh, for some people, 
we can recover the same style as facts. Now, of course, if you have, say, a different research objective, you want to come up with a full-fledged model about cognitive ability or cognitive ability in economics, you may want to come up with a much more sophisticated model. But it's it, it's kind of, we, we thought there was need to come up with this very simple model, with, with this, this very simple choice of these parameter values, fixing a lot uh, and, and, and not allowing for more uh, sophistication. And then still be able to recover those stylized facts. Um, if I may abuse my position as the chair, I mean, I, I think I want to connect this discussion to the bigger theme of this conference, which is rebuilding macro. And I mean, one question I have to you or speakers and also Professor Kerman is, I mean, how do we make progress from here? So do, you know, the macro literature evolved over time, incorporating these things like individual strategic interactions, um, and of course, we want to move away from the representative agent models, but by building a richer model of individual interactions and perhaps beliefs of inter uh, individuals that affect behavior, do we learn what do we learn more about aggregate behavior beyond what the literature has already produced? Of course, there's been a lot of application on things like thinking about financial crisis, but where do how do we make progress from here? It's, it's a bit of a big question, but if uh, I don't know if Professor Kierman would like to say a few words on this or if any of the speakers would like to say a few words. I mean, we have experts here and I would love to hear about your views. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, I'm digesting what you just said and uh, I'm thinking about. Are you really asking, does it matter to uh, look at the heterogeneity and does that in fact impact on what happens at the aggregate level? Is that, is that what interests you? Are you saying, in fact, yes. does it make a difference if we look Yes, at do, does it take us to radical uncertainty or does it yield results that would be, I mean, I'm thinking about from Bank of England perspective, does it yield results that would help us, help guide policy? Does it help guide decision makers who have to make decisions that that is meant to affect aggregate behaviour? Um, I think heterogeneity in particular is something which um, bothers people not only in economics, in medicine too. And I, uh, I from a, um, a medical expert who said, you know, heterogeneity is a thing that we're always pushing under the rug. It doesn't, and he claimed that, uh, in fact, when we worry about the differences between how people behave, then in fact that makes life very difficult for medical specialists. So, you know, I want to treat some sort of problem, okay, with a with a drug. What I look at always is, uh, almost always, is what is the average reaction to that drug and so forth. So you come in and you say, I've got this nasty disease, which I, I diagnosed for you, but who I am and all the conditions around me will make it very different on how I should really treat you, right? But we push that on the right, we look at this, this particular disease gets this particular treatment and we don't worry about the fact that people are in fact very different, their age and so forth. So if that's the question you're asking, does heterogeneity matter? I think it matters a lot because people react in very different ways. And uh, even in this cognitive ability sort of story, you know, it, some people, I think it was Nobi Hanaki who looked at said, are people behaving as they're behaving because they haven't understood what was going on or are they behaving um, like that because they think that the other people haven't understood and so forth. So I think these differences are very important, but I'm not really sure that I'm answering your question because is, is your question, does heterogeneity matter? And that's what people have been talking about here. And uh, does that have a a chair, does that make a difference to the way we should uh, treat? Um, think, just think of the, our current situation, uh, for example, with respect to the UK. When you say, right, well, we've got to do something, we're going to increase interest rates and so forth. But people say, yeah, but actually people are getting affected very differently by these things. And we should really be worried about the guys who are getting hurt by this, not look at just the average. And isn't, isn't that the, uh, the real problem that 
that heterogeneity matters a lot. And if you're down at the bottom end, then you're going to be affected very strongly by these things. If you're at the top end, you, you don't care very much. Right? But again, I'm not sure that that was I'm really addressing exactly what your question was. So did I make a mistake? Did I not? No, I think that's that's very insightful. I guess the question is also whether once we start taking heterogeneity and individual interactions very like between individuals very seriously, do we end up in a world of uncertainty? Was the I, I think Professor Stiglitz wanted to, to perhaps add a few. Okay. Yeah, let me try to answer uh, at least part of uh, uh, what uh, I think. Uh, is issue. I mean, I think one of the things that comes out of these micro studies for macroeconomics is very hard to defend the uh, assumption of ration, full rationality. The fact that they didn't converge even when they're playing the game against themselves to mm -hmm. the thing that you ought to have converged to is very striking. You know, that you should be able to coordinate with yourself. So I thought that was uh, really a, a very, very striking uh, result. And the second one is obviously in, in, in a case where you don't know the heterogeneity, you don't know who you're playing with. Uh, the That really goes back in many ways in my mind, the King's beauty contest, where you're trying to think about what other people are thinking about in all these higher order. And that means we can get trapped in very bad equilibrium. You know, you, you you wind up in a world in which people have, uh, this is really a higher order uh, belief, beliefs about how the economic system work. And that affects your behavior because uh, the central bank does something. Your beliefs about what that implies uh, clearly affect your behavior. And... Uh, you know, at that level, our, uh, that has uh, some, I think, very important implications. One of them is it can give rise to societal rigidities because we can't coordinate easily the change in everybody's belief. So if you had everybody, you know, in your example, if everybody could, could have announced, you know, by the way, if you all coordinate on that unique white one, we can get a better equilibrium. Uh, and that's what the Fed and uh, Central Bank is supposed to be doing, raising its hand, by the way, if you, you know, that's one interpretation. But when you see the stupidity of some of the central bankers, you would say, well, why should I coordinate with what they say is the coordination? Because they say, well, we have this enormous credibility. And then we say, you keep doing something that's stupid because you say it's important for credibility and that undermines your credibility. So there's this kind of uh, dialogue about what is required for credibility. So I think, uh, and then there are all these heterogeneity, not only in the uh, distributive effects, but also in the interpretation of uh, how a particular action is going to be undertaken, which introduces this kind of deep uncertainty about what you do. I mean, just, and just to mention uh, one example again uh, today, where we're, there is this moment of deep uncertainty, the um, it looks like the central bank, uh, the Fed, has coordinated a a, a all, all a, a large number of. Uh, the big banks to put money into one of the regional banks to stop the flight. Now, we know uh, what they intended. They intended this to be a sign that all these big banks are confident and therefore there shouldn't be a run. But given the heterogeneity of our beliefs, many of us may believe that obviously the central bank had to coordinate this by twisting arms. And we know if you don't go along with the central bank, it's not a good thing and uh, for your future prospects. So the fact that the central bank needed to coordinate this is a sign that that bank is really in bad shape. So if you read it that way, then it should accelerate the run. Uh, and Basically, the central bank can't know how 
you know, given where we are, because we've never been through any experience exactly like this, I think the Federal Reserve probably doesn't know uh, which of these two effects will predominate. And I can imagine in the uh, Federal Reserve, there being a debate with a great deal of confidence by two sides in this debate about which of these two uh, uh, parts of the distribution of beliefs is going to dominate um, with neither of them really having empirical evidence that's relevant to this particular situation. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a, a question from online that came in earlier on. So, if the so maybe we should take people with their hands up will excuse me. Uh, this is from um, Eddie Gerber, and he sort of asked a very different question. It sort of goes back to the equilibrium discussion earlier. So Ed, um, I'd like to come in. Um, and he suggests inverting uh, the way we're approaching this. And many people think that the only fixed point in the capitalist system is the point of crisis, that it's inherently unstable. We've got this the wrong way around. The fixed point is not actually this welfare optimizing place, it's actually the crisis. And the only way out of crises is through coordination of behavior. And so Eddie asked uh, either the panelists about coordination or people who talk about equilibrium. Do they support this? And if so, what does it tell us about macroeconomic policy? We can take one more question from the floor. I think you have your hand up. Yes. I mean, related to your question, in fact, so I think that's uh, that's a question that many people ask when in meetings where regulators meet uh, theorists because they say, OK, at, at the end, how what do I take away? Is this talk about heterogeneity relevant? And I would like to address that in the context of uh, something maybe related to what the Bank of England does, stress testing. So uh, a few years ago, we presented uh, some work on uh, systemic stress tests based on network models of the banking sector at the ECB. And I was asked exactly the same question. OK, you have this het uh, heterogeneous system with banks with different features. They interact through balance sheet linkages or funding linkages. You come up with some outcome, but you know, we already know that there are these loss amplification effects. And that's why we use uh, shocks in the stress test, in the macro stress test that are uh, larger than the shocks observed in the, in the history of the uh, banking sector, because this add-on is supposed to reflect exactly these loss amp amplification effects. So it's fine. You, I mean, we like uh, these models, but in fact, we have these add-ons. So why do we need anything? Is that is that uh, all you have to say or I mean, why do we need all this uh, uh, complex? Uh, to the course, so you could you can compare um, a the um, the outcome of a direct shock, which is what you do in the current stress test. So you have an amplified shock, if you like you apply to all banks. The banks are heterogeneous. They have different balance sheets, so there is some heterogeneity there. But you're applying the same amplification to the shocks on all balance sheets, whereas in the uh, systemic uh, uh, stress tests with the network effects, what we see is that the loss amplification, in fact, affects differently banks with different features uh, in, in terms of their le le uh, their leverage, their funding relations and so on, their position in the network, their uh, linkages to other banks. So in fact, the output of this is that the adjustment, which is supposed to account for all these non-modeled effects, is in fact heterogeneous itself. And it's really not easy to describe in terms of local bank, uh, local bank features. Uh, you should know something about the network structure globally in order to make these adjustments at the correct level. So in fact, there is no simple recipe to adjust the shocks in a in a heterogeneous uh, shock model to uh, take into account what is in the full heterogeneous model uh, with with interactions. So that's kind of an example which directly addresses your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps we can just uh, finish quickly before maybe if, if any of the speakers have a quick reaction. Um, Perhaps we can take that and then we can. We, we, we have to stop now.
I mean, the, the only very, very brief remark about so the question about equilibrium or non equilibrium and, and so um, one of the nice things of the experimental method or agent based modeling uh, approach is that you can be pretty agnostic about it. I mean, you just you see what happens, but you don't really need to make a choice uh, in, in, in that sense. You can you can use theoretical model analysis related to equilibria as, as some kind of benchmark, a reference point, but it's uh, what happens in the lab or what happens with the agent based model is you will see what it is, whether it set us on equilibrium or not. Right. Uh, I guess it's lunchtime, so I should wrap up now. Thank you very much for the very interest discu interesting discussion and thank you very much for all the speakers for very stimulating uh, papers that I think we should all um, think about in terms of rebuilding macro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome to the session on uh, complexity. Uh, we are, um, uh, I'm not Caroline Alves. Uh, no, which no prizes from that one. Um, but I will try my best to be a stand in. Um, we have got three speakers, and I think Doyne Farmer is going to be coming in at some point. Um, uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Mara Galagati, who will speak first. Uh, followed by Giovanni Dossi and then uh, Rob Axtell. So we have about 20 minutes each in order to allow time for discussion. I know Doim would like to take part in the discussion. There he is here. So, Mauro, the floor is yours. Um, by the way, I'm not recording paper. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I care, man. Um, you know, the, according to me, the I care about life, professional life, is divided into two parts. When I was a kid, the I care about as a kid, it was a general equilibrium theorist. Then, as the young picnic man became my you know, the complex man, a complex guy. So, the, the sort of division in his life between uh, general equilibrium and the complex. As you know, the, the economics as built as a mathematical science. It means that uh, around 1870, the, the political economy or the classes is games economics. Economics means that they try to use the the tool of physics, in particular the tool by Newton, uh, on deterministic law. And so, um, that was a so attempt to reduce political economy to economics. And, um, and then the, the real problem, according to me, is that if you use Newton or later on uh, Einstein or whatever, time is still considered. You have only um, logical time. Not historical time. There are exceptions like uh, Marshall. As you know, Marshall said that the maker of economics is biology, not physics. Um, in a way, physics. Is sort of action 
week is time. Without time. Our time is very important. Um, because because uh, this, uh, the discipline of economics is actually a discipline studying the behavior and the change of the economy. In a way, economic and the economy in particular is reproducing itself, changing continuously the, the, the border condition. Um, and so our kid era was a general equilibrium theories up to the, the appearance of the SMD theorem. The SMD said that everything as much Kole said is possible. And that's a quotation by my Ilvan my report. Ilvan is a close friend, as you know, all Alan. They said, basically, that I did that thing. Um, he believed in general equilibrium. But then, after the theorem, the system collapsed. Note that the theorem was written by Sonaske, which is one of the mentors of Alan, and the end of And um, it went to told me that uh, how can you, you, the rule, reconcile the, the theorem with uh, the William theory, say, you say, simply assume that the William as by action big stuff. Um, but the problem is that if a level do not assist every movement outside a level is important. And as right, you can't, um, you can't, um, you can test the Is cartoon is my shoes. This is not a cartoon by I Alan. And I, I'm sure. I don't know which will use because Lucy is saying that she, she has a perfect theory and the perfect theory according to her the theory you can rule or this rule. It is true for the general theory. I mean, when you, when Kirman wrote the paper on the growth of the emperor, uh, he simply said that everything was possible. Uh, you can't actually disprove this that theory. So 
According to me, um, the, the young chairman began with this idea. And the idea is that you have to understand where you form the prices. Um, and this is why it was starting the fish market. The fish market in Marseille set an other place on the world. Related to Alan was um, sort of search for who really said price in um, in uh, in a way we can say that Alan forward um her bad Simon was just to start interaction in it is originated among Asians in order to discover uh, their behavior. That's why uh, when I invite Alan for one month and more in Angola. And it was very busy. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, I would like to come. But, you know, two months is too much for me. Then I realized that in a, it was a huge fish but and I and I told told them, come here. They have a very big fish. Uh, the next day, uh, almost the next day, uh, I came for a couple of months. So and uh, according to me, um, these rules was able to uh, lead the camera and a lot of us to understanding the role of complexity. And, um, and the complexity are going to 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 our is basically Therefore, interaction is important. Uh, if you want to understand the real behavior of the market, you have to understand the role of complexity in aggregation and the heterogeneity. Um, if you look for sound realistic microphone there, you have to take into account the role of time, the, the role of interaction, and the way the, um, the that is coordination. Uh, someone yesterday said that um, that is individual complexity and I got simplicity. Uh, it is wrong. It is wrong because you have the complexity only when there is emergence. Uh, emergent behavior means that if you move 
from one level to another. You can't understand the upper level with loose of the previous level. At the end, you end up with a sort of bottom up macroeconomics. So the, the improvement is that um, if, if you have in the rise of N is already then we have a lot, you have a lot of loosened related problems. Uh, first of all, you are out of equity. Then you have a complacent or emergent, and also the dynamics is non ergotic. Um, of course, in uh, in the papers by by Anna, we have no the solution of the product, but they are clearly there. We have to solve if we want to arrive on the behavior. And the, the problem, especially with the coronavirus and the empirical stuff, is quite important because if you use time and the system becomes not ergodic. But this is why some people say that truth is not an empirical guy. We know that truth is an take care of the, the world economy. Uh, but if you use non-equilibrium stuff and non ergodistic you can't apply the standard economic work. Uh, I would like to Close the small short intervention saying that, of course, at the end, Alan is supporting the Asian based model approach. And because if you want, if you take seriously, Asian method approach, you have to test it as micro, meso, and micro. I'm saying that if a theory is good as micro, it doesn't mean it is good as meso or individual um, so thanks to all you have a lot of future work to, to do and have a good uh, job thank you
<clears throat> well, yesterday you were saying, uh, uh, I was saying, but I think uh, catching uh, a common feeling that uh, what went wrong with economics based theory, uh, beginning with the, the three major pillar that in my view are equilibrium, rationality, and a sort of um, ontological reductionism, that is putting uh, 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 Phil Anderson upside down, uh, more is the same. Uh, now, corresponding to these pillars, there are, uh, I think, uh, three major instruments that uh, uh, one has got to get rid of if one wants to uh, advance uh, seriously in, an, in the understanding of the economy as a complex evolving system, as Mauro, Mauro was saying. The three interrelated uh, major instruments are utility functions, production functions, and demand and supply curves. Uh, I mean, everyone has got to learn the demand and supply. But uh, start by noticing that uh, demand and supply curves are unique to economics. They are not there in any other natural science or social science. Uh, why is that and what is their use? Uh, in fact, all this forest of supply and demand is there to populate the analysis with a sort of double axiomatic notion of equilibrium in your head, in the head of each agent, and in the world. So it's the practical fulfillment of the three uh, wrong building blocks. Um, start with, uh, well, this at micro level, even worse uh, at macro level, that in a sense uh, is a locus of the equilibria of the equilibria of the equilibria, because this is, it is in the head of the people, then in each market, and then across markets. So it is uh, a, a triple, a, a triple notion of uh, of meta equilibria. Uh, even if all of us have learned uh, ISLM, and I must, I must confess that I never actually understood what, what they meant. But uh, now, uh, let's look more in detail these curves. Start with the man curve. Which is the man curve? Uh, is it a psychological construct? on individual preference, so it is a, a my ordering of uh, my preferences in relation to prices. Is it an, an hypothesis on aggregates? Or is it a proposition on the actual time series relation between prices and quantities? Now, first one is empirically wrong. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, uh, what, what you learn in uh, Economics 101, uh, I'm hungry, so the first spoon of soup, I'm ready to pay a lot, and then a bit less, uh, it's, it's just silly, because you would like to pay as much as it costs if you're hungry uh, for a bowl of soup, but then if the price goes down, it's not that you take 10 bowls of soup. Come up. Um, the, <clears throat> in fact, I mean, we have all lexicographic preferences. I mean, first you eat, and then uh, you dress up, and then uh, that are ordered under a budget constraint. Uh, and these are nested into cognitive categories, mental models, and embedded in. Uh, a socialization process. Uh, so at individual level, you do not have uh, anything looking like a demand curve. 
if anything, for each good, you can order the demand as a something, as a kink. Uh, say, I want, if I've got the money, I want a bowl of soup. Then if I've got money left, uh, maybe also, and I'm not a vegetarian, uh, also steak, and then etc. But uh, uh, you don't you don't uh, order your preferences continuously in a, the way you learn in school. Um, <clears throat> now, in the short term, as as Alan has uh, <clears throat> has shown abundantly, individual price quantity relation are determined by the networks of interaction and there is no evidence of well-behaved uh, purchase, purchases quantities. Uh, so we have both the disprove the psychological evidence, the social psychological evidence and also the behavioral evidence in markets that the first notion of uh, uh, of, uh, of what the demand curve is, is not there. Uh, we have some evidence, as again Alan has shown us, uh, of well-behavedness by aggregation. But this has nothing to do with uh, the structure of supply. Then what determines in a first approximation prices. Uh, also in the last, uh, well, one is the object of exchange and its condition of production. And uh, together, the architecture and mechanics of interaction among mar market participants, the identity of the actors, their system of beliefs and their evolution, the broader institution in which market themselves are embedded. Again, no evidence of curves. In particular, <clears throat> the type of net network structure that tells you uh, the the seller buyer relations and the seller seller relation. It is the competitive condition. And uh, <clears throat> the degree of reprodu reproducibility of commodities and time scale on which they are produced. I mean, you have goods uh, that are not reproducible at all. Picasso painting uh, or uh, a, a cabin uh, alone on the Galapagos Island. I mean, by definition, uh, the, a positional good uh, uh, is uh, is, exclude, is excludable in the sense that if you want to be alone, you cannot have, a, by definition, another one there. Uh, second, reproducible under roughly constant returns, but on a time scale that is lower than the rate of purchasing. I mean, Alan has studied mostly this type of market, fish to vegetables, but also I think it applies to also to oil, to minerals. Uh, third, reproducible under non-decreasing returns at a time scale faster than the purchase. These are basically most of most most of industrial goods, cars, TVs, uh, and finally a new kind of of goods. Uh, are immaterial goods infinite re reproducible at almost zero, re zero marginal cost. I mean, how do you price whatever Google is giving you? Uh, the, pro the, the open price is zero, but in a, you give them in exchange uh, your, your very being. So it's, it's a complicated, uh, it's, it's a complicated uh, market, that one. Uh, <clears throat> In any case, in all these cases, you don't have demand, standard demand supply interaction. Even in the case that is nearer 
uh, the possibility of interaction, say the uh, corn, pigs, uh, uh, the, the origin of the cobweb, uh, the co cobweb model. In fact, you can write down a dynamical system in which demand and supply interact dynamically, but again, there you don't need curves. And recall that uh, <clears throat> these, uh, this dynamic depends on the interaction uh, and not on the for expected formation. There is a, a, an interesting uh, demonstration by Rosen and Scheichmann uh, showing that even if you have rational expectation, you will have a cobweb dynamic. Well, of course, you can always rationalize it with the, the, a, a pseudo dynamic across curves. Uh, but if you get there, uh, then it, immediately the problem that you pose is, ah, if you if you see a, a change in prices and quantity, identification. I mean, uh, is it uh, is it a movement along a curve, or is it a movement of the curve? Um, this is, a, I think, is a silly question. I mean, is a. Uh, uh, endogeneity and identification are, uh, I think, the password for uh, at, at any seminar of the idiot that did not understand what the, the, the presenter is about, uh, is talking about, uh, and so raises his hand. Endogeneity. Uh, in fact, I mean, <clears throat> if you have got a dynamical system like this one, uh, you study the process. Uh, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, with my student, uh, I dramatize it, saying, but um, uh, why don't you go and ask uh, a biologist if uh, it is the gazelles that cause the lions or the lions that cause the gazelle? Uh, they will tell you that you're drunk. Uh, only in economics, you, you ask a question like that. I mean. Now, <clears throat> in reproducible commodities, approximately, uh, prices are determined by the cost of production. And in fact, you have a widespread heuristics in many, in many activities that is a sort of markup pricing over normal costs. Uh, an interesting case, I open a little parenthesis. An interesting case is uh, uh, the cases when you have got uh, a restriction on supply, like nowadays you have, uh, and uh, a profit inflation that Joe has uh, started to, to study. Um, and, uh, but this has nothing to do, of course, with supply and demand. Uh, or the fact that you've got uh, excess demand and uh, and therefore the prices go up. But it's a sort of uh, arb arbitrage by uh, producer that have got market power, uh, that is, that are able to implicitly collude and uh, change this mu, exploiting uh, exploiting the the shock on the on the on the, on the supply due to some restriction. If you want, in normal condition, if you want to write uh, uh, supply curves, uh, they are either flat or downward or sloping. If you've got the learning curves, they are down downward uh, downward or sloping. The basic message: You cannot see demand and supply curves because they are not there. Like Joe is putting it, you don't see a general equilibrium because it's not there, and you don't see demand and supply curve because they are not there. Um, actual demand, not a demand curve. Actual demand 
basically determines the supplied quantities. And prices are determined by the cost of production under condition of non decreasing returns. Note that what I just said does not mean that you might you should not observe a, a relation between price variation and demand variation over time. But uh, <clears throat> this is essentially due uh, to uh, varying, varying budget constraints uh, over heterogeneous population. It is not due, I mean, except the cases of interaction of uh, corn, uh, corn pigs, etc. Uh, you have simply the fact that uh, if uh, the price of a car suddenly increases, there will be people that say, I don't have the money to buy today, I will buy tomorrow. Uh, which has nothing to do with, uh, again, people going up or down smoothly on their um, <clears throat> demand schedule. But what about multi-sector economy? Uh, ag generally, aggregation does not preserve well-behavedness. We have heard it uh, uh, repeatedly, John and Simon tell Debra, all the way to Alan. Um, <clears throat> there is no uh, automatic implication, no isomorphism. Even if you had individuals that were well-behaved, there is no isomorphism uh, to the to the aggregate level. On the contrary, well-behavedness uh, under agnostic micro-behavior, the conditions are quite demanding. I mean, you find that they mean Hildebrandt, and they've got to to do with uh, the covariances across uh, income cohorts. Uh, the covariances of pattern of patterns of consumption across income costs. Those are quite demanding conditions. Um, <clears throat> all in all, there is absolutely no evidence of the law of one price, even in uh, uh, things that are perfectly homogeneous. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is a Coca-Cola. Look at this distribution. I found a friend of mine. Luigi Campiglia, I don't know how he found this data, but uh, uh, if you look, look at the distribution across US counties of co the price of Coca Cola, uh, you cannot claim that there is the low on price there. Again, also in multi, multi uh, uh, sector economy, prices roughly follow the cost of production. The, and this is it, even more so at aggregate level. I mean, there is no room for some uh, mythical construction like ISLM. Uh, um, well, this, what I just said, I think, uh, is part of uh, uh, putting it emphatically in a grand, old and noble evolutionary tradition that, uh, well, has got its root in the classic. Uh, Adam, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo, Marx, uh, but in a contemporary, among contemporary economists, you've got state emphatically the Simon plus Kerman micro foundations and Schumpeter plus Keynes uh, micro to macro links. Uh, in all that, I think there is no place uh, for rationality, for equilibrium, and for uh, production function, for utility function, and for supply and demand curve. Uh, we should uh, have uh, a discipline that moves away from theology and uh, uh, start becoming a, 
تسعة Is that correct? Yeah. So there, if I may, uh, Bob, there are questions I've in for you. So if I can just read this out. Um, so it's from Gary Dimsky, uh, who uh, asked, since we encountered layered relations in the real world we're trying to describe, such as power imbalances at the level of nation state, race, gender, and regions, do you believe it's possible to create ABMs or a model that can encompass all of these things at some point in the future? Or do you think we're always going to be confined to lots of small models? I think we can, we can do if you will believe in the uh, dynamical to the approach. I mean, if you allow from some structural change, then you can understand why I don't know, China is a positive surplus in the Europe or general or a negative one. Uh, instead of having countries, you may use Asian business approach. You know, by the Asian business is still proving itself. So it's a sort of new paradigm. So, okay. thank you very much indeed. And uh, if um, we can show appreciation again tomorrow. I know you have to leave, so thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, I do have just one slide, uh, and so we hopefully have plenty of time for questions when I finish. And if I might summarize my what I'm going to say right now, I'll say I'm going to interpolate, I think, between Mauro and uh, Giovanni uh, in some sense. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, Come down on the side that uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, perception or perspective on complexity and complex economics is something that I agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, and then Giovanni's uh, uh, idea about throwing out the supply curves uh, is something which I'm also going to weigh in on here. So, uh, what this slide is meant to show is that there, when it comes to to us building models and economics, there are the features that Giovanni mentioned. Rationality, networks, uh, all these several uh, uh, different aspects, and there's, and there's even a couple more that typically we get we, that we neglect. So let me just walk through these things. For example, you know how many agents do we put in our models? There's, there's just how many agents are there? So in theory, and by the way, the so the, the the first column here just says what what are the different features of of models. The middle column has this terrible acronym at the top. Let me just uh, let me unpack it. W M A D. So Valrab McKenzie. Aero de Brew. I'm putting Mackenzie ahead of Aero de Brew, which is what Weintraub says we should do. Uh, HK is going to be Hildebrand Kerman. I have to put that in there as a, as a, as what the what that's what the book teaches. V is for Varian, and then MWG is the you know the, the modern Bible for graduate micro is Moscow Winston Green. Okay, so so this this the the, the column is what is the conventional wisdom? Okay. When it comes to the number of agents, so we definitely have monopoly models, duopoly models. We have, you know, general, generally, people has n agents. We know what models are with with the continuum of agents. But what if you, you know, if you walk outside the Bank of England and you see that there are seven, uh, you know, seven rare bookstores in London? How, can I build a model with seven agents? You know, I don't, I don't have seven. I have uh, one, two, n or infinity. Uh, so I may want to build a model with seven firms that are competing for rare books or something, right? So uh, anyway, so the middle column or the, the, this, this column uh, with the with the WMAD to top on it is meant to be what do we do? Basically, here, here's the ungenerous way to say this. This is how we socialize our graduate students. We socialize our graduate students to imagine we can build models of the of this of these types. Uh, the representative agent. That's the. That's how we, we think about di diversity. Information, typically uh, global information. It's, it's it's available for free. It could be uncertain, 
uh, but it's typically not costly. Uh, beliefs, oftentimes homogeneous static. Behavior of agents, this is the, the rational uh, default. Uh, interactions, they're, they're, uh, they're typically going to be well mixed. Where everybody has equal probability of interaction, say, or we interact only, we don't interact with each other, we only act, interact through price vectors. Uh, so th anyway, so th this is, this is kind of a stylized uh, version of kind of what is taught in the in you now in the in the Moscow Winston and Green book where we 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 have what you, know, you saw all the models for equilibrium at the agent level right uh, what is the policy stance well there's a there is a social planner who designs the the right outcome from the top down and the methodology is, is analytical and it's all about optimization okay now if we want to think about how we can relax this what I've just written here is that over on the right side now I've written you know, we, we're used to thinking about, you know, behavior, uh, bounded rationality as, as Herb Simon, but then the behavior revolution with Kahneman, Versky, Vernon Smith, and then of course, Alan's paper in the QJE about ants, rationality and recruitment. So I've just written those are the, that's the, that's how we might think about relaxing the behavioral uh, aspect. Uh, how we, might we relax the diversity? Well, this is where Alan's paper in the JP was crucial here for thinking about uh, the flaws of the representative agent. Uh, the interactions piece, uh, Alan Santa Fe paper, and all the all the work on networks that's happened lately uh, fits in here. And of course, all, uh, people around the world have, have worked on various ways to relax all these things. And Giovanni's group has done this. Uh, many people have have worked on these things. So by putting the names on the right hand side here, I'm just saying, uh, just giving, uh, giving, a, 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 trying to elaborate Alan's credibility on uh, being the, one of the first ones to talk about this. So his 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 uh, paper about the emperor without clothes is a is a challenge to the, to the equilibrium version. So what I want to do next is, and I'm going to march this slide forward just once and show that there, there is in fact another way to think about though all the stuff in the middle. So just to repeat, stuff in the middle is what we teach the graduate students because we can we know how to solve those models. So this is what this is what's this is the content of, of the of the graduate level curriculum, at least in microeconomics and game theory that we in the US we spend the first year teaching all students. Uh, Maybe one other thing that I would like, just one other point I'd like to make that has not been made here much yet over the last day and a half is that uh, we've had lots of complaints against this kind of this the center column as being, you know, it's it's not realistic. It's it's uh, it's uh, has has various foibles that are kind of elaborated here. But um, there is a whole another critique that can be be rendered too, uh, brought to bear, and that's that it turns out if in fact we say how hard is it to compute. A, 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 an equilibrium in, in with these assumptions. Uh, some of you may know that to I me mean, the result, the recent results in computer science are um, from Papa Dimitriou and others are that um, it's this is uh, to compute a Walrasian equilibria is among the hardest problems in all of computer science. So technically the way to say it is Papa Dimitriou defined a new class called the polynomial parity argument class, which is in between P and NP. If in fact, so this is, is a very crisp result, if in fact it's easy to compute Warriors and equilibria, if they can be somehow computed quickly, then that would imply that P equals NP, which no one believes in computer science. You can basically solve the hardest problems in, you know, quickly. Uh, so it really suggests, we know, that's, we know, there's no proof of this, but because the Warriors problem is, is in the class called PPA, and PPA is in between P and NP, the belief is, in fact, that um, Walrus and equilibria are essentially uncomputable. That is, as the size of the commodity space gets bigger, it becomes exponentially harder to compute equilibria. So one way to think about that is that you know the, the size of the commodity space these days is you know millions or billillions of commodities somehow, right? And so if you know it's, it's almost like if, if tomorrow some some Schumpeter like figure invents a new commodity, it's going to bring bring the world economy to its knees as the economy tries to compute the next equilibria, right? It's, that seems un seems not credible. But the alternative is that if somebody can figure out, though, if one of us in the room, or somebody can figure out a, a way to compute where's the equilibria, you solve the P equals NP problem. And I believe that at Oxford, the Clay Institute is it the mathematics? They will give you the million dollars then because you solve P equals NP. So it's very unlikely that we're going to have a solution to that. So I think that the whole paradigm of our reason equilibria seems wrongheaded to me. But so what's the alternative? And what I'm going to put up here next is uh, what here calling it the complex alternative, the complexity alternative, maybe. Um, and uh, uh, and notice the, the, the difference that, uh, and we've heard about this over the last couple of days, so I don't need to elaborate it, but you know, uh, let's actually, if we have seven rare booksellers outside the Bank of England, let's use seven agents. Let's use the actual number of firms doing that. Let's, let's not use N or two or infinity. Now, those, are, those are different than seven, right? Um, uh, from a behavior point of view, let's make things, uh, you know, uh, uh, boundary rational. Let's make it, you know, the let's take take advantage of the 
behavioral revolution that we're living in. Let's add networks, right? Let's, uh, let's, let's, there are almost no institutions uh, rendered kind of meso scale in economics. Like in, in general, there are no institutions. Let's let institutions emerge. Let's uh, maybe, you know, the hardest thing about general equilibrium is solving for the agent level equilibria. Maybe we don't need that. Maybe we, we can just solve for macroscopic steady states. And uh, so anyways, the stuff on the right hand side is meant to be a, in, in other versions of this, we would call this uh, maybe a, the more realistic way to describe the economy. But I think it's just, the, it's just the complexity view is this. Now, why can't we carry this research program out to completion tomorrow? And the answer is that it's just, it's just so hard mathematically. We don't know how to do it mathematically. Uh, to turn all the stuff on the right hand side on, we don't know how to do that. So this is the, the, the challenge of, of moderate of the economics going forward is how to how to render the stuff on the right hand side uh, and do it now do it in a, some way that uh, is tractable. Now, one possibility, as Marl has suggested, maybe to do it computationally or other ways. Uh, it turns out that um, this, uh, this this table here appears in a, in a more more elaborate version in a paper that Alan and I wrote uh, for uh, a, a, a volume, and so here's the. It's hard to read this one now, but this is. A, we have many authors here, including some biologists. We uh, Ian Cousin is a biologist, so Alan and I worked with people from a variety of different fields, and we articulated this uh, even more you know, detailed uh, 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 representation of you know what, what is it like to do conventional, uh, you know, in essence, mathematically tractable models versus what we'd like to have in a world of complex evolutionary models. And as a footnote, I just also say that in the paper that Don Farmer and I had coming out in the JEL, which reviews uh, agent-based modeling, we have even a further variant of this table. So I guess the main thing that my main uh, view of uh, how we will make progress is that you know, not in my lifetime uh, will, will, will the whole right-hand thing, right-hand side be, be integrated into the, into the discipline, but um, it has in fact been the case that um, visionaries like Alan and, and Joe and, and uh, Giovanni's group have, uh, have shown us how to make a partial progress moving over to the right hand side and uh, and I think it's you know, it's, a, it's a, the challenge of the of the next uh, century of, of economics will be to how far can we get with putting stuff on the on the right hand side into into our model it won't be easy but uh, uh, we can always hope to do a better job at it so stop there and just time for questions or if you don't I guess comes in next thank you very much indeed Rob um, <clears throat> Uh, Doreen, we have you on the line. Would you like to come in at this point while people are thinking some questions and, and perhaps make a couple of remarks and then we'll go to questions in the audience and online? Sure. Um, well, it's, you know, uh, an honor but challenging to come in after three such insightful talks. I, uh, you know, agreed with them and even though I've heard a lot of this before, I still find them thought provoking. And I really like the way Giovanni picked apart all those different things. but. Um, let me maybe just try and add a, uh, an additional perspective. Um, I think we really need to answer all these questions empirically. And, uh, you know, I started out about as skeptical as you could get about mainstream economic concepts, but I do see that in some situations they actually, you know, work okay. Like rationality, okay. In most situations, that's a silly assumption. But if you look at, simple things where people can easily everybody can easily figure out what's going on then rationality may not be so crazy you know the example i like to give is tic-tac-toe which when i was about nine i thought was really fun and then i figured out how to um always get a draw even if i went second and then all my friends and for you know about a few games i was really excited because it was fun and then all my friends figured out the same trick and then we just quit because we figured out the Nash equilibrium. But you know, chess, forget it. We don't even know, have no idea what the Nash equilibrium are, whether there's one or a million. Um, so so it really depends on the complexity of the sit on the complication of the situation. And there's a paper that I'm particularly proud to be an author on, though I have to really attribute the main work to Marco Pagallo, who was the you know instigator and genius behind it, on um normal form games where we pretty much show that under bounded rationality, if the game is complicated and competitive, you just won't reach any kind of equilibrium. And otherwise, you know, otherwise you do, although there may be lots of them. Um, so anyway, I think, I think one has to ask, 
these questions about what regime are we in and what tools do we need to solve the problem and what empirically is the most, uh, uh, what empirically is the best way to get the solution. Uh, and and I think I think we need to become even more conscious of that. I mean, Alan has served a key role in really illustrating many of these problems that were on the list that uh, Rob gave us and that Giovanni brought up. Uh, but uh, you know, we have to really now. I think we have the harder task of producing tools that are empirically useful and that can be used to solve problems that people care about and really demonstrating that we can we can do better things than uh, our, our mainstream uh, incumbent competition. Um, may, may, may I, I, I could say a lot more, but may, maybe I should leave it there and then if there's more space after other people have asked their questions, I could come back and say a little more. Thanks. I, I, I really enjoyed those presentations, by the way, and I really wish I could be there because I, uh, uh, well, seeing so many friends and such a nice discussion makes it uh, frustrating not to be able to be there. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, questions from the audience? There's this gentleman in the back there. The gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, you go very much. Yeah. Uh, to the question to the, to the uh, I guess, whole whole panel. If we, I mean, there's, I would say there's some merit in simple models in the sense of we clearly understand what's going on, right? And sometimes we said this is not enough. Um, but if we use more complex models, um, there's also the downside that it gets harder and harder to understand them, right? And so um, what are, you would use what, what would you say? What are the kind of key areas or mathematical tools or so we should use to also handle uh, more complex models because we can always make them more complex but at some point um, it's it's I guess there's a question uh, can we really still understand them and 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 know and and draw robust robust conclusions for 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 policy how, how do we grapple with this problem and what are the future areas to deal with that very good okay um, <clears throat> let me just uh, oh we've got quite a few questions so I'll take two at a time to this gentleman over here uh, thank you very much for the insightful talks. Uh, I, I work at the University of Cambridge. I'm a researcher in a project with Andrea Robintini and also involved in DOIN. And uh, what we try to do is to build confidence of this equilibrium modeling for policy. So that's what we try to, to do. And we the big challenge is when you go to somebody using optimization modeling, equilibrium modeling, and try to convince them that they should be using what we propose here, so uh, complex stuff and so on. That's a big challenge. So uh, it's, it's really hard to build the confidence to them to demonstrate the value of this line of work, which can actually be also very valuable to them. The question for you is simply how do you feel is a good way to build confidence to them? And uh, because of course you, you, you build up on a lot of uncertainty and we end up including so much complexity in the systems and people normally don't really like uncertainty so maybe if there is a progression such as mapping statistical analysis and then move on towards this kind of uh, line of work i don't know any suggestion on that would be very much appreciated thanks i'll address the second one okay right away because they haven't an idea about this. So, this, so it turns out that um, I, I, I work in Washington. I've been there my entire career. And uh, so, so we've actually seen in three different domains in Washington, we've seen <laughs> the, uh, the uh, uh, displacement of the old methods with the new methods, just hitting with a coarse brush here. And those three areas are basically uh, in models of traffic, models of epidemiology, which we, we're all just uh, lived, lived through a pandemic, so we all know what those are about. And then also in, in, in models of, of armed combat, it turns out. So in all three of those areas, uh, say 20 years ago, there were mathematical models that ruled the roost, okay? In epidemiology, it was the chemical mechanical equations. In combat, it was what's called the Lanchester equations. Uh, and then in traffic, uh, John van Neumann had gone to the GM research labs trying to find a user for his new computer in 1950. And ever since then, 
people have used computational fluid dynamics analogs for flow of traffic. In those three areas, uh, there is today zero use of mathematics uh, and analytical solutions because the computational approach, the agent based approach in particular, does just it does a much more much higher fidelity job. In particular, um, in the case of traffic, there is a so-called brace paradox. The brace paradox is it's possible to add lanes of traffic to a highway and reduce the flow. And you cannot get that phenomenon to happen with a, with a computational fluid dynamics model. The bigger you make the pipe, the more stuff flows in. But with, with agents and the internal turbulence that happens, you can get that to happen. So these days, just as a very practical matter in the US context, the Federal Highway Administra Administration, uh, which is a large, uh, has a large research budget in the $50 million range, they fund zero dollars of, of the old fashioned CFD stuff and they fund everything as being agent based. In the case of combat, my sense is combat is probably the single area, by the way, which has a, it says in the US, in the US defense budget, it's a gigantic number that nobody knows it's a black number. They probably spend 100, 200 million dollars a year just doing agent based combat models. And the way that they're used is, you know, we want the general says we're going to go into, you know, into Fallujah. What should the rules of engagement be? Should they be only shoot only if we're shot at? Shoot only if we see somebody wearing an enemy uniform? What should the rules? Which rules will give us the highest chance of success? Say, and so they run a million agent based simulations of this. And the old fashioned models are just, you know, just irrelevant. Uh, the modern models you know, have every soldier is an object, every every weapon system is an, every bullet is an object. So, when, you know, so you can imagine those be very high fidelity. And then uh, the third one is the, are these um, in epidemiology. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in here in here in, in the UK, even uh, you know, it was it was the most well known model was was used. Mm -hmm. These are essentially all agent based today. Right, you're going to have individual actors who get sick or not. The, 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 the transmission is through direct contact, et cetera. So I mean, so it, it is possible to you know at least in kind of a you know in in uh, um, in, in in policy circles, but a kind of on re relatively rapid time scales, you can convert policymakers to the new approaches. When you can show them the value added, right? When you show them you can do something that the other ones can't do. So maybe that's that's the key. To, you need to basically demonstrate to a policymaker that that they can that they can do things with a new approach that they either bi better, bigger, faster, something cheaper than, than they could do with the old old way. But maybe then, so that's going to be probably hard in some domains. But another domain in Washington, like in finance, you find there's lots of interest in that at at, uh, at the SEC for agent based models. Uh, at uh, the NASDAQ research headquarters, it turns out, are located in the Maryland suburbs. Uh, they have a big age based modeling effort there. Um, some of you may know when the NASDAQ decimalized, they invested a million bucks or a couple million bucks to build a high fidelity model of that, what that market, what would happen to their market upon decimalization. And uh, that was a big age based. And so there's a whole bunch of success stories that we have today. Um, how to get them to, how to make that pace more rapid, uh, that's always going to be a challenge based on idiosyncratic circumstances associated with the policy person you're dealing with, I think. That's the first question. Yes, I mean, uh, there are different answers. One is that uh, complexity does not mean complicated. Um, maybe the, the emergent property is very simple. I mean, in the war example, it's either you win or you lose. Uh, but uh, you have got a thread of interaction that lead you to winning or losing. Um, can you, I mean, there is a, this obsession of a, one of the various obsession of economists, uh, but I want to know the cause. Uh, the cause is not, I mean, is a, a system that goes in one direction or in another direction, is not, uh, I mean, the, the, the search for individual causes goes back to the reductionism that we were saying before, that uh, you can divide up, uh, so you can uh, <clears throat> dissect uh, why is this cake uh, good. 22% is due to the sugar, 5% uh, is due to the butter, uh eleven point five percent is due to, due to the flower uh, and then yes of course uh, you can make an exercise I mean, uh, if i increase the butter what happens to the to the goodness of the cake but it's silly it is absolutely silly uh in fact i mean good uh, good uh, agent based models are models that in which you cannot identify a cause, but you can 
if they're good and robust, you can say, well, if I turn on and off this lever, uh, what happens? Uh, if I increase the public spending, what happens? That is not saying uh, uh, I have, I know the cause of the higher growth. So given the entire setup uh, of the model, I can use it as a policy laboratory. Uh, and the same you do in, uh, with the military or uh, with the traffic. Uh, often, why it goes up or the something goes up or down uh, depends on non average behavior. And this non average behavior cannot be captured by not even a system of a standard differential equation. Uh, this is why you want uh, you want it in based. Uh, we'll go for another round of questions. There's one, two. Um, while we're collecting these questions, I would like to put one uh, to um, you both as well, but you can answer it when you've heard the other two. So uh, John uh, Kay raised evolutionary psychology this morning. And I would like to know the extent to which you think that agent-based models might be useful or are indeed applied, and I just don't know it, towards um, areas like evolutionary psychology. They ask, ask the deep human questions, in other words, of how do we really think, or is this just a jump too far? So we'll keep that one there. I think there's two questions um, already. Rama and the chap in the middle. Here we go. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentations. I was just want to follow up a little bit on this problem of cause. So causality and identification strategies are sort of like the gold standard today in economics to test things empirically. Um, I understand, Giovanni, you're very much against that because it makes no sense from a complex system perspective. But my question is then, what would be the tools for empirical or statistical validation that we should be pursuing uh, instead of instead of those? Thank you. Rob. Yes, I would like to uh, bounce off what Rob was saying. I think Rob gave an excellent uh, response to the question being asked about, you know, how to convince and users to uh, start using agent base or other models which incorporate this uh, type of approach and the examples you gave are interesting because they are empirically grounded models which have been calibrated to uh, very large da databases they have demonstrated a predictive accuracy which is uh, convenient for the uses they were they are applied to and i think one of the shortcomings of many agent-based models in economics has been exactly that. I think the big stumbling block in this literature has been the uh, realism of the, uh, well, the, the parameter estimation procedure. The, so uh, a lot of the, the papers are successful in, gener uh, in demonstrating certain phenomena by using toy examples. But if we say, OK, well, now I want to apply this to say a specific market in a specific country then you need to go out and have data uh, micro data to uh, to calibrate your agents parameters and the data is either not available to researchers who are working in this area because they are they are sub subject to some confidentiality uh, uh, restrictions they're only available to the red regulator so in summary people who have the data do not work on these models and people who work on these models do not have access to the data and we do we can't do experiments because this is you know something economics is used to so i think that's the big obstacle here and um i would also like to link this to something that was said this morning uh, so somebody said uh, somebody uh, uh, pointed out this uh, terrible quote by jo uh, george box which i i i really hate and this is who said um uh, you know, all models are uh, uh, are wrong, but some are useful. Th such a terrible message to give to students and young researchers in this audience. This is goes against everything science stands for. This is at least the way I think about this quote. And to put it into context, George Box was an applied statistician working in the industry. And when he said this sentence, he was re referring to what when he said models, he was referring to basically uh, equations uh, used for data fitting. So in that context, you could understand what he was saying, but 
certainly not uh, it's certainly not related to the kind of modeling efforts that you were talk talking about in this panel and otherwise today so i think uh, uh, actually going against what uh, this sentence says uh, we see in this panel that empirically grounded models, and especially with what Rob said, are very useful and are relevant because they describe a, actually a, a mechanism that is uh, uh, grounded in empirical uh, research behavior of agents. Whereas if you write down a random model as, as a speculative exercise, there's no, no re reason other than empirical for it to be related to the phenomena you describe. So okay. I just wanted to make this clear. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Brian. Um, <clears throat> Giovanni and Rob, do you want to take those three questions, I think, and we'll also bring Doyen in, in to answer this as well. And I think we've got time for one more round. Let me just jump right, right away on Rama's question and say that um, uh, I agree 100%. I, do, I recently had, had, a, had the reason to look, look up that quote from George Box. It's in Box and Hunter. The book is called uh, Design of Experiments. And as you said, it's just about fitting response surfaces to simple, uh, right? So there's no, there's no fun functional mechanism under that in there at all. So exactly as you said. Uh, Rama. And, but uh, no, the, right, lacking data, for example, in, in financial markets, the, the, the Kant Gooley model is a good place to start. But, but you want to have something, if you have detailed data on how the NASDAQ works or something, you can, you can build a much better model. So I agree 100% that, uh, that that's the way to go to get the data. And maybe to tie the two questions together is, is to say that um, uh, there are many, many times when we are going to be able to get the data. Uh, and then we, you can have you can think about building a, a high fidelity model to some extent. But in those cases, when we don't have the data, you're left doing kind of much more of a thought experiment. So there are maybe these two different kinds of ABMs. One is kind of a thought experiment to understand, to, to gain understanding about how the, how the world's working versus trying to build a high fidelity representation of some specific social economic phenomenon. And those are really quite different uh, formulations. The only, only thing I want to say about that, though, is that there's, there is one thing that I think that one non-stationary aspect of the world we live in right now that's worth worth thinking about talking about is that, is that there has been a surge, a, a gigantic explosion of, of, of social science data, economic finance data in the last the last decade. Just put that out there as a fact. There is going to be a lot more coming. Okay, There are going to be these firewalls and things to keep them out of certain people's hands, but it just in general, there's, there's just so much more data available to you guys, to, to the current generation of researchers than it was you know, when I was a graduate student, almost none, right? So, uh, so it's, it's a data explosion. And in, there are a few domains now, and just maybe to follow up on specifically on what Rama just said, there are some domains, and, I, and one that Giovanni and I both work in a little bit is our, our firm dynamics area. These days, uh, I just report that uh, when we can get data and for, for Japan, for the Europe, for America, every single business firm from the tax data. When you have data on, in the U.S. case, 6 million firms that employ 120 million workers, and you have firm sizes, firm ages, firm growth rates, firm productivities, firm financials, firm networks, firm, firm locations in space, I'm just telling you, there are more, da there are more data today than we can explain. I mean, there's, 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 just, there's copious amounts of data, and I do wonder if going forward, say by the year 2030, by the year 2050, if you know, there will be so many data available that the challenge is going to be which model can explain 5% of it, 10% of it? So it's got a quite different world that would be than what we have today, where we, you know, we have this kind of thin gruel of, say, macro data. Don't has a nice wrap about um, how few bits of data are in the aggregate time series, don't, right? I think I take up the distinction that was made about uh, between uh, models that try to explain the world and models that uh, are calibrated on uh, specific phenomena. I mean, I'm a bit wary of the of the idea that uh, uh, agent-based models should uh, be used to do data fitting. Uh, I think that as a good agent-based data, first of all, I've got to uh, explain phenomena and explain group of phenomena. Uh, so, I would, uh, in fact, advocate uh, non-calibrating the models, saying uh, in uh, this broad range of parameterization, you robustly, the model generate these properties. <laughs> but above a certain threshold, for example, it has a first transition. Um, when you have a model saying, uh, I parameterize uh, it, I get this result uh, if the parameter is 
5.127. Mm. It means that maybe it does not work otherwise. Uh, I'm skeptical of that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the, you've got to be, however, you've got to be disciplined on the way you represent the agent behavior. Uh, and uh, again, you've got to be to have robust rules that happen to be uh, relatively simple or very simple indeed. I mean, I, uh, Joe and I and Andrea Roventini did this model in which if the world is complex and non, uh, non-stationary, it is useful to have a no decision rule that are fast and frugal uh, and neglected information. Uh, because if you try to follow the tail of the dog and the dog is moving, um, you get it wrong. And in fact, I do and I demonstrated that uh, <clears throat> if you have a heuristic, a heuristic agent and a relatively sophisticated agent that uh, do estimate using OLS, uh, those that do OLS uh, have a higher probability of dying, make less money, and if you have many of them, they screw up the entire system. <laughs> if you have got too many clever people. So, would you like to come in here? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, there have been a lot of great questions. Uh, I, I thought I might go back look. to the question okay. about how do you understand? I might go back to the question about how do you understand your model and connect it with Rama's question? Um, you know, I think, first of all, there's an art in building agent based models so that you can see what they're really doing and understand what they're doing. And uh, it really requires a lot of software effort to build a model that's genuinely plug and play. So you can substitute so, and you think about the model is not just one version of everything, but multiple versions of everything so that you can test to understand what really makes the model tick by substituting different theories or different modules uh, that incorporate different ideas about how things work. And of course, as Giovanni says, it's always critical to understand the robustness of your conclusions to variations and parameters. Um, of course, the world may have some parameters that the model really that, that really the world depends sensitively on those parameters. You have to understand that and and be able to fully understand what the model really does. And that can take a lot more effort than building the initial model. Um, so I think that's really important. I guess I do really agree with Rama that we have to move. I, I, well, let me back up. I think ABMs have had great success making qualitative uh, conclusions about things. And uh, and I don't think we should underestimate that. On the other hand, I think we have to move towards um, fitting agent-based models that apply to specific countries at a specific point in time, specific situations, and and do some of what, I guess I disagree a little bit with Giovanni about um, using the models to, to fit data. And it's actually, that's the wrong way to put it. It's not that you use the model to fit the data, it's that you fit the model to the data well enough that you can make useful predictions with the model. And that's a very different thing. You know, if you look at econometrics, the biggest mistake econometric econometricians make by far, and that they still continue to make in, you know, papers again and again in the top five journals, is not testing things out of sample. And, you know, we should do that. We should really test our models out of sample because that's just the right way to do stuff. And so I think we do have to move if we want to convince people towards models like that, uh, because somebody can always say, well, how do you know your model's right? And if if you're able to show that it produces useful predictions in a consistent and reliable way, then it becomes harder to argue that your model isn't right. I don't think we're ever going to win over the other side by just the conceptual um, 
uh, veracity or uh, conceptual appealingness of our arguments. I think we really have to do this in an empirical setting. And I think because of what Rob said, the data is out there now. The time is ripe. We have the computational power. We have the data. We can do this now. It's not an easy task. It's going to require a lot of work, but I think we can do it and we can move to the next step and make our models much more useful than they have before. We can directly challenge the mainstream by showing that we can do a better job at established problems. And we can also pick problems where the mainstream doesn't even have alternatives so that we, we can be the only game in town. And I don't think a mixture of those things is the key to success in moving the field forward and having it um, take more prominence than it has in the past. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. And I guess there's a 10 second answer, I believe, to your question. Yeah. Which is going to be, there's been very little work on that, this overlap, I think. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Technology and complexity and age based modeling, there's not been much work on that. But is it because of the limitations of agent based modeling, or is it just it hasn't? Because that no. would seem to be a very important to understanding <clears throat> you know, how we create knowledge, uh, how we do make decisions. I think the other way around yeah. might be. I mean, we should learn more from evolutionary psychology. Not, uh, I don't think that they should make mm -hmm. it of us. Yeah, right. We, yeah. we should yeah. in premise make use of them. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of more short questions and there's, oh gosh, four hands. Right, <laughs> so we're going to take all four, but you, it's going to be a short question, please, no statements. Andy, you first. Uh, well, it's just a little bit of a statement, I'm sorry. I, uh -huh. I um, but I will, I, I will make it short. I just want to say a more general point, which is more thought provoking. I think we have a lot of, I would say, elder statesmen of economics here. And like we saw with Alan Kuhlman yesterday, the, the discussion of the career, and I think it was amazing, like doing different things, being driven by interest and insights and so on. But I think for, especially in the, the economics profession nowadays, is very professionalized and young people are under a lot of strain. And I'm actually not sure how much they would be able to replicate a, a similar career in the same environment. Say, so, well, I go to Princeton because I'm interested in this subject and I want to work on it. I don't know if this is possible, but maybe some people can have reflections on like, if, well, if there's an issue or what, what could be done about this, that young people can be creative again to move things in a different direction. Thank you. That's a very, very fair point. Very, very interesting point. Uh, Mary. Oh, uh, we're passing to Mary. Uh, Joe and Alan, I think. Yeah, okay. Short questions for the panel. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, the first uh, has to do with with uh, the use of, of these models and uh, the extent. Uh, you know, we t we talk about fitting uh, or using them to describe situation testing out of sample, but. One of the reasons we want to use the model is to be able to respond to situations that have never occurred before. And especially one of the spirits of this uh, seminar is that the world is always changing. So take one example. Um, we just had a pandemic. We haven't had many uh, pandemic within the uh, space of the data that we have available. And if we go on maybe a thousand years, we'll have enough uh, data to know how people behave in the presence of a pandemic. But we might infer over that a thousand years, maybe something else has changed. So we will never have enough data to talk about uh, the actually application of the model to pandemics. So the critical thing is, is there enough um, ability to use the model to identify what aspects of that situation are similar to the past and what are the uh, stable frameworks in a, a context which is very different that allow us to make uh, policies going forward uh, for this idiosyncratic event. And I, I just want to comment about how we think about that. Related to that is a very specific situation that I think uh, Giovanni raised, but or it, it, um, we're having inflation. Uh, there's one school of thought focusing all on the aggregate, and the other uh, is about a very disequilibrium uh, behavior of different sectors interacting, uh, uh, 
Each in the sector has a limited number of players. Uh, it's tacit collusion, perhaps. But at the same time, there are forces for profit maximizing some degrees of rationality. So I, I feel very uncomfortable with fixed markups. So in fact, the markup soared, uh, but there are a slow process of coming down. So how do we construct uh, better agent-based models, firm-based models that would be better, uh, for instance, for the uh, Bank of England or for the Federal Reserve in dealing with uh, interpreting uh, that uh, inflation? The final question or comment is, uh, why is it that the equilibrium models have uh, dominated uh, within the profession so strongly in spite of all of the evidence of why they are not relevant? Now, I want to suggest that there's really a political agenda that if the market is in equilibrium, there's no need for government, uh, no, you know, nothing we could do could be better than the market. Uh, as uh, in in collective action. So if you want, if your agenda is to make sure that uh, the rich can keep their money for as long as possible and you have no government, then to say that the system is working beautifully and all in equilibrium and Pareto efficient uh, is seems to be at least a, a foundation for that view. If on the other hand, you have the kind of result that we had in the previous session where uh, we achieve 20% uh, of what you could have achieved uh, if you had a little bit of coordination, you might say, well, maybe even if the coordinator is not perfect, it is not central planning, but some limited degree of coordination could achieve uh, an 80% increase or in fact, actually five-fold increase from what was shown in that particular game maybe it's worth trying a little bit to have even an imperfect uh, collective action. So I, I suspect that a lot of this economic debate underlying this is a political agenda. Oh, were you going to make a remark or ask a question? Yeah, but you said very short questions and I think yeah. Joe's question really wasn't <laughs> that short. He's crowded you out. <laughs> so I'll be very quick. Um, and Rick Bookstaber wrote a book called The End of Theory, which I strongly recommend to you, and uh, gave good reasons why he thought that theory as we've been doing it shouldn't uh, be done in that way. So that's a, a first remark. And my second remark is um, working with Rick, we said, uh, let's look at a, a, a market of, uh, for example, the uh, stock market of and then build a model of that. And he said, you don't want to start with N firms and L people and so forth. He said, what you want to start with is the market as it is. And the market as it is in the States is dominated by a number of actors. And we know how they actually work and think. They actually advertise that. This is our strategy. You know, Goldman Sachs and so forth. So he takes, in some sense, a very different position, says, Let's take the actors as they are in that and see if we can't do something with that. Then we can worry about the very general model which could fit any possible society. So I suspect that despite all this data, we could also usefully take, uh, you know, base it on actual markets and actual phenomena and try and explain them as well, not have this glorious ambition to have the huge models. So that would just be a remark. Very good. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask each of the three panelists <clears throat> to give any closing thoughts, either what they've heard there in terms of questions or remarks or any reflections. So um, perhaps, uh, Rob, we can start with you. I'll uh, address the question at the, at the back first. That's, um, so I think it's always dicey to know where how hiring will happen in the future and kind of how, how the reward system will play out. And I'll just report the fact, and Alan will know more about this than I do, but my former colleague, Peyton Young, who is the same cohort as Alan, he, he, he reported, he always would uh, kind of harp on me. He said that uh, game theorists could not get jobs except in math departments through the 70s. Then through the 80s, they couldn't get jobs anywhere except in business schools. And only when LaFont and Tyrol really showed how to use 
game theory for antitrust consider considerations? Did they did, were game theorists hired in in the econ departments? And I think uh, Vernon Smith has told me almost exactly the same thing about experiment, experiments, right? Uh, economic departments wanted either zero or one experimenters up, up until the 90s. Uh, so there was Al Roth was there and Vernon and a couple other people, but almost. But, but then as soon as it tips, right? As soon as as soon as it, as soon as the profession decides that these are valid methodologies, game theory on the one hand, experience on the other hand, then in fact departments want people like that, right? But uh, and on what time scale it happens, it seems it seems. Uh, I hate to say it, almost generational, right? It's kind of, you know, Peyton and Allen lived through the generation where game theorists went from being on the periphery to being in incorporated. I mean, Peyton himself went from Cooney Math, Maryland Business School, Hopkins Economics. I think he actually went that path. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, I, so that, that, that's, a, that's a short answer to that, more, more a sociology question. And I will answer just one part of Joe's to say that, um, you know, it is the case that um, the, model that, that the model that was used in, in the West, uh, but in particular, in the UK and in, in the US uh, for for COVID was was Ferguson's model, which was basically had been calibrated for the flu, uh, and so a few parameters were modified and then then, uh, then deployed on that basis. And then I'll just report now that you know, every, given that everybody knows we have to be better prepared next time, uh, there are large efforts on, uh, going on now to have uh, basically on the shelf models can be pulled off reparameters appropriately and that because i'm going to be going to at the end of this month there's a giant conference at, at texas austin where there's a big group working on this kind of stuff uh, so they, these are in process now how how good they're going to be you know that, that remains to be, be determined but there are the idea is that when the next pandemic hits a whole variety of things will be ready to go we won't and it's, it's one of the foibles of ferguson's model was ferguson did not make the model available to the public the code was not transparent the parameters that he changed, he wasn't sure he changed the right parameters. To, 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 so there was a whole bunch of problems associated with, with when that actually happened. But that, but that, I think when you think about it, that was an agent-based model that was used to, in fact, modify the behavior of, you know, a, a billion people. Right? We all, we all went into lockdown because of Ferguson's model. I mean, that was really social distancing was the only solution in the near term, and that was the result of, of, of a, a few hundred, no, a few thousand lines of code. But then, going back to the question for the young generation, I'm uh, more pessimistic than you, Rob. I mean, uh, Max Planck used to say that uh, when old people that represent old paradigm die, uh, then uh, a new paradigm can come in. But uh, journals are a way of immortalizing the old paradigm. Uh, and uh, the young people, by and large, those those that are in their forties and fifties, uh, uh, young. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah right, right, young, uh, are generally more close-minded and more fascist than uh, the older ones. Uh, look at the policies in the top five, but not only in the top five. Um, so. Here, we, I think we have a problem. We have a problem of uh, building critical masses in some institution able to hire young people that uh, share our broad, uh, our broad paradigm. There are journals, and there are good journals we have now. Uh, let me advertise industrial and corporate change, but it's not the only one. I mean, uh, you have the Journal of Evolution Economics to some extent, the uh, Journal of Economic Dynamics and uh, Control. control. Mm -hmm. uh, you have got uh, Economic Inquiry. Um, there are research policy for those that uh, work on, uh, on innovation. Um, you have journals where, and uh, the, the, their pattern of citation is not extreme, very different from the top five. Uh, so it's a matter of us uh, selecting the young people that are using yesterday metaphor that are both uh, able to catch mice and are red, not only one or the two. Um, I'll stop here. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Closing thought from you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sure. I, uh, sure. I, I'd like to I, I, I'd like address to address, uh, address um, getting an echo. 
I'd like to address Joe's comment. Address I, Joe's think, comment. I think he makes I a think, really important point. I think he makes a really important point. That if you that if you 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 sorry. You, sorry. You need you need to understand you need, you need to what understand a model can do. What a model and, can do. And 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 <laughs> sorry, I'm having a very difficult sorry. time because I'm, I'm getting a huge echo. I'm getting a huge echo. Let me. I'm going to take my. Oh, and well, no, maybe though. Sorry. Well, I'll just do my best. Oh, the echo's gone away. Good. Okay. So I think the question is. What kind of models do you trust and, and how do you deal with situations where the world is non-stationary? We need to be able to investigate in economics, the world as it might be, not just the world as it is. And, but I would argue that I'm much more trusting in a model that can at least explain the world as it is to explain the world as it might be. If we know the model can't explain the world as it is, then we can be pretty certain it's not gonna explain the world as it might be. And, where that's the the mainstream. Now, for COVID was a good example, and here I can beat my own chest a little bit. When the pandemic broke out, we put together a non-equilibrium model to deal with the, and predicted the size of the shocks to the UK economy, and we predicted how much those shocks would be amplified by the industrial structure of the UK economy. We made a prediction in real time about the GDP hit to the UK economy that was bang on both in terms of uh, the size of the effect and how it played out through time and how it would hit the 55 industries that we were able to model. Um, and how do we make that work? We made it work by having a much more realistic production than any of the competition and by realistically modeling how shocks propagate around the economy and how restrict happen, restrictions happen due to labor supply, lack of inputs for goods, and lack of demand. And so I think it was an example where uh, the model was able to, first of all, predict things in real time and was able to think about a situation that had not occurred before. And why were we able to do that? Because we had correctly represented the structure and the dominant cause effect relationships in the system. And the parameters we fit mainly by guessing at them. And we had uh, the good luck that there weren't very many free parameters and that it turned out the behavior of the model was relatively insensitive to those free parameters. Um, building on Giovanni's earlier point. So I do do that. And I think that um, uh, agent-based modeling and complexity economics can show the way forward in getting better empirical results and in dealing with the Lucas critique in a way that makes sense rather than trying to deal with a Lucas critique in a way that's crazy. Thank you to um, our three panelists, so uh, we're three. Um, it's now coffee break for 20 minutes, so we meet back here for the final session on interaction before a summing up. So please enjoy the coffee and thank the panelists one more time. Um, welcome back um, to the last but certainly not least um, session on in interactions. So I'm Andy Joseph. I work here at the Advanced Analytics Division of the Bank of England. Um, for those, this may, some, this may sound cryptic. So that's the, you say, the data science um, team of the bank and we are heavily involved in research um, using kind of novel data sets, natural language processing, and machine learning. And one particular thing which connects us to the themes of the conference here, um, we have, I think, great intellectual diversity in our team. So we, there's some, there may be some economists, which are actually a minority, but we are also, say, physicists, uh, mathematicians, psychologists, and linguists. Um, and now, without further ado, I think this also connects well to the session where we actually we'll see, um, I would say, influences from, from different fields to um, economic problems. And I think that's um, one of, uh, it's, 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 a way, it's a way forward. So then I, I leave the floor um, to Matteo Massimini from Trieste, 
Um, and we will do it slightly different here in this section. Session, we, we said we will do talks and then Q&A a couple of minutes and then have a general discussion if there's a time such that every speaker gets, say, the same amount of attention uh, in the session. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, so and also we do it differently because we stand up and uh, <laughs> so, so first of all, I really thank uh, the organizer for setting up this uh, great meeting uh, and uh, so um, actually and uh, I apologize because uh, I'll not be talking about uh, inequality. Um, one reason for this is that uh, I don't know much about inequality, so I'm organizing a workshop uh, in one month time, so maybe if this conference would have been after that, I would have had something to say. Um, but um, instead, uh, uh, I want to discuss about the information interaction, which is something uh, with which I've been uh, interacting a lot with uh, with, with Alan, uh, and I've been learning a lot. So I'm definitely one of uh, the many people here who have a, a great depth and uh, so um, and I really feel uh, very fortunate, very lucky that I, I met him. I think uh, we met in the VIA conferences which were organized by Mauro and also Mauro uh, Gallegati is a person I, I feel a very not only for uh, the intellectual uh, aspect but also for the human dimension uh, of uh, the, the interaction. So, so this was uh, uh, a picture uh, I took. Uh, uh, we were in Brazil and um, close to São Paulo, and um, and I'm sure. So what struck me of Alan was uh, uh, that he has this uh, specific uh, um, um, uh, peculiarity of the best physicist of uh, really being driven by curiosity. And uh, so the, the paper uh, we found in this, one of the paper we wrote in was just uh, trying to explain why is it uh, that uh, uh, some people were finding better places uh, than him uh, when he was finding a parking place uh, when he was going to the, to, to the economics department. And in the end, uh, what we found out uh, is that essentially some people are lucky and some people are unlucky. I mean, so yeah and um and so and i'm sure he was thinking about some other uh, uh, uh economic phenomena here uh, figuring out some patterns of uh, okay so okay so the other thing uh, uh, so i'm going to talk about uh, um information interaction in financial markets so the other thing is that i also feel like uh, 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 Alan, uh, a little bit of a contrarian, uh, both in physics and also in this community. I'm say the only physicist. But uh, um, so, as you uh, will see, I mean, say the um, also with respect to the discussion we had uh, in the last session. So, um, uh, in physics, we like a lot of very simple models simple uh, models uh, that uh, depends on few parameters, but they, are, they, have a de they have some depth and can explain really uh, uh, the interaction. And uh, so and in the course of uh, my, um, say, uh, um, um, say, say my um, um, research in economics, uh, this is what I'm also been trying to do. So, trying to uh, pick simple model in economics, uh, and also uh, try to uh, really um, uh, um, use them to really understand the uh, phenomena. And this is uh, uh, so. What I think is that probably in economics, and this this refers to the discussion we had yesterday. Probably in economics, uh, uh, so economists have stopped too early in the study of, of some of their models because uh, I think there is some uh, uh, conceptual that also with respect to general equilibrium uh, models, but I'm not going to talk about that. So, okay, so um, 
this is the general idea. Uh, you have an economy, you have financial markets, and uh, uh, companies which are, uh, say, uh, which, uh, share stocks uh, in the financial market, the investors, uh, and, um, uh, and there is, say, an interaction which is driven by information. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, uh, then uh, there is this idea of uh, uh, market information efficiency which looks at the equilibrium of this, uh, and uh, as has already been uh, mentioned, there are issues with, uh, if you take too seriously this, uh, this view, because uh, of course, then you ask uh, who is going to put the information into prices, if prices contain all the information, okay? And so the, this is uh, the type of model uh, that I'm going to discuss, which is a gloston Midgard model in a very simplified, uh, uh, version and uh, and and then uh, I'm going to discuss two related things. So um, so the first is how much do prices move in response to uh, a predictable order flow, and this is a aspect which has uh, been studied a lot, also empirically recently, because it's a, a, it's a great relevance also for the industry. And the, the, the mirror question is uh, essentially uh, how much money can a trader make uh, if he has one bit of information? Okay, so uh, okay, so uh, this is an example of information aggregation markets. And as you see, say this is the uh, example of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. As you see, it took several months for the market to aggregate information. This uh, so it was not the okay. So what I'm going to uh, study is the gross and minimal model. So I'll just uh, uh, recap what it is. So there is a population uh, population of traders that buy or sell stocks uh, uh, from a market single market single stock market, and uh, um, the value of the stock is either one or zero with probability p or one minus p, and there is a fraction of traders who is informed. They know, they have uh, the glass ball, they know uh, whether this uh, uh, stock will be uh, uh, valued one at the end or, or zero, okay? And the rest is just uh, noise traders who just trade at random, okay? But because the noise traders, uh, the, the informed traders know the, va the value, they are going to, play, uh, to trade in a predictable manner, so in a, in a deterministic manner. Okay, and then uh, the market makers uh, sets the uh, prices uh, for ask uh, and uh, for buyers and sellers, uh, and, and you have this sequential uh, trading. So at each time there is one guy coming to uh, to uh, submit an order. Uh, the market maker does not know whether he's in, he or she is informed or not, and uh, and then this is the way he sets uh, bid and ask prices. Just uh, in a competitive manner, okay. So that, uh, um, um, okay, this is the usual uh, uh, competitive uh, equilibrium uh, thing. And uh, as trading goes on, uh, essentially the information uh, that uh, informed traders have is revealed, and the price converges uh, to uh, the true price, okay, and is a uh, marking. So and so this is the economist uh, economist uh, uh, picture of the market uh, where there is a strategic uh, game being played by um, the market maker and the form trader. And uh, but also uh, you can think uh, this model also describes uh, how uh, a, a sequence of uh, uh, trades, predictable trades, will move the price. Because uh, um, and this is essentially uh, happens when when you have institutional traders that have to liquidate large positions, because essentially these uh, um, um, these people, these institutional traders, are going to behave in the same way as uh, informed traders. And so, from the point of view of the market maker, it does not really matter whether they are informed or whether they are that just. Uh, uh, playing uh, sequentially, okay, so. Okay, so um, now this is the um, 
as I told you, the empirical evidence uh, that has been collected mostly by um, people like uh, uh, Jean-Philippe Bousseau and his group, but also uh, Doin Farmer, Fabrizio Lillo and others have contributed to this. And by now, that is a very well, uh, this is one of the best uh, uh, characterized uh, uh, phenomenology, as far as I know, of uh, uh, market microstructure. So essentially, um, the main uh, behavior is that uh, the, the, the price, this is the price, uh, the change in price, as uh, you execute uh, the order, okay, as you execute this sequence of transactions, and uh, the price does not go linearly, it just follows a square root law. Okay, which means that the market is very, very susceptible. So that it responds in a very uh, non-linear manner. And uh, so after the, 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 the order is executed, the, then the price essentially reverts back, uh, decays. Uh, empirically, it's not clear whether uh, it decays to zero or whether it decays to a finite value, even because uh, the time window of one day limit, limits empirical analysis. And, uh, but also recently, what it has been shown is that if you look at uh, very small orders, uh, very short time, then the, the marketing part is actually linear in very, very short uh, time uh, window. OK, so what I'm going to show is that uh, essentially uh, you can get uh, um, all these things uh, essentially from the glonstein Milgram model. And so these are the numbers. Typically, if you say, if you focus on, a, um, say, uh, an order, which has a volume, say, say of order one, then uh, um, this will be executed in a, uh, in a time where in the market there are order 10 to the four transactions. And um, so, which means that uh, the order of magnitude of the frequency, this new is going to be the frequency of trades of the um, uh, of, of, of the uh, meta order of this, um, it's going to be very small. It's going to be ten to the minus three. <laughs> okay. So, however, if you take uh, this uh, uh, the gross and gross and model, and you compute what is the average price change, then you find uh, an impact uh, which is linear. It grows linearly with time or with the volume of the order. And, um, and so uh, you would say, OK, so this uh, this model uh, is wrong, OK? But actually, if you think about it, uh, well, uh, the market or the market maker actually does not really know uh, what is the uh, what is the frequency of transaction of this uh, um, informed trader or, or of the meta order. And so, um, what we did was to study what happens when the market maker, or say the market, does not know. Uh, know. And then what you have to do is essentially to use a, a Bayesian perspective. This is the best thing that a, a, a market maker can do. So you have a trial on, uh, on this parameter nu, you observe a number of trades, and then uh, you are played with the likelihood, you get the posterior. Okay? You get the posterior. And from the posterior, you estimate what is the um, how how is the price fixed uh, um, depending on the number of transactions. Okay, and um, okay if you do this, uh, you get the square root law. Okay, and actually um, it's very uh, robust in the sense that you can also change the prior. You always get this uh, square root law. And actually, what happens is that uh, um, um, you can also get uh, the impact decay when the uh, market order finishes, then the, uh, the, the price reverts back to the equilibrium. And also for small orders, uh, if the market maker anticipates that uh, nu cannot be larger than a certain nu bar, you also get uh, this uh, linear behavior. So it's, I mean, I find it remarkable, it's such a simple model with such a simple uh, 
say, extension, uh, uh, re reproduces all this, uh, this behavior. And the intuition is very simple. Okay, so uh, when, the, when the, all the stars, essentially the, essentially the typical estimate of uh, the market maker of the flow of orders is essentially equal to the new bar. So this is constant. So if you take uh, the basic uh, linear impact of the um, of the uh, gloss and micro model and you replace the parameter nu by the parameter estimated in a Bayesian manner, then you get that uh, uh, the linear behavior, the initial linear behavior corresponds to when this uh, uh, estimate is essentially equal to nu bar. Then uh, you have a square root law. And, uh, uh, and then when the order finishes, uh, then uh, you go back to the equilibrium. Now, uh, actually, um, so all these dynamics uh, happens uh, in a regime uh, uh, after a time, which is much, much shorter than the time it would take uh, uh, to, um, to the market maker to figure out what is the real value of new. Okay? This means uh, that this is, uh, say, this is really uh, all, uh, um, let's say, varied, all this behavior is all varies into statistical fluctuations. So that, um, uh, so these ma ma meta orders are typically uh, statistically undetectable. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, the empirical analysis that led to these results are really averages over uh, thousands of uh, meta orders uh, I mean, from proprietary uh, data. Okay. Okay. So uh, in the last uh, five minutes. Uh, the other thing uh, I want to tell you the other story, um, which is essentially a uh, um, uh, big sort of big uh, frustration, which I so because. Information is so central in finance, uh, but if you think about it, uh, information theory <laughs> has nothing to, there is no overlap between information theory and the theory of financial market, as far as I know. Okay. So essentially, uh, so the idea is um, that um, I think uh, there should be a tighter link between these two things. And in particular, uh, so one, uh, um, Idea, general idea is that uh, there seem to be a sort of second law of thermodynamics in financial markets. So, it, so second law of thermodynamics tells you that you cannot extract uh, just uh, work for free from a cyclic transformation in a physical system. And the arbitrage hypothesis looks like the the same. Okay. So um, so recently uh, there has been a lot of uh, prof. Uh, prof um, uh, Say of, of new results in, uh, in physics uh, to understand uh, uh, how uh, the second law of thermodynamics generalizes in several ways. Uh, but in particular, you know that um, uh, by this Maxwell Demon example, probably you know this. So that if you have a if you have some information, the microscopic state of the system, then uh, you can extract work from a physical system. Okay. And now we have uh, a, um, results on how much work you can extract. You, you know that the expected uh, amount of work that you can extract cannot be larger than the temperature times the, the amount of information measured in bits. Okay. So the idea is, uh, um, and this is essentially the generalized uh, second law of thermodynamics when you have uh, this, uh, this, uh, um, when, when you have information about the uh, physical system. So the, uh, the question, so the question that we pose is to look, okay, let's take a simple model like the gloss and model, and let's see whether uh, there is the same type of uh, uh, inequality that holds uh, there, not for the worker, but for the gain. So, okay, uh, I have to uh, cut these things very short. So the problem is that you have to define what is the temperature in a, in the in a financial market, and uh, and you have to compute what is the expected gain. Okay, so the expected gain is is simple. 
defining um, um, okay so this I will uh, cut it short but essentially the idea is that what you you can establish a very precise analogy between uh, the gloss and linear model and an information engine that extracts work uh, from uh, one bit of information and you find that uh, the optimal protocol uh, for extracting work uh, and for fixing the price is exactly the same okay which is sort of interesting no? The other thing is that uh, what you find is that if you recast uh, the distribution of uh, transactions uh, in a form uh, typical of statistical mechanics, uh, then uh, uh, you see that you can define a temperature. The temperature only depends on the fraction of informed traders. And uh, it is a say, reasonable dependence in the sense that uh, when there are uh, very few informed traders, the market is very noisy because there are majority of noise traders and the temperature is very high. And when uh, they are all informed traders, uh, the uh, temperature goes to zero. OK, the, you uh, compute the gain in the usual uh, way. And, uh, and essentially, uh, you find that this inequality is true. And actually, um, uh, this took uh, to the mathematical tour de force uh, where we had to ask to a mathematician, Don Zaghi, but actually uh, we found that uh, uh, this is true. So um, let me summarize because I think my time is over, right? And uh, so, um, well, so uh, I think uh, I feel like a contrarian because I'm not trying to solve, <laughs> I mean, physics don't, don't try to solve grand problems but you just uh, uh, have to identify one specific problem for which you can uh, really uh, go deep and 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 and, and really uh, and um, and in this in this case uh, say uh, uh, i think uh, uh, simple models are, are very 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 important i mean this this is our approach so thank you. And uh, yeah, it takes a few questions. Yeah, we take a quick question. Yep. If there are no questions in the room, I, I, I have one because I, I actually, I don't know if I should disclose this. I also come from the physics direction. And I think because what I've learned over the over the years is that the difference is like, okay, physicists like to make these analogies and they build a detailed system. So what the economist would do is he would start playing with it. So to say you do information treatments and you you and you see like what, what happens to the system. Um, I, I don't know if you have done something like this, but that's more like an open question for discussion. Another one I would have is like, is there any amount, any kind of data you would find interesting to kind of further develop this model because now since it's the global financial crisis we have, we have access to much more say micro transaction data level from say different markets particularly the relative market so this could be something yeah yeah so um yeah so i i think uh, in terms of uh approach uh there is not much difference uh, so uh we get uh interesting question then you start playing uh, around uh, and um, uh, you do whatever it takes uh, to understand what is going on then and then uh, uh, maybe the um, yeah maybe uh, what makes in this is that we have uh, say this uh, I mean at least uh, uh, what it means to be satisfied by an explanation. So maybe it's uh, sort of, uh, but um, um, yes, besides this, uh, uh, so the second part was. Uh, well, if you say, if I give you access to more, ah, okay. more data, what would you wish for? This is my more like a general question. Who yes, 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 that's, uh, that's the, the, the big question. So the big question, so in the sense that, um, um, say isolating, uh, so what I tell my students uh, is that Newton law, like uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration, is not great because it relates for 
of force, uh, say, is how broad is full, for example, and that it depends on the mass and uh, this way and on. But essentially, because uh, uh, it tells you it doesn't depend on many, many things. It doesn't depend on the color of the object. All colors, color objects pull the same. Uh, it doesn't depend on the shape. Uh, so, so it, it's really finding uh, um, quantities which are uh, related uh, by, uh, so uh, that can be explained by models with few parameters. Okay, that do not depend on, on many, many things. And this is very, very hard in economics. So, and say, studying uh, market microstructure is, is, a, is a case where, where you really go to the very high frequency regime where uh, um, the, yeah, so, so we are dominated by noise and, and there are very, very few relevant variables. Okay, and this is why you can have, uh, say, simple models can have. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's accessible. Yeah. Move over the notes. Yeah. We had one question at the back, and then or two. We try to. Um, Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. And my question is a little bit existential. Um, I also work with uh, statistical uh, physics in in applied in, in economics, and but mainly applying it to behavioral economics. And uh, one of the main problems that my colleagues see what I when they see my work is that they tend to ask me a little bit more depth in terms of the analogies uh, coming from physics. So for example, what does temperature mean in this context? I mean, obviously it's related to the noisiness of the system, but if you're thinking about a statistical equilibrium, you probably also have a conservation law and so on and so forth. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more towards about that, about you know the relationship between these, these quantities in the context of economics. Did we collect like yeah. the well, Ramakant had one and Giovanni Dosi had one so that we yes, you, you said that the uh, the value of a model is not in the variables it relates, but what it leaves out, for example, and you gave the example of the Newton equation. So in the model you presented, you're basically trying to explain the market move following uh, the execution of an order solely through the size of the order. So in particular, you're leaving out the uh, aggregate supply and demand, the aggregate order flow of the rest of the market. So basically, I'm trying to explain the uh, the impact of my order or the market price move following my order only in terms of the size of my own order. So this seems quite um, problematic to me because if you go back to economics 101, uh, Walras, if you want, uh, the basic tenet is that it's aggregate supply and demand, which uh, uh, you know leads to the price, and it's fluctuations of aggregate supply and demand, which leads to fluctuations of the price. So yes. here, uh, for example, let let me just show you with one example why this equation doesn't make sense. Uh, if if you're a trader and you want to sell a large amount of shares, you know very well that. If you're selling uh, into a market that is uh, where everybody else is selling, it's going to cost you more. It's going to have more impact or it's going to be accompanied by a larger price move than if you sell into a market where everybody's buying. In the second case, you may have no price impact or in fact negative price impact because as you sell, the price is going up. So clearly, uh, the quantity, uh, the size of my order is not the only determinant. It doesn't even determine the sign of the price change. It depends on what the other market participants are doing, unless I'm so big that I dominate the order flow. Yes, so yes. in this case, what you're leaving out seems to be the main determinant. So, yeah. so I, coming back to what you said in the beginning of the talk, this is the one of the most best established uh, things in market market structure. I'm not sure about that because if it's leaving out the main determinant, then basically it okay, seems so, to be a spurious so relation at best. I, I can tell you my understanding. So there is a large amount of uh, universality in this behavior. It doesn't depend on uh, uh, your strategy, trading study, how you liquidate your, your position. Uh, there is a large extent of, of, it doesn't depend also to a large extent on the frequency. So if you look at this empirical law, it depends on the volatility on a certain time scale times the square root of the volume divided of the market order or meta order divided by the volume market volume on the same 
time scale. Okay, and um, so, and I believe that uh, this universality is precisely because uh, all this law is uh, happening uh, in a regime where statistically you cannot detect anything from a single realization. So whatever you do, the market maker will not be able to to uh, to uh, to uh, say understand so or to fit. Okay, so the it's a very very noisy system. Okay. And uh, so in this cloud of, uh, say, statistical uncertainty, uh, there is a lot of uh, universality. So I, I don't know if I, I made the point. So and then, then of course, I mean, yes, you don't have Varas law, et cetera, et cetera, but this is something that has been discussed already by other people, uh, by Giovanni uh, and others. So. I think there was another question, but I would like yeah. to move. But I think I have to ah, answer yeah, okay, to... So yeah, oh, I just wanted to add that. Very short. What about if you did not have fundamentals? Ah, OK, so if you change the modern, everything changes. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, OK, so we, oh, we can discuss later. But about this issue of analogies, analogies are uh, non-trivial. It is not uh, by no mean uh, evident uh, that you can take a, an economic model and you can make an analogy to a physical model. And, and showing that, uh, say, you can define a market temperature in a precise manner that it has a meaning, uh, uh, it's a result, okay? Just calling something uh, temperature because it's related to fluctuation, this is really bad science, okay? So, that's the, okay, I think uh, I, I should go. It's, no, that's not like this. <laughs> No, let's go move to the next speaker, um, Ruben Co Cohen from Maastricht University. No, no, they can't. Don't have my notes. Uh, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for having me and having invited me. It's a real pleasure and actually an honor to be here at, at this kind of event. Um, I, uh, I was thinking, I looked on my CV the other day to find to make sure I think what I said is going to be true. I met Alan first in 1997 at a, at a conference in Lyon. Um, it was one of these with multi panels. He was the chair of the session that I was on. And the session went in, the session finally ended, and we're sitting at the front, and I was packing up my stuff. And Alan turned to me and he said, That was really good. And I thought, Alan Kerman <laughs> loved my, liked my paper. I was basking in the warm glow that came with that feeling, and he, turned, and he followed it up by saying, you were the only one who kept to the time limit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first of many interactions that I've had with Alan over the years, and I'm not exactly sure how we ended up where we, where we did it, but we have now finally written the papers, which is almost finished, the revision's almost finished, Alan. Here we have. OK, and now for something completely different. I'm not going to talk about equilibrium. I'm not going to talk about macroeconomics or microeconomics. I'm not even really going to talk about economics. So why am I presenting this paper? And there are three reasons. One is it's uh, peripherally connected to a project that Alan and I are doing funded by the ANR about South African academia. Alan and a couple of other colleagues and I. Uh, the second is, and I only realized this recently, um, it connects to some of Alan's work, which hasn't gotten much airplay in the last two days, namely his interest of 10 years ago, maybe 15, on the issue of identity. People join groups to identify with other people, and this has economic effects. Well, in South Africa, you didn't join, you were assigned a group at birth, and this had really major economic effects. What's going on now in South Africa, of course, is they haven't done away with the assignment. You're still assigned, but they're trying to change very much the effects of those assignments. So this is sort of this is connected to the sort of what's going on in South Africa is connected to the backside of the coin that Alan was thinking about 10 or 15 years ago. And the, the third the third reason for this was this. Started life as a chapter of Julia's thesis. We were sitting in my office one day talking about it and Alan was there visiting um, and Alan being interested in everything as always was um, well eavesdropping is not a very nice word but he was eavesdropping 
And uh, at one point he piped up and he said, oh, that sounds like it's just a mechanical effect. The thing we were talking about. What? What are you talking about? And he tried to explain it. And he, he couldn't explain it in a way that I could understand. Um, and I thought, well, he's getting old, but he's not that old yet. So there's probably something in it. So the last part of this paper is a direct result of that offhand comment that he made while eavesdropping on Julia and me. OK, so what, what are we talking about? We're talking about South African universities. We know about apartheid. The universities were separated according to race. There were universities for black students and teachers. There were universities for white students and teachers. Um, and at the moment, uh, the moment that apartheid ended in 1994, of course, all that legal apparatus was destroyed. And they started a transformation to get rid of this segregation. Alan's fond of pointing out that the same thing happened in Germany just about the same time, actually, when the reunification, there were a whole lot of professors in Eastern Germany who were exactly what the right word is, tainted. And they didn't want that. They didn't want that professoriate to be tainted. So the solution there was just to fire them. So the East German transformation was done by firing the professors and replacing them with people who weren't tainted. Why could that work? Well, because there were a whole lot of associate professors in Western Germany at the time who were frustrated because their careers would not advance until somebody died. So they were just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting as, with no career perspective. So they were very happy. So it worked because there was a big pool of highly qualified, untainted people who were ready to take the jobs of the people who were tainted and so fired. That's obviously not gonna work in South Africa partially for political reasons, but also partially because there is not this big pool of highly qualified people with the right kind of characteristics that you want to replace that would generate the, um, the transformation that you're after. So in South Africa or other places like that, the transformation has to, act, has to occur by attrition and replacement. Okay, we need the old white guys to retire and they get replaced by new PhDs, homegrown PhDs who have the right racial characteristics. OK, I need a footnote here about language. Uh, in South Africa, it's perfectly acceptable, in effect, de rigueur to talk about race. Uh, there are four races in South Africa, white, black, African, Indian, and colored. And the three are often aggregated. So you get two groups, white and you can't say non-white because that's an apartheid term. Jacques Morris learned that the hard way one day in South Africa. So that's aggregated into the black group. So we're going to talk about two groups, white and black, but for me, the word black means black, African, uh, Indian, and colored. And again, the hardest thing about working in South Africa is the vocabulary changes when during the flight from north to south. And there's vocabulary that you can use here that you can't use there and vice versa. And I got in big trouble the last time I was there because I didn't make the switch. So I might not have made the switch back. So forgive me if I say anything that sounds a little uh, beyond the pale. Okay, so. We need homegrown PhDs. Um, not sure what I'm supposed to say yet because I had some notes that are supposed to be showing here, but they don't show. Um, and they're going to come out of uh, the system in South Africa. Now, PhD graduates have, I was going to say they have two properties. They have lots of properties, but two that are relevant. One is the race and the other is quality. Why do I say quality? Well, anytime someone says, there aren't enough people of type X in occupation Y. The current owners of the current occupants of occupation Y immediately start talking in very serious terms about quality. Yes, yes, we need more people of type X, but we mustn't sacrifice quality. I won't make the obvious cynical remarks. So we need to think about the race of our graduates and the quality of the graduates because this is a legitimate concern, no matter how cynical you are. Um, What's important in the quality of PhD students? Well, one of the things that's important is supervision. We all know this. We've been, most of us have been on both sides of that table and some of us only on one side, but hopefully soon on both sides. The quality of the supervision is very important for the quality of the graduation. And supervisors provide a lot of thing and the one word is mentoring, which captures a lot of it. This turns out there's a ton of literature on the importance of mentoring and what it takes to be a good mentor or a good mentoring relationship. And being unfair to it, essentially what it takes is mutual identification of the mentor and the mentee. Somehow we have to be the same, same goals, same aspirations, same gender, same race, same whatever, so that 
I can understand your problem and you can understand my solution. We have to identify with each other. What that means is for good mentoring relationships, you want them to be the same. So what we're talking about here is homophily. We, if you see mentoring relationships that exhibit a lot of homophily, probably they're working well. That's what that theory on mentoring tells us. But that's a double-edged sword, because if you push hard on that, you're going to reproduce the system. The, in 1994, the best professors were the old white guys. They will have most successful mentoring relationships with the young white guys. The best graduates will be the white guys. They'll be the most attractive to hire, and the system reproduces itself. So this is, as I said, a double-edged sword. So that's what makes it worth talking about homophily in supervision to see how it works and where it is. Now, sociologists talk a lot about homophily. Forgive me for talking about sociology. I know economists don't like to talk about sociology. It's a secret pleasure. Um, and they talk about two, two sources of homophily. There's homophily that is induced. And what that refers to is the fact that um, when I'm trying to hire people, if all the people who apply are tall, if you look inside my firm, you'll see a lot of tall, tall relationships, way more than there should be if you look at the population as an average. Uh, so it can be induced by the pool of people or things from which the relationships are formed. Okay, if that pool is somehow abnormal, then the relationships that come out of that pool will also be abnormal and it could be homophilous. The other type they talk about is choice homophily, and this is what it sounds like. People decide that I'm going to hire a tall person because I like tall people. There are two things to say about that. One is the natural response is, ah, this is sounding like all the isms that we don't like, racism, sexism, and in this crowd, I guess it's, I have to say ageism, um, that we find kind of objectionable. But there's another kind which is kind of innocuous, and it's what Becker and Arrow referred to as statistical discrimination. So I'm hiring people. In the past, I hire small, short people. I hire tall people. And for whatever reason, I observed that the tall people are more productive. Hiring is a shot in the dark. I'll take any signal that I can get. So in my firm, tall people have been successful. So if you're tall, then you're like, that's just statistical discrimination. That's kind of discrimination. It is in some sense innocuous. At least it doesn't have the moral overtones that the other stuff does. OK, why is this important? Well, if you're interested as a policymaker in the homophily that you see somewhere, how you respond will depend on whether it's induced or whether it's choice. They ask for different kinds of responses from the policy. Method. So it might be nice to be able to disentangle what we observe. Is it induced just because, well, to work on our prejudices, all the nursing students are female and all the engineering students are male? That's different than saying engineering professors refuse to supervise females. Very different things. OK, can it be disentangled? Well, much to my surprise, there's very little empirical work that tries to do this. And this is one of the things that we do in this paper. And we do it by looking at the system at different levels of aggregation. OK, I'm not exactly sure what's coming next. OK, so here are the big three questions. Do we observe homophily in student supervision? Of course we do. We're talking about human beings. So the answer to the first one is obviously yes. Is it induced or is it choice? And are there patterns over time? So those are the three things that I'm aiming at addressing in this paper. Okay, so homophily, when you observe a situation and you think there's homophily, it's because you have the wrong numbers of relationships. So in somehow the expected, sorry, the observed relationships are different from the expected relationships in the sense that the same, there are too many same type relationships. Too many, not in any moral sense or pejorative sense, but in a statistical sense. So if people are gender blind, what's the probability of seeing a female student and a female professor? Well, you pull a student, what's the probability that that student is female? You pull a professor, what's the probability that that's a female? Multiply those two numbers and that will give you how many of these you should see. OK, this is pretty basic stuff. If you see more of those and more of those, then you say, now, uh -huh, there's some homophily going on. So that's the basic intuition about what people talk about. Um, here's, so 
The data that we're talking about come from the National Research Foundation in South Africa. Uh, we have 7,000 supervisors and 80,000 supervisions between 1974 and 2014. And distributed over those, those uh, degrees, the honors degree, for those of you who don't know, is a one-year degree after the bachelor's degree aimed at students who want to do higher degrees. The nice thing about this is that we can identify the students who go on to be professors to, or go on to have research careers. So we can identify this kind of special group of students. OK. Um, what's next? This is what our populations look like. So we have broken it into five periods. The first one is during apartheid. And I should warn you, there are not very many observations here. The next two are before a major reform that took place in the universities right here. And these two have come after. And what you see is what exactly what you would expect to see and what you would hope to see. In the beginning, it's dominated by men. That domination falls both for students and for professors. That domination falls. And by this time, the student population looks like the general population. Not so for the professors, as you would expect. It takes longer, but it's still moving in the right direction. Race is even more severe, of course. In apartheid, there were essentially no black professors doing research and no black students doing higher degrees. The, the gaps here, the 20% and the 10% are mostly Indians, by the way. And you see this changing in the right directions. So this looks like good news for any sort of rough and ready. Okay, back to homophily. Um, the statistic that network people love to talk about is a sortativity, and it's basically a measure of homophily. To what extent do similar nodes have links between them? And it's defined this way. It's just the difference between what you observe in terms of same type relationships and what you would expect if people were assigned to each other at random and normalized to get a nice number between plus and minus one. Now, so the idea is that this term is some kind of good benchmark. And that's nice if you have big numbers where, oh dear, where probabilities are good predictors of what you would see. We don't have big numbers, so instead of using this, we do a permutation test to get some idea of whether that is unlikely or not with random assignment. Okay, I guess I am going to have to skip some stuff. This is just the permutation stuff. So let me jump straight to this. This is kind of an ugly picture. Well, when the grace have disappeared. Okay, let me explain. Let's make some explaining. So we have the five periods on the bottom. Every period has two columns. In my picture, these columns are gray. Every column has two boxes. Each box has a sortativity calculated for, I think, 500 different permutations. Uh, each column has these two boxes. In the top box, when we do the permutations, permutation is taking the professors and randomly assigning the students to them in order and doing that 500 times to get an estimate of what the distribution would look like if people were assigned at random. The top box, we really do assign anybody to anybody. So a physics professor in Cape Town could, in that permutation, supervise a geographer in Limpopo. Okay, so that's treating South Africa as one big thing. In the bottom boxes, we uh, say, okay, come on, a lot of the, a lot of what we're observing in the top boxes is induced. It's induced by geography. Cape Town and Limpopo are far apart, and it's induced by discipline. Physicists don't usually supervise geographers. So in the bottom boxes, we restrict the permutations to being within a department. So physics student in Cape Town could only be supervised by a physics professor in Cape Town. OK, what do we see here? First, of course, the bottom boxes indicate less assortativity than the top boxes. That's reassuring. And it looks like if you take that as a measure of um, homophily, roughly half of the homophily you see is induced by geography or discipline, which is good in a way. Bad. Part of that is there's a significant amount of homophily which is not being induced. It's some kind of choice homophily. Second thing to observe is that 
at least in the first part, the people who go on to be academics. So we restrict attention here to students who go on to be academics. There's less homophily there. What this suggests to me initially anyway is student looks at a professor and says, you're a big shot. Um, it would be really good if you would supervise my thesis. It'll improve the quality of my thesis and improve my career prospects. So I'm willing to overlook the fact that you're the wrong race. The same thing on the professor's side. So there may be some trade off between um, preference for race and preference for quality. What is distressing about this is that these numbers are increasing over time. This does not look like a progression towards Mandela's rainbow nation. This looks like people are becoming more entrenched in some kind of racial uh, prejudgment. And that's bad news. It seems to be bad news. And this is the moment at which Alan piped up and said, oh, maybe it's just mechanical. Probably it's just mechanical by the way assortativity is defined. And he said, I think, given the definition, what you will find is assortativity mechanically increases as you increase the size of the smaller population. That's the thing that he said that I couldn't understand. Well, as you might expect, he was right. Um, and you can show it analytically fairly simply just by doing a bunch of substitutions and some calculus. Um, this, this is what he said. And I'm not going to show you the calculus. I'm going to show you a little agent-based model. Little. All the agent based because it has agents in it. And the idea is we start here with a population of white students and white professors and slowly add black students and black professors. Everyone has an idiosyncratic homophily, which means with some probability, I will refuse to accept a person who's the wrong color. And everyone has a different one. And so the way we do it is you take the population in some period, draw a student, draw a professor and say, well, are you two guys willing to work together? If they say yes, we take them out and put them down. If, we, if they say no, we put the professor back, draw another one, say, are you two guys willing to work together? Keep doing that until we get a match. And, take them out. and then when we have everyone match students and professors, we calculate a sort of activity using that, the uh, definition I just showed you, and this is what you get. So we start with no black students and professors. As we introduce them, the sortativity as measured rises rapidly and then slowly decreases. The peak, it's obvious when you, when you think about it, is when the two populations are the same size, as many blacks as whites, because then you have the process in reverse, of course. No. Yeah. Um, and so this thing that we just saw, maybe it's bad news, maybe it's people becoming more racist, but maybe it's good news in the fact that what we're seeing here is the introduction of blacks into a formerly white system. Okay, perfect, I made it. We did the same thing with gender. I'll just show you quickly the gender picture. Not much change. The numbers are lower, which makes sense because universities were segregated according to race, but they weren't segregated according to gender. So there will, you would expect to see a lot less here. And, and no, no big patterns uh, the way there were in the other one. Okay, so the end. Yes, some awfully exist in PhD supervision, of course, that's no big surprise. And at least half of it, at least as measured, is induced by geography and discipline. But there is some that doesn't seem to be induced in that way. Race-based homophily is much more severe than gender-based. The latter is not really changing over time. It, statistically, it is decreasing, but not very fast. Um, race-based homophily, as measured by assortativity, does seem to be getting much worse. But, Herman is right, this could just be a happy sign of a changing population. What we didn't ask, and what should be asked, so that induced, the fact that a lot of the homophily is induced means there's a pre-sorting. People are not assigning themselves to universities in, in a random way. They're selecting universities which has a correlation, I don't know if it's causal, has a correlation with race. So if you're black, you're more likely to go to Port Hare. 
If you're white, you're more likely to go to Stellenbosch. And that's happening a lot. That's all the that's a lot of the inducement. Of course, there's also a disciplinary inducement. There do tend to be more female nurses than male nurses. There do tend to be more male engineers than female engineers. So where is this pre-entry sorting coming from? And should we care about it? Thank you. Thank you. Of minutes for questions. Which one of your the, the induced um, or the choice based? Which one is related to what you would call preferences? Choice. The choice. The choice. So did you see? Did, I mean, the different things. So did you see choice be, being changed or like preference change? Well. That's a good question. Um, we did see assortativity changing, and assortativity when we remove a lot of the induced to, uh, induced um, homophily by restricting to departments and locations. We haven't re removed it all, of course, because within a physics department you have theorists and empiricists, and one is not likely to supervise the other. Of course, that's the same in every department. Um, so we haven't in, removed all of the disciplinary source of the in, in disciplinary. That's the word induction. That doesn't sound like the right word. Induced by discipline, um, but we've re removed a lot of it. But even so, and especially with the um, uh, future academics, we see that measure rising, which suggests that things are getting worse in terms of racial attitudes. Uh, but maybe not. Go ahead. Well, um, uh, we studied this problem. How to distinguish the two? I mean, uh, say induced or opportunity based yeah. homophily and choice. And the idea is that if you look at different universities, you will have a, a distribution of sizes. And then uh, you expect that if there is only choice homophily, then the smaller, the, 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 the homophily is proportional to the size. So well, you, you, you should get that that the, the slope goes to zero. Yeah. If instead you, you get that the, 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 I mean the, the homophily does not go to zero, there's a finite intercept, then that is opportunity or induced homophily. That's a very good observation. I hadn't thought of that. Yes, it's not quite, homophily is not quite linear in um, assortativity, but it's, Monotonic with this, with this. So, yes, so, so this you see, especially for minority groups. Yeah. When, when yeah. you have small groups. Yes. Yeah. So you're, so you're right. When there's this, the smaller group is smaller. There should be. Yeah. Ah, that's a good. Thank you. Very useful. Thanks. Uh, two questions. On, on the one hand, to what extent are you just swapping homophily for? racism and sexism and you have a nice word which kind of um, allows you to make it more seem more normal or acceptable and the the second question is the distinction between induced and choice um why i didn't quite get the the point of it or, or, or where you take it in a sense of to have different policy conclusions or or, or kind of or what is the what, what do we learn because to some extent i would say um, a different terminology is direct or indirect discrimination or, or, or racism, right? If, if there are more white students go to the better university, and so then in that university, we say people cannot, um, a, 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 a black student cannot find a, a similar, uh, same race um, supervisor, then it's at the, end, at the end of the day still a, a, a huge problem, right? Because, um, but not at the department level, but at the, at the institutional level. So, so what is really the point of making this distinction? Um, do, you, do you have different policy conclusions or, or um, to what extent are we a little bit sugarcoating? Okay. Um, imagine that the professoriate is fixed and what happens is students come in and study and then graduate. You can think of this as the process. The student decides where to go to university, ends up in a department and then finds a supervisor. We observe homophily in supervisions. It could start at 
it could arise in two different places in that process. It could be that the student only picks departments for whatever reason um, that are the same as him or her. In that case, that would be induced homophily because when the professors start looking for students to graduate uh, to supervise, they can only pick the ones that are in their department. And if all my if all the students in my department are male, it's going to look pretty homophilous, but it, you know, I could be totally indifferent with regard to sex. Um, so it, that could be the place where it emerges. It could also be that inside the department, we have a bunch of old white professors who'd really feel more comfortable supervising white men than white women or black women or whatever. And it locates it at the source is at a different point in the process. Depending on whether it's at one point or the other, you would try to intervene in very different ways. It's at the beginning, you would try to encourage people to go to universities that they wouldn't naturally want to go to somehow. And then they're in the department and then the professors can pick and choose. If that's not happening, but it's happening inside the department, it's not, frankly, it's not obvious to me what to do. Um, unless it's a statistical thing. If it's statistical discrimination, then there are things you can do by making better information better, sorry, better information available about the qualities of students and so on and so forth. If it's racism or sexism or ageism, um, that's a lot tougher not to crack. So it's, one is it's an interesting puzzle about how do you separate these two sources of homophily. The other is it, re it really does have different policy implications where you where you would want to intervene depending on which one you're talking about. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hey, thank you. One, one there. Um, I, I there are many questions. I mean, I, I because I think we were okay. out of That's time, it. so I would you're the boss. Be, uh, I, I, I don't try to be too much. Before. We go to the last speak of the session, Pierre Andres, um, LSE, F Future Oxford um, on economic complexity and stranded nations. Well, hopefully not so. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're seeing an example of socially embedded preferences. If everyone in your session wants to sit, you want to sit, otherwise you understand. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to say I'm honored to be here. Um, I first met Alan a few years ago at the University of Glasgow, where he was giving a lecture um, at a conference organized by the Rethinking Economic Society there. And he started by talking about uh, the way that bees organize themselves in the beehive. And so the paper that I'm going to present today looks more at something akin to how the structure of the beehive overall evolves over time and what this implies in the context of the transition to a net zero economy. And this is a joint work with Penny Mealy, Niels Handler, and Sam van Kause. So I'm going to start by saying the transition to a net zero economy is going to create winners and losers. If you are a firm that sells solar panels, you probably think it's great. But if you sell coal or burn coal, um, you're not going to have uh, such a great time with it. And what we do in this paper is uh, we look at this from the perspective of uh, countries and we develop a list of traded products that we think are, go are likely to decline in terms of demand um, for them globally if we are to transition to a net zero economy. And this is things like coal, oil, gas, internal combustion engines. Um, and we have a short and a long list where the long list also includes uh, beef and, and mutton. Um, and then we we draw on the so-called product space approach uh, to develop measures of country level lock in to these kinds of sectors, as well as how easy we think it is likely to be for those countries to move their productive capabilities out of those sectors and into other ones that are more climate compatible. And um, what we show is that for most countries, even the ones that export a lot of brown products, that are more technologically sophisticated, it could be potentially quite easy to make this transition. Um, but highly resource dependent ones uh, that export a small number of uh, very non sophisticated brown products are going to have quite a hard time. 
Um, and so we make three main contributions in this paper. Uh, one is that we develop this, um, these measures of country level transition risks that are based on trade data. Uh, we also developed the list of brand products that we think are likely to decline. Um, and uh, what our results show, I feel, is that um, related diversification approaches to industrial development are going to be quite limited in this context. So just to give some background over the methodologies that we draw on, um, evolutionary economic geography and complexity approaches in this space have shown that uh, industrial development is highly path dependent. So regions and countries are much more likely to move into new sectors and products that are very similar to what they're already good at. And this is quite intuitive. If we think about an individual learning, um, if I know Italian is going to be easier to learn Spanish, but maybe not Russian. Um, yeah. And um, there is evidence that unrelated diversification is much more difficult to achieve and it is more likely if the country's productive structure is, is more complex. So specifically we draw on the product space approach uh, developed by Hidalgo and, and Hausmann and others uh, where we construct a network of traded products based on how frequently these products are co-exported with um, so-called revealed technological, revealed comparative advantage. And uh, doing this, we can construct a network of products where some are in a quite a dense core area and others are more peripheral. And um, it tends to be the case that if you specialize in the core, you'll find it more easy to uh, diversify into other areas of the product space because there's more nearby uh, opportunities. Um, also, we draw on the complexity indices developed in, in the same um, methodology. So this is the idea that uh, there's an economic complexity index which applies to countries and a product complexity which applies to products. More complex countries tend to export more, pro more complex products which tend to be more technologically sophisticated and those countries tend to be wealthier, have higher income and grow faster. Now, uh, the path dependency of industrial development that I have uh, spoken about implies that the ability of a country or region to take advantage of new opportunities in a green economy like solar panels or wind turbines or batteries uh, will depend on uh, their existing productive capabilities and how similar those capabilities are to these new technologies. And uh, so there has been some work in, um, in this space by some of my co-authors and specifically, uh, we are going to build on uh, Mili and Tatelboim 2020, uh, who build on the product space approach to develop indicators of country level uh, green complexity and green complexity potential. And what they show is that Germany, for example, has, has held the highest ranking green complexity index uh, throughout the entire study period. Uh, but China also has increased its green competitiveness quite drastically. And just if I may engage in some self-promotion here, uh, Penny and I developed an interactive web tool called the Green Transition Navigator, where we uh, visualize these measures of green competitiveness and green complexity. And we're working on including the measures that I'm going to introduce today uh, in this tool as well. And so you can play around with it and kind of see where each country uh, that reports trade data stands on these kinds of metrics. So what I'm going to talk about today is, well, path dependency means that we can say something about which countries are likely to be competitive in new green technologies. Uh, it also creates this potential for other countries to get locked in to industries that are on the decline. So if we mitigate, if we want to mitigate climate change, a lot of fossil fuel reserves have to be stranded. Um, and the stranded assets literature focuses uh, a lot on like um, carbon lock-in through uh, physical infrastructure and that kind of thing and the risks to, to firms. Um, but these risks also in, extend to uh, whole countries and people whose jobs are in the fossil fuel industries and these kinds of things. So to go into uh, what we actually do, we draw on trade data from the Bachi database, which is 
kind of like a, a cleaner version of UN Comtrade where uh, import and export reports are harmonized. And uh, we use a product at the six digit level averaged over five year periods to avoid our analysis being skewed by short term fluctuations in trade. And um, with that, we get a panel of five distinct periods starting in 1996 and ending in 2020. Um, the green competitiveness literature has drawn on a trade and a list of products that came out of trade negotiations on an environmental trade agreement, uh, but we don't have uh, a list like that. So we came up with our own based on keywords and consulting some some other experts. And yeah, it's it's a lot of fossil fuel related products because we think that they're these are not very contentious in this context. What are the measures that we compute? So the first is a revealed comparative advantage, which is basically an index of whether a country exports more or less than a global average of a product. And if it's more, so greater than one, uh, then we assume that this country must be unusually good at making this product. If it's less than one, then the country is not very good at making this product. Uh, and then based on that, we can compute product to product proximity, which is uh, the probability that a country will competitively export one product given that it exports the other. Uh, and based on that product to country proximity, which is um, the average proximity of a product to the products that the country is competitive in. And finally, the product complexity index, which I've mentioned before. And uh, yeah, I should mention as well that these measures are very agnostic to the underlying mechanisms. Um, which may differ in different contexts, but we can think of them as things like the traditional Marshallian agglomeration economies, knowledge spillovers, input output linkages and labor market polling. Uh, just quickly, the green complexity index that was introduced in a previous paper by Penny, it's it's kind of like a complexity weighted count of green products that the country is competitive in. Um, and it's high, highly correlated with diversity, uh, which is in this context, the number of products that a country is, is competitive in. And we then construct two index indices of Brown lock-in. First, our baseline measure, which is the Brown lock-in index. And we take a slightly different approach because of the fact that many countries that, ex that are hydrocarbon exporters, they are very low in diversity overall, including Brown diversity. Um, and so we basically take the share of each brown product in total country exports times um, like the inverse, something like the inverse of the PCI. So giving a larger weight to products that are low in complexity. And then we also uh, compute the so-called brown complexity index, which is exactly the same as the green complexity index, except uh, that um, we do it with brown products and not green ones. But we also want to know, OK, you're locked in or not locked in. If you're locked in, how easy is it going to be to transition into um, more climate compatible areas of comparative advantage? And in order to do that, we could just look at the country's proximity to products that aren't going to decline. But because we think that um, productive capabilities are heterogeneous, you might be a country that is quite close to some non brown or even green products. But maybe part of your economy is specialized in these brown products and those workers and that capital and that know-how um, can't move into these new opportunities, even if other parts of your of your economy can, if that makes sense. So because of this, we um, compute what we call the product transition outlook, where we um, look at the products, uh, brown products, proximity, uh, to non-brown products compared to its proximity to any other product. And then based on this, we compute the country transition outlook, which is going to be the um, average transition outlook of brown products that it is competitive in. Uh, what do we find? So this is my favorite part of the paper. It's uh, the product space network. So this is the network of all traded products at the HS6 um, digit level. And um, to the left, you see kind of like a general color coding of these products by whether they're textiles or 
uh, vegetable products or machinery or chemicals. And on to the right, you see them colored by whether they're green or brown or uncategorized if they're neither green nor brown. Um, and the nodes are sized by trade volume. And so two of the most striking things I think from this graph is firstly that crude oil and refined oil are the largest, uh, the most important products in terms of global trade volume currently. So these are the sort of two big brown dots that you see here. This is refined oil and this is crude oil, which uh, brings me to the other point, which is that you can see here what I said earlier about the core and the periphery. So crude oil is very peripheral. It's not close to anything, especially not anything that isn't another, you know, coal or something like that. Uh, whereas refined oil is like more in the core and it's close to some uncategorized things. So with that, we can already infer that perhaps countries that refine their own oil might have some more sophisticated know-how that could enable them to start doing other things. Whereas countries that export a lot of crude, maybe not. And yeah, and then also we have things like cars that are obviously close to electric cars and, and those aren't going to be big issues probably. What else can we say about um, brown products? Um, a lot of them actually tend to be quite a lot closer to green products than the average product, which is interesting. Um, and on average, they're not more or less complex than the average traded product. Unlike green products, which do tend to be more complex. Uh, here you see the ranking of uh, brown lock-in index and brown complexity index, very different. So um, brown lock-in index, you have you know, major oil exporters like Iraq, uh, but um, and the brown complexity index, you have a lot of the kind of usual suspects also in green complexity, like the US and Germany and Japan. Not China, interestingly, which is quite high now on green complexity. Uh, this is the scatter plot of brown complexity index versus brown locket index, and we see they're negatively correlated. We also see that uh, countries that rank highly on the brown complexity index tend to be high income countries, whereas for brown locket index, it's very mixed. And the brown complexity index and the green complexity index are positively correlated, not perfectly by any means, but um, countries that make a lot of sophisticated green stuff also make a lot of sophisticated brown stuff um, in general. Um, yes, what else? Um, the green transition outlook is, so countries that are high in VLI tend to have like a low um, transition outlook. Um, countries that are high in BCI also have a low overall transition outlook, but they tend to have a higher green transition outlook. And if they have a higher green transition outlook, they tend to um, reduce their BCI in the future. And if they have a higher um, overall transition outlook, they tend to reduce their BLI in the future. So countries that are very locked into a few not very sophisticated brown products, they move into kind of general stuff, whereas the ones that are exporting a lot of um, quite sophisticated brown stuff, they are moving into green stuff. It's what we five minutes. OK, uh, we also kind of look at some potentially relevant correlates like oil vents and um, CO2 emissions. Um, yes, I already said this. Uh, so what does this Colors, uh, countries that are very locked in, are very locked in. They don't have any nearby or many nearby diversification opportunities. And uh, when they do reduce their VLI, it's often because they reduce uh, their reliance on coal or crude oil, but then they start exporting other things like natural gas or unrelated things. Um, and we give the example of the United Arab Emirates, which reduced its VLI rank over the period we look at. Uh, but also increased its share of refined oil and kind of random stuff like diamonds and metals and gold. There are some ideas that, um, so some say that these kinds of countries, they should move into hydrogen, ammonia or CCS. And we see a little bit of evidence of that in the data, even though that's kind of a, a future thing that we might not be able to observe empirically that well. 
but overall, we would say that what this shows is that the related diversification approaches are very limited. And what we need is path breaking diversification, and that's hard because what the evolutionary economic geography literature has shown mostly is that development, industrial development is path dependent, but we know much less about what actually enables um, path breaking uh, development. So that's an area for future research. Um, yeah, that's just a summary. We developed this list of brown traded products. We uh, build on the product space approach developed by Hidalgo and Hausmann. And we find that countries that export a lot of complex brown stuff will find it fairly easy, easy to transition, whereas the ones that rely on a few low complexity brown products are in trouble. Thanks very much. And this is just to say our, the accepted manuscript version of our paper is available to read if you're interested. Thank you. Two questions. Okay, let me kick off again. Um, I mean, I, I fully buy your story and I think it's really, really great work. I think the probably one of the obvious questions, and I, I, don't, I know that's a little bit of a dirty word by now here, is what about, say, general equilibrium effects here? So because when 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 say China goes through the ranks of like green complexity, mm -hmm. but given that everything is based on comparative like say advantage, so have you thought about like how to model kind of or is it possible in this framework to have you looked at like dynamic transitions and say because that one country gains in some exports, some other country may lose because the share um, the shares need to move. And of course, similar questions would also apply to. Uh, to more complex questions like uh, policy interventions and like how can I make a country move in the first place? So the first thing I would say is that um, even if, if a country gains in terms of sh export share uh, or overall export, that doesn't necessarily mean that another country will lose if overall demand for this product is going to rise, right? So we're going to need to need a lot more solar panels, a lot more wind turbines, a lot more batteries. Uh, so it, in that sense, it's not a zero sum game. Um, in terms of revealed comparative advantage, of course, that's a bit different because we're looking at the at the global average. Uh, and but we could then say with that, well, is that actually such a useful indicator? Which is, I mean, we uh, like it for its empirical properties, I guess. Uh, general equilibrium. I um, haven't really thought about that much in this context. I it's more about how do things change, right? It's like what can we say about the way that countries um, comparative advantages and trade change over time, and and uh, some of that will be, especially when it comes to kind of natural resources, it will be just sort of god given if we want to put that like it's like fundamental endowments you I, you have oil or you don't have oil but i think what this tells us is maybe that if you have oil that's not such a great thing in all cases um because learning how to make cars that's something you learn that's not something that's just given to you so uh in that sense we treat comparative advantage not as something that's necessarily just given but as something that changes over time in this path dependent way. And yes, the, the thing that um, is maybe more contentious is if you're on kind of a bad path, how do, how do you change it? And I, I think the answer is probably industrial policy, but I'm not going to be so brave as to prescribe a particular one. Yeah. Because I think that's, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, this is comes back always to a story. Uh, this is Ricardo Hausmann, of course, looms large here. And uh, it always strikes me that there are examples where you would think that his theory of closeness in some sense, we are very close to. For example, let's take Finland as a, a nice example, all into timber and stuff like that. And suddenly Nokia springs up, but you know, the high tech, society and people are well educated in Finland and so forth, but nevertheless that's a jump there. And I think he doesn't really account for the fact that those jumps do happen 
That's uh, one observation. And the other observation is I'm always a little bit worried about these measures that you use about um, uh, how brown things are or how green things are. For example, Germany gets good notes for uh, being moving into renewables, being green. But who was the country who voted against um, allowing, uh, forbidding the uh, production of uh, cars, uh, in, internal combustion cars? Uh, I think it was by 2030, but I, I forgot exactly. But uh, anyway, the one country that said, well, no, that's you know not going to be acceptable to us was Germany. So there's a, a sort of duality here, just the same as you find um, people with a huge amount of publicity from Aramco, because Aramco found out that you could put um, a carbon into concrete and have much better concrete, right? But you still have to produce it to put it there. You know? Maybe you don't want it there. So uh, these measures of one, uh, is one question. And the other thing is you do have countries which seem to be exceptions, usually for political reasons, but how would you react to that? So firstly, I completely agree about the big jumps. I think that's a big knowledge gap. There are, you know, one or two papers, or like there are some papers that try to look at this and in, in like particular contexts and then suggest that uh, foreign direct investment can help and these kinds of things to like learn. Um, but yes, I, I think that's really the interesting question, right? Like what can we say about how to achieve these kinds of jumps? Um, the other thing about the greenness and brownness, so this is not a value judgment at all, especially since uh, we're looking at the production side and the export side, right? So you can be China and like export all of the world's or 90% of the world's solar panels, but still burn a lot of coal internally. Uh, or but same goes for Germany. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the greenness or brownness it's in these measures it's not at all about your internal production processes and whether these are clean or not but it's just about whether you as a country as an exporter will benefit from more demand for these green products or will lose out from less demand for these brown products and what we did see is that to get to your example of Germany, Germany is has the highest green complexity index, but also has one of the highest brown complexity indices, right? So it, yes, it it was one of the first to kind of create a lot of demand for solar and, and make these the make solar panels perhaps, but also uh, produces a lot of cars and was kind of slow to move into electric vehicles. So one does not necessarily preclude the other, I would say. And what was the last question about um, exceptions? Are you thinking about Norway or you said something about my last question? <laughs> yeah, uh, was... politics. Sorry. politics, 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 politics. Right. Yes, of course, that's the other question. That, um, and uh, so-called greenwashing and so forth. Uh, the idea that uh, that was about the measures. These measures are somehow very susceptible to being uh, change, you know, companies can explain how green they are, but then when you look at what they're actually doing, they're investing heavily still in prospecting for the brown stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's something which is difficult to get around. I guess that's a, that's a problem of political power too. Um, yes, so I would say with these measures, they're based on exports, right? So there's no greenwashing as such. This is just what does the country export? Um, but I I take it when you say companies and their greenness, do you mean like ESG and that kind of these kinds of metrics, environmental and social governance? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree that there's a lot of greenwashing in that. And um, but, but I think that's that's a slightly different issue because these are different metrics. Okay. Yeah. Take one more question here. So. I like your paper, and uh, I think uh, this is the, the most that you can do with these measures. Um, I mean, I've been a sort of consultant in the project, uh, in a project, an ongoing project with Pietro Nero et al. You know that the Pietro Nero measure, the Fermi measure, and uh, 
the Hidalgo et al. measure, I mean, they had long fight, but this is another matter. Uh, <clears throat> the, I have problems that are similar to, to Alan on the use of uh, uh, really comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, because, for example, if you have uh, a country that progresses in everything, then it is not captured by the reveal comparative advantage, other things being equal, or a country that decreases in everything, this is not captured either. Um, I mean, you would like to have, uh, I know it's more difficult because statistics on production are much more uh, gross, but there is not such an isomorphism between the production structure and the extra structure. And the, and the other point is that the near, nearness as measured by the co-occurrence of two comparative advantages mm -hmm. might not have, might have little to do either with technology or with production. And I mean, this is, this is not a critique to you, but it's the critique to the use of the limitation of the measure. Yeah, yeah, uh, I point well taken. It's definitely true that, um, first of all, reveal competitive advantage, yes, it's based on the average export, right? So if you, if the share of a product in your exports um, stays the same, even though overall you make much more of it, it's not going to affect their comparative advantage. However, I would say that I would be surprised if that ever happened. Like, I would expect that as you, um, especially as you as a country kind of move into more technologically advanced products, uh, like your agricultural exports aren't going to increase at the, at the same rate, right? So um, while that is technically true, I, I would say that uh, I, I think it can still tell us something useful. Um, and the nice thing about revealed comparative advantage, as opposed to just looking at export shares, you know, like if you just look at the export share, some countries just, they're much bigger. So naturally they will have like a larger share of global exports. Um, they will to normalize more. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of the co-occurrence based on revealed comparative advantage, sometimes it's a bit random. That is true. <laughs> uh, but on average, it tends to work well in the sense that if you then look at the correlation, like if you look at the proximity of a product to the country uh, based on these measures and the probability that this country will develop a comparative advantage in the future, that is a very strong empirical relationship, right? So we're kind of saying, yes, we don't really know what underlies it in each case. And in some cases, maybe it's random, but on average, it works on average, it works quite well. Having said that, some of the newer papers um, like by um, Neil Deerham and O'Cleary look at this in a more directional way. They have this paper where they look at the so-called product ecosystem, where they look at if you start exporting this product, which other products have to have been there before, which is like um, a bit more advanced, perhaps, than this basic measure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, I think this was a great section session on um, some different and new approaches one 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 can take, and I think we learned a lot. Um, before we go to the closing remarks, I think I wanted to give one um, kind of thought from, from from my side working at a policy institution but of course speaking for my myself i mean we talked a lot about some of us about like how invested academia is in like certain conventional approaches and how, how hard it's then to move out of a certain equilibrium um and i would say the same applies to of course governments and and, and policy institutions because there has been a lot of investment over decades, I would say, of certain type of models, sets, group, knowledge which has been accumulated. And I think of just saying something is better than something else is 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 probably not won't won't change everything immediately. I think one has to think about like a constructive way how you could use different models to discuss have the kind of same same discussion, for example, about policy debates. And once you start ideally running things next to each other, then you can make up your mind 
what is more useful under kind of what conditions and and I think that's that's probably a way we should go and I stop here. Um, great stuff and um, we have closing remarks by Mary Morgan from LSE and Angus and, and Alan. So should we ch be sharing? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, thanks. OK, welcome to the final session summing up. So bringing together, um, gosh, Mary's got a lot of notes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, some key findings uh, from the last day and a half and uh, Mary's going to start and I think speak for five minutes and I will do I will keep to my five minutes and then we've got a slightly longer period uh, for Alan to give his reflections and perhaps thoughts towards the future. So Mary, if you're yeah, ready. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to to be part of this and to be part of this closing remarks. Um, I can't remember when I first met Alan, but I, my first real sense of Alan was reading the wonderful paper on uh, the representative agent. Um, I should explain that my first job, my first proper job was as a research assistant to an economist before I did my first degree. So I had no economics and I went to work for Citibank at the point the international financial system collapsed. So for two years I was working for an economist who was trying to, where everyone was trying to figure out how the international financial system was going to work given that there were no fixed exchange rates. And, and then I went to LSE and I learned all this core cool stuff about the Walrasian general equilibrium. And I thought, I don't understand this. I don't live in that world. And then I read, read this wonderful paper and I thought, ah, oh, yes. OK, now I see the world the economic world really does look very strange because it's a completely different kind of world. So it was a wonderful paper. And I think, you know, a lot of his papers open up uh, when they critique, they also open up so much. And I think that's the wonderful thing um, about the, the brilliant writing that, which critiques, but also opens up and gives us curiosity. Um, and at the other, on the other hand, his, his work on things like the you know, fish markets and so forth, where we, he, as you said earlier, we want to start with what we know. And I think that that's an equally valid point. I want to say a couple of things about models because that's been a really important part of the discussions. Um, and this is something that I've worked a lot on thinking about um, how economic models uh, work. I'm a historian and philosopher of economics and I've spent 15 odd years thinking about models and trying to figure out the mathematical kinds of models, um, what they're doing for us. And I think we had already uh, Rama talking about uh, box and models being wrong. And I think earlier on we had um, uh, Duan Farmer talking about a model being right. And both of those seem to me a very odd construction. I mean, if one has a toy card and picks it up, is this right or wrong? I mean, it, it's sort of, is it a good model for certain kinds of purposes? And I think um, it's really one of the interesting things that I was learning about when I thought about models is we don't really have in economics good criteria for models if they're not our statistical models. If we have statistical models, we have all sorts of criteria from statistics. And so we have these criteria which let us say things like the model can explain because we've inherited these things from statistics about what it means to explain. But a model that we explain with statistical means isn't, doesn't give us necessarily a good economic explanation of what's going on. And I think that's a really important distinction and we haven't necessarily got it right in um, discussing our mathematical models. So lots of times people were talking about models explaining here today. We're talking about not statistical work. Um, from the point of view of a philosopher of science, there's only two ways to explain things. Either, as in some of physics, you have initial conditions and general laws and that enables you to explain something. A more recent work in philosophy of science says actually no, you know, it's much simpler than that. You can explain something if you can tell us the answer to why, you know, a kind of straightforwardly common sense version of explanation. And of course, it's actually really difficult to use a mathematical model or to use, you know, we have mathematic models, we have all sorts of models, diagrammatic ones, um, agent based models, and they all have different kinds of frameworks and formulations. And if we're saying, can they explain things why? I think we're probably talking most of the time here in terms not that they have an explanation, which is exactly why something happens any more than the toy car explains something about a real car. But I think there are all sorts of interesting ways which um, uh, 
people have been using, which is, is it consistent with the things we know? So thinking about criteria, the a kind of a bad explanation, is it consistent with the things we know? Does it offer plausible accounts of the things we know? Does it give us in insight to some, some phenomena we be, might have been thinking about? So I think these lesser ambitions are actually really helpful when we think about what our models are doing, but they always come back to what is the purpose of the model? What are we trying to give an account of? Uh, the model car is no explanation for anything on its own. What are we asking with this model? Um, is it useful for this purpose or that purpose? So the question and the purpose then give us these access to these possible sort of criteria uh, that we might have for models. And I think one of the things I have strong sense from Alan's work is this instinct about asking questions which are interesting and then getting really in good insight from the models or the um, applied work into um, the usefulness of the model for that for answering those questions about those phenomena. So I think that's one of the things that I've really taken from uh, reading Alan's work over the years. So I'd like to thank you for all that insight I've got from your work. And that's uh, my five minutes. I hope it wasn't over. Perfect. No, it was excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. So I have um, <clears throat> five points I'd like to make. One of them I think came up last night, which um, Alan hinted at. Uh, so the five points. Um, they, they really stem from rebuilding macroeconomics is a, a very interdisciplinary um, uh, network. So the management group was outnumbered in terms of economists. There was more non-economists than economists. Um, so we took interdisciplinary very much to heart. And uh, the first thing we'd say is uncertainty. And, um, you know, if you can define economics as decision making in well-defined circumstances, that's pretty limiting. Uh, it was brought up last night. Somebody said, you know, uncertainty, we always treat it like an epsilon in a regression. It's the sort of bit that your model didn't explain. But I think that's really the trivial part of it. Uh, the much bigger cost is we ignore how people actually do behave in ill-defined circumstances, which after all, we face every day. This is not kind of what once in 10 years, it's all of the time. We leave those questions outside because of our unwillingness to try and uh, grapple with this uncertainty element. And nothing's sort of clearer than this when Keynes in 37 had this famous quote in his, in his paper, we just don't know. And everybody always refers to that. And then they never go on to the next sentence, which is really annoying. The next sentence said, but practical, excuse me, men have to make decisions. And then he gives three ways they do it. And one of which is to look at their other, their neighbors and you copy people. So it's about interaction again. So that he already pointed this out. We solve things in, in uncertainty by interacting with other people. It's sort of these, these sort of interactions were very much hinted at by Adam Smith years ago, not in The Wealth of Nations, but in his um, uh, uh, astronomy essay, where he talked about people's psychological disposition for quietness, that when they see a problem, they've got to try and solve it. And they do that either by connecting principles of ideas or connecting principles between people. You talk to people, it's not that hard. We've kind of walked away from all of that. So I think uncertainty is important. Uncertainty brings in the notion of irreversible time. And here we get to the idea that emergence is something we've heard a lot about uh, in the last uh, 36 hours. I think that that is a valid, and I'd be interested to hear Mary's point of view, uh, solution concept to equilibrium. It's an alternative solution concept. Um, we know from Turing that when we have um, uh, uh, interactions that are consecutive, it's very hard to know ex ante whether the system will settle down or just keep cycling. Uh, many other disciplines, not only computer science, but uh, physics, chemistry, social sciences, sociology, they've accepted um, emergence, but we seem not to have done, I think in large part because it seemed to compromise methodological individualism, which is very close to a lot of economists. I'm not sure that has to be the case because emergence can be consistent with individual behavior, but that's not the same thing as being derived from individual behavior. So I think emergence is a legitimate uh, potential uh, solution concept. The third point is fixed preferences. And I think this is a slightly heretical thing to say, but as long as you define you know, economics, the allocation of scarce resources um, with competing um, 
means towards fixed ends, then I don't think you're going to have much scope for thinking about uh, knowledge and innovation and creativity. <clears throat> now, this debate was had in the 1970s by Hirschman and Sen on one side and Stigler and Becker on the other. And it was kind of resolved with the idea that aesthetically models were nicer, they were simple. And that's kind of awkward because at the moment, it is so obvious that when you do Google searches and you turn Sky TV on half an hour later, you will see the products played back to you. That's what they're paid for to influence your preferences. Now we can deny this as long as we want, but the world's quite serious out there and they are influencing your preferences. There's a lot of money going to influence your preferences, not least in the political sphere. So I think that we really have to think carefully about that assumption. Fourth point is how we interact. You know, we tend to sort of say, well, we've got to interact at one level, but we have a whole social structures. We don't just go from individuals to an aggregate. We have different layers in society, different structures. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, this brings in notions of power relations, but also um, uh, something which Doyen Farmer, I think, mentioned um, about in, uh, institutions. It brings institutions back into the realm of, of economics. And we used to have a very long history in this country of great institutions, not least this one, uh, but the BBC and things like that. And we just walked away from any notion that's got anything to do with economics, which I think is a great shame. My final point is what sort of questions should uh, we address? And um, Lenin Savage divided the world into small uh, and large uh, worlds. Small worlds are appropriate for Bayesian um, uh, uh, updating large worlds where I said, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, we just don't know. And I think that it's in the large worlds where some of the methods that we've discussed in the last 36 hours are particularly relevant, not least because I think the methods that we have in the small worlds don't relate to the big world questions, but also because these big world questions, whether it's uh, inequality, uh, climate change, uh, innovation, these are where the sort of the big questions we need to answer as society. And if science is anything, it's about solving problems that society faces. And so I thought the examples that Rob Akalov gave of all of these solutions, yeah, they're very, very important um, uh, situations. And as, in, as economists, we can also do this because these questions are waiting to be answered. And I think these techniques are much more appropriate, much more appropriate for those sort of big world questions where fundamental certainty is uh, inherent in the problems. And so I very much appeal to go towards going that area. I think that means taking ourselves out of our comfort zone to stop thinking that more data will just give us the answers. And if I can take my life in my hands and say, I don't think it is all about information, because information in an uncertain world is not the same as knowledge. It needs to be interpreted. And this is where my question about uh, evolutionary um, psychology came from earlier on and the interdisciplinary aspect. And I think that my final plea is we need to think about epistemology. What do we know about knowledge in order to re really make progress on some of these big, difficult, big world questions, which I think some of Alan's insights actually give us a bit of a handle on trying to answer them. So that's my five points. There was actually six there, I noticed, but thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Angus, and uh, thank everybody for uh, for putting up with me for two days. <laughs> that was a, an awful lot. But um, the one thing, first thing I want to say is that it was all done in a, a spirit of really good humor and so forth, and it was like m much of the stuff I've done in my life has been really good fun. And uh, this doesn't seem to coincide with people's normal impression of economists. And in fact, when um, Ariel Rubinstein was president of the Econometric Society, he had to write his initial address. And he started out by asking a question, why in experiments when people are um, doing things like the ultimatum game and so forth, are econo economic students so much nastier than other students? And he said, is this a question of nasty people going into economics or is it because economics makes you nasty? And uh, so I was just struck by the uh, difference. On the other hand, I, I think we're actually dealing with really important problems and uh, economics touches the uh, lives of so many people and we treat it sometimes in a little bit of a frivolous way. 
I guess because you can't live with sort of with the weight of this on on your shoulders. But um, I, I imagine that um, people who work on cancer, for example, are probably quite nice, um, you know, when they're talking to each other, but they're working on such a dreadful, uh, in, dreadfully important problem that you think this might weigh on, on them. And I think that uh, perhaps sometimes we don't let the uh, consequences of what we're talking about really weigh on us enough. And so I would say that of the things that I really would want to put more weight on is first of all, why do we insist on teaching uh, people about the importance of the individual and how the individual decides when the individual is completely embedded in a society where he's influenced constantly by everybody around him and, and everything that's going on? Then secondly, we already uh, talked several times about emergence and so forth. But there are serious problems that uh, we're, we're faced with. And uh, I think sometimes we should really face them uh, and take account, take account of the fact that we're not dealing with them using all that we could get from other disciplines. Let me just give you a quick example, COVID. OK, so when the nations were faced with COVID, they had different reactions, different ways of dealing with it. And you could divide them into two camps, those camps, the camp which says, you know, we're going to put all the priority on health. We're just going to go for trying to handle this epidemic in the uh, most efficient and effective uh, way possible, even if that means really doing some damage to our economy. That's what we're going to do. Other nations said, no, we've got to protect the economy and do as best we can um, to keep the epidemic under control. Now, ex post, some analysis has shown that those people who concentrated on health first actually came out better than uh, those who tried to play this double game of looking at the two. But underlying that is something which is important, which is those nations which had uh, strong safety nets also came out better. But you, that seems so intuitive. You don't really have to be a great economist to understand that, right? If you're down near the bottom, which is where people are when things go bad, then you're likely to fall off and uh, anything that will pr protect you from doing that seems to me to be a very desirable thing but people say no no that makes people dependent that makes them you know they will not work as hard as they could that's happening now in france for example We're told that the solution is to make everybody work more in some sense but you know keynes once said we was we should be getting to a point at where we are now where people are working a sort of 15 hour work, a 15 hour week, and yet we're being encouraged not only to work uh, more hours than that, but also to work longer. And you see the people out in the streets in France because they're being told they should keep going to 65. That's great when you're a professor, but it's not so great when you're cleaning the uh, streets and so forth. But anyway, uh, and the second uh, remark that I would make is that we don't incorporate enough um, from other sciences to and other disciplines, in particular sociology, apart from others. Um, but just take a quick thought about the climate change problem. Now, people were pretty much aligned at one point and say, well, climate change is really important and we have to deal with it and so forth. But if you look at the economic models, and this has been mentioned several times today that uh, and yesterday, that the climate models are not taking account of the latest developments in uh, climate science and the, the work of people like Parisi and so forth, who've showed us that, in fact, uh, the situation is much worse than we thought. And uh, what's happening is that what we thought of as being noise, you know, the weather, and then underneath there was the climate. And noise is just something which you can add on and it's the epsilon on the end that people have talked about. You know, you have this and epsilon. Epsilon is just our ignorance in some sense, things that we haven't incorporated. But on the other hand, in fact, what the Parisi and his mm -hmm. colleagues, Bensi and company, showed is that the noise can actually interfere with the underlying process. There is, it's not kind of independent and additive. 
the noise can actually amplify the movements in the underlying process. And if that's the case, then we're in much more trouble than we thought, because we you know we can look at weather and the consequences. But if this is going to have a long term effect on the underlying movement, that means that we may be faced with uh, a really big change and almost no discussion. Uh, that's an exaggeration, of course, but about the geographical distribution of this change. You know that the polar vortex, which sort of kept keeps the Arctic uh, cold separate from elsewhere, when they uh, uh, we have start to have the weather changing. That's enough to weaken the polar vortex, and suddenly the cold air, which was up there, kept away, has been moving down even as far as Texas, and you have uh, unprecedented changes in the weather and climate. And that's going to go on. You know, we, this is not so easily reversible. But I don't think in uh, any of our famous integrated models we're actually incorporating that. So when we estimate and are told that the optimal amount of warming would be, let's say, three degrees. That's not taking account of this radical change that's going on in the climate. And I think that's uh, another problem with our discipline is that we have not really taken into account all that the other disciplines can contribute to us. We're too locked in to our models. And, you know, there'll be consequences. Migration will happen more. And there are nations that may even literally disappear. And there are actually a few island nations which are sort of are trying to deal with that that question. So what am I trying to say? Just to say that I, mean, I think that framework on which we hung everything is in some sense maybe not the right referential framework. We should really think about changing it more radically. And I have the strong feeling that there are many possibilities now of doing that, but I don't think they're actually pushing, if you like, enough the economics profession in the right direction. And I think for all that I said, you know, it's wonderful to have a, uh, a profession where it's fun to do this work is also underlying that a real uh, problem for society, which ec economists have a duty to invest in. And I think there are too many vested interests out there which are stopping us actually moving towards looking for frameworks which are different. And the, the, my last example would be the role of the state. You know, the state currently has a very strange uh, uh, position. It's uh, something that we spend a lot of time, at least a lot of vested interests spend a lot of time trying to diminish the role of the state. Because they say, you know, with that, with the state, this will not be efficient. We won't uh, the, the appeal to the efficient markets hypothesis. But as soon as things get really bad, what do we say? The state has to step in, right? And uh, people say, well, yes, that's all right. But on the other hand, uh, I should only do that in an emergency. So they say, okay, now when will that be? And they said, well, when when something is systemically important. And so, of course, what's happening right now is that all of a sudden, all sorts of things have become systemically important. The whole system is, in fact, systemically important. So the state will step in, step in again and temporarily clear that up and off we go again. But that's not going to solve the overall problem and it's not going to solve the problems of inequality, which we all know about. So <laughs> I would conclude by saying that my my dad was a neuropsychiatrist and he worked on the physical origins of mental, what was then called mental handicap. Um, and uh, at the end of his life, I think he thought, well, you know, the work that I did has made uh, life literally better for many people. But I'm not sure that uh, for most economists, we really have the feeling that what we've done has made life really better for many people. But that should be our aim in the end, you know, let it be fun or let it not be fun, let it be intellectually challenging and so forth. But I think that what we should be constantly coming back to is the problems. What are the problems that we really have to deal with and not just uh, have a sort of intellectual club where we all enjoy ourselves and tell stories and so forth. But we should also think that underlying this, there are serious problems and we have an obligation at least to take a look at them and see if we can't offer 
solutions. And I think Joe is one of the people who's been on the right road there. But um, I'm not sure that most economists are on the same road as you, Joe. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so thank everybody. I thank everybody for having come to this. And uh, I'm very grateful for all the people who helped me in the past. Thank you. That's the end of the conference. Thank you all very much. Oh, yes. Uh, um, normally, uh, most of the seminars and conferences and workshops I attend, I'm always discovering that I'm far more ignorant than I feared that I would be. Now, for this particular conference, I have to admit that I think about 98.997% of it is completely new to my ears. And I'm just worried about the amount of reading that I've been doing. <laughs> um, I'm ignoring posterior vein in corrections. I should have bought my cogs um, four years ago. But anyway, I'll carry on ignoring them and I'm trying to do my catch up. I'm extremely grateful to the uh, all the speakers and the discussants uh, and the questions as well. They've all been very, very stimulating. And I hope we'll actually have another sort of uh, conference, even if my brain is shrinking. I'm going to find some of it very, very uh, overwhelming. But thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Angus for organising this conference. Thank you very much. We should, we should add to that thanks to William also, who was a co and Rehan yes. back Rayhan. there, who has been sending emails. And goodness knows, I got up this morning at quarter to six, thinking I must have beaten him, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you both very much. <clears throat>